Good morning, everybody. Welcome back again. And we had an excellent uh, yesterday evening session followed by a good get together of some old friends. And we are trying to slowly ease out of the COVID norms. And it's a great pleasure to have you all over here physically. And uh, we assure that you know, we have some exciting uh, academic interactions today throughout and uh, we have some of the best faculty which could we could uh, look at across the globe and uh, we have some very good local faculty who is over here to get the ball rolling so let me uh, invite along with me is dr vijay kumar who's uh, faculty over here today uh, we have been joined by dr ajit mullasari from chennai ajit hi good morning again and Dr. Zedis Mehrwal, Chief of Cardiovascular Surgery at the Fortis Escorts Heart Institute. Good morning, Dr. Mehrwal. Dr. Nagendra Bhupati, uh, the stalwart former Ames uh, colleague of mine and who's trained in structural heart interventions in the US. Dr. P.K. Hazra and Dr. Nagendra Chauhan, may I request you to please join us on the podium over here? Yeah. And uh, Dr. Amit Chaurasia is just getting in, so he'll join us soon. Dr. Manik Chopra has joined us uh, uh, online. We have Dr. Mona Bhatia. Mona, can, can I request you to please uh, join us for discussions over here? Dr. Ramji Malhotra, our esteemed cardiac surgeon friend who recently moved to greener pastures within Delhi. Ramji, please join us for the discussions. Dr. Rajneesh Malhotra, uh, a renowned cardiac surgeon and we see a lot of interest among the cardiac surgeons to uh, uh, get involved in Rajneesh, come over, come over here, please, uh, in structural interventions. And they have also started these programs in their centers. Then we have uh, Dr. Benoit John. Good morning, Benoit. And Dr. Ezilan, both from uh, the south of our country. And they are the young stalwarts, Benoit is recently trained in the structural heart interventions and he's starting his program in a big way. And Dr. Ezilan is a former uh, escorts uh, protege and he's made a big stride down there in Chennai. So welcome both of you. And uh, we have Dr. Riza Pascioli. He's Riza was a fellow, he's come to us from Indonesia. Riza, good morning and welcome. Uh, he's joining us all the way from Indonesia. And apart from that, we have Dr. Rakesh Sapra, Dr. Asadullah Hassani from Afghanistan, and they have joined us virtually because of the current conditions. So we'll get started with the first presentation today, and that is the basics, the, the, that's how uh, our structural interventions will be planned. So the first talk comes from Dr. Priya Jagia. Uh, she will talk about the CT assessment for a tower. Now, what are the current concepts? How do we decide uh, about various steps in the procedures, so many safety issues involved. Dr. Priya Jagia is a professor and head of radiology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Over to you, Priya. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak in front of such a learned audience. So I'll be talking about uh, the first uh, basic thing uh, before you do a TAVR, the CT assessment in these patients. So why, why, why do you want to do a CT on, only on these patients, not MR? So CT offers you a very high spatial resolution, gives you a 3D volumetric data, and allows you reconstruction in oblique planes. See, IOTA is a, a double oblique oriented structure. So you need a 3D volumetric data. And also the because the spatial resolution is high, it gives you a inter observer independent uh, measurements which are accurate and uh, reproducible. And also you can choose amongst your gated images which are required. And so it's the best investigation for sizing your valve. Also, unlike MR, it allows you to look at the calcification, which again is a poor prognostic uh, marker if it is present in the valve or elsewhere. Also, it allows, since these are the elderly patient, it allows you to simultaneously do coronary assessment of these patients. So uh, very briefly about CT, uh, at our institute, we, in patients who have severe AS, we perform the CT in presence of an anesthetist. We had 
two cases of mace on table after giving the contrast. So we are doing, so I, I, I personally think uh, that is the way to go, have someone there who can resuscitate your patient. And no beta blockers are given in these patients. And obviously uh, the sublingual nitrates are contraindicated. So that's the care that has to be taken by the radiologist. First, we uh, do a retros. One may do a non-contrast non CT scan also, but it is not mandatory. So what we do is we do a retrospective ECG gated study for the aortic root and the coronary. So the thoracic part is done retrospective ECG gated. And this is followed by a non-gated study for thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. And we include, include down till the femoral artery bifurcation so that the excess vessels are clearly measured and are uh, any you know, problems there are ruled out. So these are the various uh, reporting points and I'm going to discuss one by one all of them. Uh, first of all, about the aortic root, we all know it is a double oblique oriented structure. It extends from the LVOT. I hope my marker is seen. Okay, is it seen now? Uh, 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 no, it's for the other audience also. So this is, I took the marker from there only. So, so we have uh, uh, the, the aortic root, which extends from the LVOT to the ST junction, and which marks the transition from the sinus of Valsalva to the tubular ascending aorta, so the junction. And then we have aortic valve, which is located within the aortic sinus. Traditionally, aortic annulus was thought to be a circular structure, but now we know better it's an ellipsoid structure, and it is not actually a real anatomic structure. It is actually a virtual ring, which is formed by the nadia of the attachment sites of the aortic valve leaflets. So, so what you see here green, I hope my marker is seen, what you see here as green is the annular plane, which is seen. So when we have cross section, so whenever I'm talking about diameters, we are talking about diameters which are taken not in the axial slices, but axial to the aortic plane. So all those multiple oblique object, uh, projections have to be make and made and the perpendicular diameters, perpendicular to the wall of the aorta have to be taken. So if we look at these diameters, so I, ascending aorta is more or less circular. You'll have ST junction, which is having all the three sinuses, which is clover leaf type. And further down, we have annulus, which is uh, a ellipsoid structure. So when we do the measurements, First of all, make sure you have very good quality, a reasonable quality images of CT. Better to repeat CT rather than do suboptimal report on a suboptimal study. So have a good images with you. First, uh, regarding measurements, they have to be done in the systolic frame because it has been shown that there may be a difference of as high as five millimeter between systolic and diastolic measurements. So you need the larger annular area and perimeter as compared which is uh, there on systole as compared to the diastole. So the recommended phase is systolic phase, unless there is a septal hypertrophy, which I will talk about. So why this accurate sizing? It's so much paranoia about this accurate sizing. Obviously, if you end up with an oversized valve, there is a risk of annular dehiscence. Undersizing, there could be a risk of migration, paravalvular aortic regurgitation, which even if is mild, leads to late all-cause mortality. So this is how the images may vary on systole and diastole. You can see the diameter is much more in systole and the measurements are done in systole. The maximum diameter and the minimum diameter is taken uh, when we take the uh, diameter measurements. So in cases of septal hypertrophy, so if you have a septal hypertrophy, what happens is in the systole, this hypertrophied muscle will come into the annulus. And hence, in these patients, diastolic measurements have to be taken. So this is important because most of our AS patients do have hypertrophic, hypertrophied hearts. So performing uh, the annular measurements, like I said, we go perpendicular. So you, you, uh, you pick up the points at the nadia of the uh, attachment of the all three uh, uh, um, uh, leaflets. And see all, most of the machines now have automatic point detection, but it's important that manually you confirm that these points are right and change them if you find them inadequate. So all these three points are detected and the measurements are done. So measurements could be done in the three, depending on the type of valve which you are using, there could be measurements based on diameter, on parameter, and also on area. 
The one thing to remember is that area, see all these, when we are talking about area and perimeter, we are assuming that these are circular structures. So the, the formula which are used is two pi r and pi r square for the perimeter and area respectively. So the exponential increase per diameter, per small increase in the diameter, exponential increase will be there in area, whereas proportional increase will be there in the perimeter. So that has to be kept in mind. So if you have a lot of eccentricity, then these values will definitely go wrong and you will have discrepancy between the measurements. So in the diameter, we take maximum diameter and the minimum diameter and give that value. Also, uh, because during uh, fluoroscopy, you need to open out your, uh, uh, your uh, aortic root fully. So seating can help you in providing you the, uh, to prevent you know, multiple injections, it can tell you which is the view which will open out your aortic root best. So in RO, LO, how much cranial caudal tilt. So ask your radiologist about that and use that projection rather than doing multiple injections. Then after the annular diameter uh, uh, measurements, we look at the aortic valve, whether it is a bicuspid aortic valve, obviously you are going to have a more technically challenging procedure if you have a bicuspid valve. Look at the second point is to look at the calcifications, look at their presence, extent and distribution. Uh, the problem may be with uh, the problem is even severe with bicuspid aortic valve, which is Sievers type zero, wherein you have only two hinge points, and then you have it's difficult to identify your angular plane. So diameter measurement can be a problem. Also, we talk about the raphic calcifications, the calcification of the valves. So if there is extensive valve calcification, once you put in your valve there, so the, the, the bulky calcification will interpose between the device and native aortic valve. So there will be a malopposition of your device. Also, extensive calcification at ST junction will not allow you to, uh, will limit your balloon expansion. Again, you will have more chances of uh, migration because of inadequate device fixation. This, I think I will skip, but basically these are the raffe uh, type, the types of raffe. So that could be bicus, true bicuspid, true tricuspid, or a functionally bicuspid valve. So these raffe calcifications are uh, measured, uh, they are quantified, and they also uh, help in you know, uh, prognostic, uh, prognosticating your patient. Also, we look at the landing zone calcium. So this, uh, beyond the annulus in the subannular region, up to four to five mm of LBOT area is also important. And we again define whether it is mild, moderate, severe, whether it is protruding or is it just a flat uh, um, calcification which is there. So a protruding calcification is the one which you see in the middle and in the lower panel. So a calcification such as this will obviously have uh, chances of uh, malopposition. And it has been found that uh, calcification which is protruding below the non-coronary cusp that has been found to be most closely associated with annular injury and has to be clearly reported and looked for. Talking about sinus of Valsalva, it doesn't matter whether you do systolic or diastolic measurements. So what we do is we measure from the cusp to the commissure. So all from the cusp to the commission, three measurements and an average is given. Sinotubular junction is again a circular structure. So single measurement, single diameter measurement can be uh, can suffice. Important thing is that the, the diameter of the ST junction should not be too low. Otherwise, there will be a risk for the STJ junction, ST junction uh, injury after the valve placement. Then we can, can uh, uh, make double oblique MPRs and look at the iota. Most of the valves are through the transiotic route. So we look for any valve, a wall calcification, atherosclerotic thrombi, any abnormal extensive acute angulation between the ascending iota and LVOT. And also if the patient has got bicuspid aortic valve, the patient may have associated iotopathy. So all that has to be noted and reported. Then coronary artery evaluation. If you haven't uh, till now evaluated the coronary artery disease, CT angio will rule out significant coronary artery disease with a very high negative predictive value. And uh, these are the things which I discussed earlier uh, that we do not give nitroglycerin or beta blockers in this patient. The next thing to measure is the coronary artery osteal height. So what we do is from the annular plane to the right coronary artery, to the left coronary artery and to the right coronary artery, they are measured. And a minimum distance of 10 millimeter between the annular plane and ostea is recommended to prevent coronary injury. As it is the single measurement, uh, 
becomes even more important when it is associated with a reduced sinus of valsalva mean diameter. So if you have a low coronary ostial length, which is less than 12 associated with the sinus of valsalva mean diameter less than 30 millimeter, there is increased risk of coronary occlusion and one may have to do a, 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 a stenting in these patients for the coronary artery. The next, uh, the next thing is to look at the cardiac chambers, look for any gross abnormalities, Please do look at the delayed images also. So this is something like left atrial appendage clot, but you can see it is because of the sluggish flow. The contrast has entered only in the later phase. So clots should be looked for, look for basal septal hypertrophy, wall thrombi. Also, like I said, because transiotic route, look at the entire aorta, DTA, abdominal aorta. Excess vessels, you have a profile which is 15 mm anywhere between 15 mm to 21 mm. So the vessels have to be sized accordingly. A 15 mm would require a 5 mm artery. A 15 F, sorry, would require a 5 mm artery. A 21 uh, F would require a 7 mm artery minimally. So look for any tortuosity, stenosis, or uh, calcification. And if you find uh, problems there, alternately, you can go for a transapical axillary or other approaches. Also, when you are puncturing, do not forget that there shouldn't be any stenosis there and also rule out a high femoral artery puncture. Look for, lastly, look for the non-cardiac, non-vascular findings. So these patients are advanced in age, look for any incidental malignancy or uh, other abnormalities which may be seen on the CT. So the, it, the, it has to be read by a radiologist. And amyloid is another uh, um, uh, uh, you know, abnormality which has been reported in these patients. So, if, if you are suspicious, look out for it. So I would like to end again with this slide. So these are the points where we report on which we report our cases. So again, I would like to end by saying that gated multi-slice CT gives you the best morphological assessment of the aortic root, gives you the best measurements, which are reproducible, accurate, non-operator dependent, and provide the best guide for the interventionist. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Uh, that's very exhaustive and CT uh, needs uh, far more time, but you have highlighted all the salient features. Quick comments from Mona, uh, the Chief of Radiology at Fortis Escorts. What's your take? Thanks, Dr. Mathur. It's a pleasure to be here in live. Great. So, you know, uh, Priya has just done a great talk and she's completely, you know, done everything that we need to do for the CT scan. But having looked at what's happening now, what's going forward, the point is that I have a great surgeon sitting right next to me. And if a SAVR valve had a 30% paravalvular leak, a 30% incidence of paravalvular leak, even if mild, it would not be acceptable. With TAVRs, we're seeing so much of that. So going forward, what do we do with sizing? We are sizing by area and by perimeter, depending on the type of valve, but maybe we need to look at what sizing do we need to do in the future in order to reduce this paravalvular leak because we're looking at low risk patients who are now going into TAVR. The next thing that brought to, that came to my mind was that we need to do the coronary artery assessment to a better degree because a lot of these patients subsequently may need coronary access. So how do we do that? Are we going to move to the GINA valves? And what are we going to do for that in the future? The okay. other point is alignment of the valves and the cusps and the coronaries. That is going to become okay. important and whether the basilica will come into India. The bicuspid valve is always a challenge and there's a high mortality at one year, with, depending on the calcification of the commissures and the valves. So we need to be looking at that and evaluating it because we're talking about the icicle calcifications and the counter co-injuries that are coming up. And uh, last but not the least is, if you're gonna be talking about low risk patients coming into TAVR, then what are we doing about valve thrombosis, which may happen at eight to 10 years or may even happen earlier. And uh, there we need to be making a very strict assessment because we are crimping the valves into smaller access vessels. And when we crimp these valves, we do cause some sort of injury to the metal. The valves are getting thinner and whether they will last out in these low risk patients. A uh, quick comment from uh, Dr. Manik Chopra. Manik, would you unmute yourself and give us a comment on CT assessment? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, these are very valid points, but uh, in general, uh, as you rightly said, for low risk patients, we'll have to. Uh, make the coronary uh, assessment well. In general, if we believe that the 
the coronaries are arising above the level of the centrum, whether it is a balloon expandable one or self-expanding one, it should not be a problem for the axis. The, the question comes when your coronaries are below the level of the valve frame. And then probably most of the valves now have uh, a mechanism of uh, commercial alignment, which is quite perfect with accurate new. Uh, in 99% of cases, you'll be able to align it. Uh, Metronic also has uh, commercial alignment, which works in at least 80% of cases. Portico also has markers for commercial posts, but of course, but these markers are not very visible and, and you can try aligning that and you can align, uh, get the uh, assessment and alignment in at least 80% of cases uh, without more than moderate uh, misalignment. Same is with the other, maybe with Hydra also there are posts uh, by which you can align uh, the balloon expandable wells. Uh, having said that they are low framed and the top cell is uh, open. So, of course, there's no technique for commercial alignment, but in general, in random, if you see 80% of the balloon expandable valves uh, always allow you commercial access. So, at your, of course, in 80% of the patients, at least you'll be able to, you should not be having problems. The other thing is that, yes, these low risk patients are, are, are bicuspid valves. So, how do you align valves in those? That is a challenge, but most of these are LR fusion. So, you can, you can probably presume just as tricuspid. The other thing regarding the durability, what she questioned was regarding the crimping part. Of course, uh, she is theoretically right. And this is a point which was raised by surgeons many a times. But all the trials had the same mechanism for crimping in S3 as well as loading in, 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 in self-expanding valves. And we do have the data with Notion trial for a quite long time in which uh, the, the, the Evolute platform is doing still better than the surgical valves. So, I think we have a reasonable data for that. We have uh, Giza Fontos, who has joined us from Budapest. He's the chief of cardiology at the Hungarian Heart Institute. So Giza, uh, do you think it, uh, it's the radiologist who will always be assessing or has the interventional cardiologist also look, to look at the CT very carefully? What is your practice? Yeah, we are a, a hospital which deals only uh, with cardiovascular uh, diseases. So it's a special, special setting, I guess. Uh, in our hospital, the routine is that we have a cardiac imaging department, which uh, works in fusion with the radiology. But before all procedures, we go through the CT images ourselves together with the cardiac imaging, imaging and the radiologist team. So this is, I think, one of the key points to, to do it before procedure, because I think at least 90% of, uh, uh, of the work will be done before procedure in, in the planning phase of, of, of procedure. So we, we need to be prepared for everything. And the key is to check the CT, uh, CT images together with, with, with your local, local experts. Excellent. Thank you very much, Priya, for this excellent presentation. And while I invite the next speaker, Dr. Samir Srivastava, who is the Chief and Executive Director of Non-Invasive Cardiology at Fortis Escorts Heart Institute. Now he'll give us the echo assessment of the mitral valve for the mitral clip procedure. I'll take one last comment before uh, Samir starts. Dr. Naginder, what is your last take on the CT assessment? Well, I think has anything Giza changed? Has highlighted it quite uh, importantly that every cardiologist should know how to assess the CT scan yourself. And I think now it is time that we should assess it more importantly in patients who are slightly younger, like more less than six, 70 years or 65 years that what will happen after 10, 12 years when this wall degenerate and you have to put another wall? Uh, will it close coronaries? Is it a supranular wall? It's an annular wall where you should position it lower or higher because that will be most challenging after 10 years. And at that point of time, surgery will not be possible. So that point should also be highlighted in all cities now. I think this is the time. Vijay wants to make one quick comment. You know, before. Uh, On. Priya. Oh. Dr. Priya uh, enumerated all the measurements that has to be done and a lot of uh, special subsets have been discussed, like the bicuspid valve, the young population, the heavily calcified. So not just one parameter has to be focused on regarding oversizing or coronary, or coronary protection or for bicuspid valve or valve in valve. Multiple measurements have to be collated together. It may not be that a coronary height, which is less than 10, who has a sinus of 35, will be a high risk for coronary occlusion. So impending coronary occlusion or established coronary occlusion is likely to happen or not 
these have to be considered after discussing or after correlating all multiple measurements that Dr. Priya has described perfectly. And so uh, just not be fixed with one point or one measurement. Over uh, sizing of the valves also have been done in multiple ways based on annular sizing, based on the calcification present, based on the other uh, supraannular and infraannular measurements. So all have to be considered. So just not one parameter of the CT is uh, up one point to decide what size or which valve you are going to take. Thank you, Vijay. Over to you, Samir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mantha, for uh, including uh, back to basics. And I guess that means pre-COVID era. We are all here to talk about uh, imaging in... Uh, so this is how the echo anatomic correlation would start. If you look at this cartoon, we know that we want to have a look at the heart as realistically as possible. And as imaging uh, people, it was always a challenge because how to do it. Initially, it came as a 2D and then 2D over a period of time did evolve. And especially for, for mitral. So these days, if you want to evaluate the mitral, there is no shortcut. You have to have a three-dimensional and this is how, if you look at it, the two dimensions will slowly convert itself into three-dimensional once you have those kind of equipment. It's an expensive equipment, but very useful. All these procedures are expensive. So adding on to imaging for the expense, it actually should not be too much of an issue. So if you look at this, this is something which makes the heart look like as normal as what it could be in, in uh, real life. And from here now, let me just build up my story. So how do you decide for mitra clip? And uh, when you want to decide for the mitra clip, you have to assess the mitral regurgitation severity, surgical risk, expected benefit from uh, mitral regurgitation reduction, uh, anatomic uh, limitations and suitability, any other surgery required, guideline directed medical therapy on board or not, and whether there is still a scope for the therapy to be included. CRT, if needed, if symptoms persist and severe mitral regurgitation is there, consider mitral clip if anatomy is suitable. This is how you make your assessments. We know that functional mitral regurgitation has all its downsides. This is a clip which over a period of times will show that severer, the functional mitral regurgitation survival is truncated very significantly so. So back to back, two trials came. One was COAPT and second was mitra FR. I'm not going to go into the details of that. The primary effectiveness in COAP was significant, not only for the uh, cumulative heart failure hospitalization, but also for all-cause mortality. But what happened was that across the Atlantic, the fight began as is very usual. So when you saw that, they found that in Mitra FR, there was a contradictory issues. And who settled it? It was settled by ECHO because they found that the number of clip implanted was different and all these implant failures were there. But what was the reason for that was because severe MR entry criteria were different in mitra FR versus COAP. We can keep discussing these downsides or upsides till cows come home. But to make a little bit of an issue that if your effective regurgitant orifice area is more than 20 versus if it is more than 30, it matters when it comes to outcomes, if your regurgitant volume is 30 ml versus what it was in quad was 45 ml, it matters. If your end diastolic volumes of LV was different, which was there 135 versus 101 on an average, it mattered. And that's the reason it is not only necessary that echo assessment should be done pre, but it also evokes what the outcomes are. So this was very interesting, not that it is relevant to the uh, discussion today, but message from co-op trial was, this is co-op was US trial. Treatment with mitra clip by an experienced operator substantially improves prognosis, reducing heart failure, hospitalization, and improving survival uh, quality of life and functional capacity. And mitra clip as an active control arms is uh, in, in all the trials to come. So what was highlighted was something which was full of attitude that it should be done by an experienced operator, which is probably the USD. Anyway, uh, so much so for a cynical statement, 
but patient groups in which significant clinical benefits have been reported have been degenerative mitral regurgitation, which were declined for surgery, severe LV dysfunction, refractory to all mitral therapy, severe heart failure despite optimal medical therapy, CRT non-responder, bivalvular heart disease like severe aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Heart immolation is a must. And this is what the, from lateral to medial, if you go, the scallops are labeled as P1, P2, P3, and A1, A2, E3. Uh, and and uh, these are the certain uh, transesophageal images which are a must. So going by what it looks like, you have to take a bicable view, look at the interatrial septum, look at the integrity, look at the aneurysm, look at the uh, fossa valis. And not only that, you have to go into sh a short axis which shows aorta. So we know aorta is anteriorly placed because what is important is the puncture site. Because if your puncture site of the interatrial septum is awkward, you will not be able to enter the mitral perpendicularly. And the placement is very important. It should be superior and posterior. How you decide posterior is in this view when aorta is being uh, uh, visualized. Not only that, <clears throat> if you want to find out where is the superiority, then you have to go into the fourth chamber and this is where you puncture. So interatrial septum is very important to be measured. Now for the jet uh, uh, evaluation, please keep looking at this cartoon. This cartoon is something which is very, very, very uh, educative in the sense that when you keep rolling your um, uh, transducer, you will keep cutting at different edges. This is a bicommissural view. Some people call it intercommissural. But for all practical purposes, if you have to cut, cut across the P3, A2, P1 with P1, P3 with the same length, that is the place where you have got the imaging right. And if you look at the, uh, you keep rolling it backwards and forwards, and then you'll realize that where is the best vision. Here is bicommissural view. You can see the two commissures. Not only that, when you look at it, this is how the jet should look. This is a central jet you have, don't measure the vena contracta in this view, but this is what you have to see because this is the place where you get the maximum or the worst of it. Now, you have to assess the mitral 2D again, keep looking at the cartoon down. And if you look at this, now it moves, the cursor moves from lateral to medial or medial to lateral, either which ways, and you have to keep acquiring images in 2D and color, 2D and color. Uh, 3D is something which is very, very, very important. And actually, initially, we thought the, 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 the 3D, 3D was something which was a new toy for the boys. But when it comes to mitral evaluation in mitral eclipse, this is probably one of the most important and robust tools because online, there's nothing that you can do. So this is how you want to enter straight perpendicularly down at the place where you want to clip it. And this is how you want to clip it, A to P2. And this is where you have to get it in the 3D. You can get it best uh, on this. Uh, again, you keep uh, seeing different things. And this is the A to P2 view, which is 150. And uh, this is uh, the place where you want to clip it. Some measurements you have to do. You have to see the mitral assessment. Keep looking at this cartoon on the left. On the top, you'll realize where it is cutting across which plane because most of the commercially available machines have got one feature called the explain, where you'll have one view and exactly 90 degrees of that would be simultaneously you can project it. So you know that you're not messing around. Here is uh, assessment as you go from, uh, this is the most lateral coming back to a little bit medial, uh, coming back to a little bit more lateral and coming back to edge of it. So this is how you keep cutting across. These are certain additional views you need to do. You have to go deep down into the transgastric. And this gives you something more like a short axis across the parasitic knock axis view in transthoracic. Uh, this is um, how the 3D looks like. The problem is that when you acquire 3D in a transesophageal echo, your aorta is on the south side. You have to take the aorta on the north side. This is how the surgeons, we are all obsessed with surgeons. So this is how Dr. Meherwal, Rajneesh or uh, Ramji would look at. They want to see the out on the right north side. 
And this is also called as a surgical view. Here we see that there is a central prolapse of the, that, then there are certain additional views. <coughs> Most of the times, as you gain experience, <coughs> there are a few views which you can really get truncated and get away with, because those are things more so for documentation sake, but they are useful. Everything is useful. The more uh, views you have, better it is. So these are the patients you have to consider. I'm not going to talk about that, but the measures to quantify severity of MR are there, where you have to look at this leakage. You have to see the color jet. You have to see the pulmonary vein flow. You have to look at the regurgitant volume. You have to look at the regurgitant fraction, and you have to look at the effective regurgitant orifice area which is no different than mitral valve evaluation uh, done for anything else. This exactly is the same what you would do for a uh, MR uh, assessment regardless. Now you have to assess the surgical risk and uh, this surgical risk is best assessed when you are in conjunction with the heart valve. You have to look at several things, but for functional mitral regurgitation, there are a few things which you have to additionally look at. And this is known as the vertical coaption length. For degenerated mitral regurgitation, there are a few more things you have to look. You have to look at the flail gap and the flail width. This is the instruction for the uh, uh, function uh, follow-up warnings that you have to be a little bit careful if the uh, leakage is anywhere other than the uh, central A to P2 lesions, if there is a calcification which is heavy, if the mitral valve orifice area is um, uh, less than four, uh, if the leaflet fail gap is more than 10 or flail width is more than 15, if there is a severely restricted posterior leaflet, which in our setting is little dubious because we make our diagnosis of rheumatic involvement if you see the posterior mitral leaflet rigid and uh, going in paradoxical motion. Then if there are clefts, perforations in the grasping area, cooperation length less than two, and, and intracardiac masses. These are certain contraindications. Now, uh, these are morphological selection criteria for mitra clip, originating from central two thirds to the valve. I'll just talk about the exclusion criteria rather than inclusion. If, if there is severe LV dysfunction on dilatation, think two times. Severe calcification, flail gap, flail bit that is large, if the, vent, the left ventricular internal diameters are greater than 55 or mitral valve areas less than four. Now, here is our first case, which we did at uh, some time, uh, pre-COVID era again, where there was a severe mitral regurgitation. We took the proper steps of uh, inserting, and these are our own, um, I'm sure in the, uh, during the day, you'll have many more examples to be seen, but this is our own patient where we did fluoroscopy guidance, the leaflets were grasped, inserted, and released. And this is what we got as the end product. So these are the pre and the post and excellent results for mitral regurgitation. Now, this is my last slide, that clinical impacts of mitral, the mitra clip outcomes are immensely dependent upon your 3D evaluation. And I'll stop short here with this last cartoon, and I shall be happy to take any questions in case there are. Thank Excellent you. presentation, Samir. And uh, while uh, Giza will share his slides, now I am first going to invite the surgeons, uh, Dr. Ramji and uh, Dr. Rajneesh, uh, as to how do you look at the echo when you are repairing surgical valves. And uh, so, Ramji first. Thank you, Dr. Mathur, uh, Dr. Samir. Excellent presentation. I think mitral valve itself is very, very complex structure. And I, I may say that it's more um, to understand mitral than aortic. So when we see mitral for repair, we see what's the pathology which originated and what are the secondary effects it has caused because MR feeds on itself. So annular dilatation also probably happens in all kinds of MR, which is long standing. So we would see the leaflet pathologies, any calcification, et cetera, on there, subavular, and the cooptation height, as you said, the flail height, and also some angles which will prevent post-op SAM. 
the annular uh, diameter also will be important. Most of the repairs would need the mitral ring to fix their repair in position for long-term durability. The alteri stitch failure probably in unselected patients is because the, the, the fixation has not been able to be fixed. So, so it's very important to go through all when we assess mitral valve. And it has to be seen in conjunction with a um, uh, friend like you, echocardiographer, who can show us on 2D uh, various images and 3D reconstruction. Mitral clip, they say, is an echocardiographer's procedure. Is it right, uh, Rajesh? What do yeah. you say? Yeah, definitely, I would say. And as uh, Dr. Ramji said, there are many things which need to be seen. I mean, it's not only the leaflets and the, uh, and we have to always see the annulus and the leaflet perforations and posterior mitral leaflet tethering. So all these things will come into consideration when you are repairing the valve. So, I mean, as Dr. Mathur is saying, so it's a echocardiographer which has to really guide us and, and tell us that what are the things which we have to really look so at. We have uh, Dr. Praveen Chandra, who is the chairman of cardiology at Medanta and is doing a lot of mitral clip procedures. What's your take on uh, this, Praveen? Uh, and do you have a set echocardiographer which, uh, who you team up with for your procedures? Mic on, please. So, I know, first of all, Samir's presentation was fantastic. And I learned a lot today again. And uh, I must say that, as everybody is saying, that mitral clip procedure is a very, very echo-driven procedure. It is a procedure of transesophageal echo with 2D and 3D. And certainly, identifying the site where we have to put the clip and then, of course, looking at the result on the table, that is the most interesting thing that you can see then there. And you can only release the clip once you are very satisfied that, yes, the regurgitation is fairly well done. It is not leading to any stenosis, etc. So that is the benefit of you know, having a very good echo team. And as you are asking whether we should have a, you know, a dedicated person, yes, certainly, you know, somebody has to really go on top of the whole thing because right. then it becomes much easier. So you have to make a team. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Mehrwal, uh, a quick comment from you if you unmute yourself. You know, so what is your practice? I think, uh, uh, I think let me first congratulate you, Atul, for organizing this is an excellent uh, meeting which you have been doing for the last many years. It's really educative. And, uh, but, you know, the, the mitral clip for mitral degustation has always, uh, always confused me a little bit. Because you know, over these years, over the last many decades, uh, when we have been sort of repairing the mitral regurgitation, uh, we have seen the failures because of uh, because of many reasons, and one of the reasons has been not fixing the annulus and not taking care of the future dilatation of the annulus, which obviously we can't do in the in the in the mitral clip. At the same time, obviously, the mitral regurgitation uh, has multiple uh, pathologies and the results of mitral repair, I'm talking about the surgical repair, has been quite, quite different in different pathologies, uh, which obviously, you know, you can't address uh, with the mitral clip. You can, you can only uh, sort of approximate. So basically, uh, but when it comes to assessment, I think, uh, you know, uh, Carpenter, who actually is the, is the pioneer in mitral uh, repair, he used to mention that the surgeon, if they can't properly read the echo, with the cardiologist, you can't do a good repair. So I think basically, you know, you as a, as a, as a surgeon, you definitely need to, this is one area where you have to be an expert uh, with the cardiologist. Obviously you need a good cardiologist and a good echocardiographer, somebody like Samir, who can uh, show you exactly what you want to see, but you yourself need to very thoroughly need to evaluate not only the leaflets, but also the sub apparatus, the commissures, the, uh, the papillary muscles and cordy, but I think as everyone has agreed, echo plays a very, very important role, whether you are doing a mitral clip or you are doing a, uh, doing a surgical repair. Over to you, Giza, for your large bore access presentation. Thank you very much, Samir. Excellent thank presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So dear colleague, it's my honor and privilege to be here today again at CBT uh, to talk to you about large bore accesses. I really appreciate being given this opportunity. Thank you for that. So almost 20 years after the very first tower was that was performed by Alan Kribi in 2002. We've seen a tremendous development of the field. And nowadays the tendencies are 
really favoring minimalistic approach and transfemoral axis as much as possible. So in the highest volume centers, the transfemoral rate exceeds 95%. In my center, I just uh, reviewed our data. We performed 256 towers in the last uh, 12 months. Out of it, 254 were uh, transfemoral. We, do, we did only one transapical and, done, and, and one subclavian case. It doesn't mean, of course, that all Hungarians have good femorals. And the reason is uh, um, that we do a lot of um, uh, endovascular work in our hospital. Uh, all the peripherals are done by, um, by my team, by the inter uh, interventional cardiologists. So in my presentation, I will focus on the transfemoral excess. So this is an image that shows one of the fundamental evidences of TAVR. Uh, major vascular complication independently predicts mortality. This slide compares the cumulative death rates through one year in patient with or without uh, major vascular complications. Uh, in the last couple of years, we have seen a, a real huge development. In the beginning, we started with 10, 22, 24 French uh, devices. Now our devices are in the range of 14 to 18 French, which is a huge development. The other factor is that um, uh, operator experience is also a very important factor. After like 10 procedure, we drop uh, with the vascular complication rate reasonably, but even after uh, like 50 uh, procedures, we are still able to improve. What is the reason of that? The reason is very simple. We just learn how to do uh, the ideal patient selection, how to be prepared to uh, deal with complications. And the result you can see here in the beginning, the first trials, the major vascular complication rate was uh, around 15%. And now we are uh, below 4%. Does it mean that we can sit back and relax? Definitely not. We have to remember that vascular complications translate to increase in mortality. So we have to identify all the potential risk factors of vascular injury. Some of them are related to our patients, uh, like calcification, tortuosity, the vessel caliber, vessel stenosis, and, uh, and the plaques we, we can uh, see on, on the image, uh, on, on the CT. So this is why I underline always in the beginning uh, the importance of meticulous pre-procedure screening as we have seen in, in Dr. Pia's excellent uh, presentation. Uh, the other factors are related to the device or the procedure itself, the TAVI system, the sheets we use, the guide wires, the closure devices. I will try to uh, uh, talk about it a bit later. And of course, we cannot uh, forget ourselves. So it depends a lot on how aggress aggressive we are during manipulations. And I think that the most important thing is to know when, when to stop uh, and uh, change your strategy. And you can only do it by, by practicing. So these are the most important tools for preventing vascular complications. Let's start with the iliofemoral screening. As uh, it was mentioned during the, um, the first presentation, the gold standard is multi-slice CT. You can get all the necessary data from uh, from it regarding vessel size, tortuosity, and calcification all the way up uh, from the puncture site to, to the annulus. Angiography, I still believe it gives us some uh, uh, useful additional information with all the limitations it has. So alone angiography is definitely not enough. We need the multi-slice CT, but if you have an angiography together with the multi-slice CT, it can give you a better idea for uh, during the, um, the, the planning phase of the procedure. And of course, MRI and I was some, there are some uh, case presentations. It might be helpful in chronic kidney, kidney disease patients, but these are not part of uh, the routine uh, assessment. So here is our uh, access strategy in our hospital. We call it proactive approach, which means that during the planning phase, we always have a plan B and plan C in our mind. We start with the, the least aggressive, but still reasonably feasible strategy. And if we get stuck, we don't force, we just go for, for the other plan. Um, sometimes in the beginning, we decide to do 
a preemptive strike. Like if you have um, a lesion on the, on the external iliac of 3.5 or 4 millimeters, it's better to put a balloon in before procedure, balloon it, do the procedure, and uh, on the way back, if there is a dissection, you can still put a stent in. Uh, it's, it's safer for the patient than forcing your uh, large sheet to go through this lesion because the dilation force is always more favorable for the patient than the shear force. And always be prepared for the bailout possibilities. Uh, you have to find the most effective and the fastest, uh, fastest uh, available. So let's go to the access technique. It is one of the most important things for the TAVI procedure. So we need to hit uh, the common femoral artery, which is everybody knows, but it's good to uh, uh, have it in, in your mind how to do it properly. So we need to, to hit it above the femoral bifurcation, but below um, uh, the inferior epigastric artery but we need to see not the origin of the inferior epigastric, but the inferior border, which marks uh, uh, the inguinal ligament. If we puncture below the bifurcation, then the rate of vascular complication will be higher. You cannot close it safely. If we puncture it higher, uh, you will see that, in, in this image I tried to show it to you. So if you puncture above uh, the inguinal ligament, the problem is, that the angle you hit the artery is not 45 degrees. It's all, the, the needle is almost parallel to the vessel. It's very difficult to have a safe closure in, in a vessel like that. Plus, if you have a failure of a closure, you're going to have a retroperitoneal bleeding. So the target is to hit the common femoral artery, the anterior wall, in a 45 uh, degree angle and try to puncture uh, the calcium-free segment of the vessel. Always you uh, imaging guidance and the safety access. You can consider the macropuncture set as, uh, as, as your routine, but do not use the, uh, the skin crease, the maximum pulse, the previous puncture site. These are all misleading. Uh, most of the, the, the centers are using uh, the fluoroscopy guided puncture for that, you need to make, make uh, a baseline NGO to see where the vessel is. You have uh, your uh, bony background as a marker. Plus, I always suggest to, to have some other markers. It can be a wire, a, a pigtail, or a, 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 a road map. It doesn't really matter. But um, the fluoroscopy guidance is extremely important. Some Sites use ultrasound guided puncture. Uh, it's very safe, very effective. From the long axis view, you can see the needle progression. You can avoid the calcified or stenotic uh, uh, regions of, um, of the vessel. From the short axis, uh, you can see the needle entry point and you can puncture the center of the vessel. But I think that the safest way is to combine the two. You can combine the ultrasound and the fluoroscopy together. And I strongly believe that this is uh, the safest way of doing the puncture for, for the large bore excess. In the ultrasound, you can set uh, exactly where the puncture, uh, where the center of the vessel is. You can see where the anterior hole is. And the fluoroscopy, you can see the, 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 the level of the puncture uh, from the femoral, uh, to, regarding to the femoral head. From the sheet, uh, 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 yeah. So we have a lot of historical animal and cadaveric um, studies that have shown that non-diseased arteries can stretch approximately 20% in diameter before permanent damage occurs. It can be dissection or perforation. But diseased vessels uh, are much less pliable and should not be expected to stretch without uh, consequences. So the, what we know is that the risk of vascular complication increases substantially when the outer diameter of the sheet approaches the inner diameter of uh, the vasculature. So in this slide, you can see that it, as the sensitivity and specificity curve identify the threshold um, from the femoral sheet size, and the threshold is 1.05, it means that 
uh, above 5% of overstretching, you can expect to have significantly more vascular complications. And this is the effect of having diseased uh, vessel. And don't, uh, don't forget uh, the importance of, of the sheet size. I don't want to go through the whole table, but if you take just the first one, if you do the procedure with a 14 French inline sheet, um, the company says that above five millimeters, the procedure is doable. But don't forget that the real outer diameter of the 14 French inline sheet is 5.94 uh, millimeters. It means that if you put it in a five millimeter vessel, you will have uh, a 20% oversizing. So if you want to stay on the green zone, you should have for the 14 French inline sheet, a vessel that is at least uh, 5.7, 5.8 millimeters. Of course, you can do it in the, in the yellow zone, but at, at, in, in that zone, you might have difficulties, especially if the patient has a round concentric calcification in the vessel. So for the vascular closure, um, we have several options. Uh, the first option where, when we started was the surgical uh, cut down, uh, but the surgical access for the large bore femoral access doesn't appear to confer any ad advantages over the percutaneous access. Plus, it needs general anesthesia, it's time consuming, it's painful, it has a greater infection risk. Uh, uh, so, I, I think 95% uh, of, uh, of the centers doesn't use uh, the surgical cut down as. Uh, uh, the, the first option. We used to have a ProStar, which was a good device, a suture mediated uh, preclosure device, with a steep learning curve, but it had a, a, a large and an acceptable failure rate of like 15%. Um, so recently we used the ProGlide, two ProGlides usually um, it, with an acceptable failure rate and Manta became available also, which is a collagen uh, device with no preclosure, with uh, less than 5% of learning curve. And there are some, some old, old devices also coming. Uh, and there are some additional techniques. There is a, the, the dry closure technique when you inflate a balloon, do the closure uh, when uh, the balloon is inflated, and deflate the balloon after the, uh, the pre deployed progress sutures are tied down. And if the hemostasis is not achieved, you advance the balloon to the arteriotomy site and inflate it for a few minutes. To be honest, I never did this uh, type of procedure, but it might be effective. And the other thing, other uh, type is, I think is very important, the hybrid closure, which means that the, the pre-suture with ProGlide, but only one, at the end, you withdraw the last sheet over the wire, advance an eight French sheet, fully deploy the proglide, achieving hemostasis over the atrium sheet, and then you close the arteriotomy size with an eight French NGO seal. In my center, we have uh, the, the routine is to do this hybrid closure uh, in the diseased vessel, and when we have a large vessel um, free of calcium, we use the Manta. Manta is also an excellent device, but in my experience, Manta doesn't really like the calcium in the puncture site, especially not uh, the calcium in the posterior wall of the vessel. It sometimes had difficulties uh, to, to align <clears throat> inside of the vessel with, uh, with the leg of the device. And of course, there are some assisted manual compression possibilities like um, uh, the safeguard or uh, 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 the thermostop device. We, we need to be prepared for, uh, for any complications. So we have to anticipate and minimize the complications, always be ready for the catastrophic uh, situations and always be able to control the bleeding rapidly. Because if you have a hole of six millimeter in an artery, uh, you can lose a patient in, 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 a, in a couple of minutes. So we need to have all the bailout uh, uh, devices available in the room. The first is the Coda balloon, <clears throat> which is a good device for it. It's a um, uh, distal aortic occlusion balloon. It's um, 
compliant balloon and you can very easily save the life of the patient. Once it's inflated in the aorta, you have time to do anything. We need to have crossover occlusion balloons, peripheral stents covered, uncovered, balloon expandable and self-expanding, <coughs> crossover sheets, peripheral wires. Uh, um, and as a last uh, option, we need to have a vascular surgeon available in the hospital. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, the vascular complications are still very important prognostically. Um, uh, now we are uh, at a rate of two to four percent, which is, I think, acceptable, but still far away from the ideal. Um, Ninety-four percent of the work is done before we scrub during the pre-procedure -pre uh, planning of the procedure, and this is why the CT assessment is critically important. Uh, we have to always be very flexible in decision, uh, decision making and we need to learn when we have to stop uh, without further uh, forcing and switch to plan B and plan C if uh, it's necessary. <clears throat> so I think that's all I uh, wanted to say about um, large board accesses at, at this setting and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Giza, for this excellent presentation. The large bore access is the main issue with all these new structural heart disease devices are so bulky as yet. So we'll take one quick comment from Ajit Mullasari. Ajit, uh, you have been doing a lot of these procedures. So any tips for the beginners? Uh, I think uh, before we start large bore, I think the fellows should train in small bore accesses in the femoral because most of them are doing radial. So I think that that's where you start with. I think they should get used to ultrasound for femoral punctures in routine cases. They should use micropuncture needles for puncturing. The, they should know the anatomy and puncture, as Giza said, below the IEA and above the bifurcation routinely in uh, small bore access uh, femoral procedures. The second thing is the reading of the CT, which is very important, otherwise you will miss. And I always like to keep in the green rather than the orange or the red as much as possible. We need to anticipate complications. We need to have uh, training in multiple devices. I've seen centers using only perclos or only seals. I think we should know both. And whatever you use in the lab is fine, but you should know both. We should know that if you have difficulty in pushing in the femoral artery, that you have to be careful how to use uh, propofol uh, when you push and to read a patient's pain and stop. We should use crossover technique for balloon in case you suspect any rupture uh, or you're suspecting some tear so that you can quickly clamp down. You should have peripheral stents in your lab so that you don't have trouble when you are uh, running into like a you know, coronary uh, you know, stent, which you have, a covered stent, you should have all of them in your lab. And finally, you should always end with the DSA uh, for the groin, just to be sure you don't miss minor leaks. As Giza said, a small board can create, a small leak can create a major catastrophe if it's uh, retroperitoneal or even if it's not retroperitoneal in the patient and always have a surgeon around so that we can have access. This is my point, which I would take. Uh, one uh, last comment from Dr. Amit Chaurasia. He's, he's a stalwart also doing a lot of proctoring. Amit, uh, we're missing you here physically and your two tips for the large bulge access. Or do you use alternate access very often? Uh, as for the alternate access, I feel uh, it's a good access. But uh, with the advent of 14 French, I think uh, almost anything can be done uh, all the tavis can be done through those uh, arteries. One thing is uh, what I would like to say, like when you are using a metronic device in your small arteries, sometimes you have a, a failure of proglite. Both the sutures can come out. A lot of time people get, uh, you know, worried about that. I, I think uh, it's a less worrisome because you can just compress those arteries. 14 French is not a big uh, artery too compress. It takes around 20 to 25 minutes to just compress. The second thing is you can uh, try this, like you just uh, use a single pro glide and then compress off the 14 French. 
uh, or you can use a single proglide for a, a plus an angiosil. Uh, both ways, it's a good thing. As for 18 French, you can do uh, two proglides or a single proglide plus angiosil and compress for some time. The bottom line is by the time the patient leaves the lab, you should have the hemostasis complete, no matter what way you do it. At the end, you take an angio, you always take an angio to make sure the vessel is flowing and there is no leak, minor leak or anything. If a leak is there, you can try to put in another closer device or you can just try to compress and see what is the situation. If you have taken a multiple puncture, suppose you have hit the uh, needle multiple times, then you need to compress completely, make sure that there is no leak before the patient leaves the lab. That is what I usually follow. So I think uh, those are so the, uh, things. The tip is remove the wire in the end, the last. Yeah, That's yeah, it. yeah. Okay. Even if you were, if you if you have a failed proglide, both the proglides uh, sutures have moved away. Keep the wire, compress till you see that there is no blood coming out or there is no ooze at all. If you see the ooze is there, the wire always uh, helps to uh, you know put in a covered stand or something like that as a guide. So the basic point is never lose the wire till the end of the procedure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Amit, and uh, thank you everybody in this session, the moderators and the experts for helping us in this discussion. And uh, I invite the next panel, and we'll move forward with the presentation from Dr. Ganesh Manoharan from Belfast, who's one of the fathers of uh, uh, Stavi establishment and we are joined in this uh, by other great stalwarts like Dr. Ashok Seth, who is the pioneer of TAVI interventions in this country. And uh, so let me invite the panel over here. Dr. Praveen Chandra is here with us. Praveen, can I request you to come and join me to moderate this session? And he is uh, one of the uh, very active uh, structural heart interventionists from this part of the country. Dr. Harinder K. Bali, uh, who is the Chief of Interventional Cardiology and Chairman of Cardiology at Paris Hospital, Chandigarh, my former colleague in PGI Chandigarh. Please join us on the dais over here. Uh, Dr. Manohar Shinde, one of our former fellows, please join us uh, for the panel discussion. Dr. Rupa Salwan has been a former Escorts, Fortis Escorts, and now is a very senior cardiologist at the Max Hospital, Saket. She's here present with us. Request you to please join us. Dr. Adi Yadav, please may I request you to join us on the panel for discussions. Then we are joined by several people online. Dr. Razmi Rahman from Kabul and uh, Dr. Uh, Nagendra Bhupati, I would request you to be there on the panel for discussions. Dr. Rajneesh Kapoor, another great operator from Medanta Hospital and a very close friend. Uh, he's joining us virtually. Dr. Ankur Rahuja is there. And I can see Dr. Vijay Bang, who's already joined in. And uh, Dr. Vivek Mathur, one of our former fellows, is already there. So we have Dr. Vivek Mehan, the VIP uh, film star interventional cardiologist, also on the panel with us. So welcome, all of you. And Ganesh, we are on if you have shared your presentation. The first presentation is tips and tricks how to do a self expanding valve. What are the new developments in this area? Ganesh has been proctoring and teaching the, more than half of the world on how to use the self-expanding strength. So no other person better than him. Over to you, Ganesh. Uh, good morning, everybody. Atul, thank you so much for uh, kind words and for inviting me to your meeting. I am so sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, we, can, we can see that we are in a different world now. Uh, half of us are face covered. Half of us can see who we are. So um, these are unique times, and I would like to congratulate you and your team for um, being able to arrange this wonderful meeting under difficult times. Uh, I miss seeing all of you. I miss traveling. As, as you know, I see Ashok, I see Chandra, so, and many, many, many of my friends. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off by, um, first of all, telling you all that this is not a talk about self-expanding uh, technology specifically, but to share with you a technique that I've been using for nearly over six years now, uh, but I just um, made it a bit easier to teach and train. It's intuitive, 
Uh, it's called a no, um, frame alignment technique. It's uh, what interventions do frequently, which is use fluoroscopy to do what we do. Um, and I'm going to just get on with it. So we know that to get optimal implant depths and outcomes, we do need the appropriate device choice for your patient. The landing zone and the calcification and distribution calcification has been a pain for TAVI operators as it has been for us when we do cornea intervention. Uh, I think angle angulation can be challenging. Uh, and also, I think finally, how the device interacts with the LVOT structures, the annular structures, and the ascending aorta also can be uh, a, key, a reason why sometimes you might find the procedure challenging. Finally, I think uh, certainly with all the devices, whether balloon expandable or self expanding, where the device finally lands up, the depth and its position impacts on outcome as well. So the frame alignment technique does not require pre procedure CT to analysis. You don't need to know S curve, double S curve, where your sinuses are, it doesn't matter. It is a real time assessment of depth by referencing the valve frame to the pigtail and non coronary sinus. It can be used, one of the key advantages of the technique is it can be used for any annular anatomy. In India, for example, there's a lot of bicuspids, uh, type not and type two, and this technique works very well with that anatomies. It can be used for any self experimental devices and can be used for any XA. So let's start off with a case. So this is an 85 year old female who has uh, severe aortic stenosis. And after the MDT discussion, uh, we plan to do TAVI under local anesthesia. For this specific patient, we used the Navator 25 millimeter valve and we pre-dilated with the 18 millimeter balloon. Now very briefly, the Navator valve is the new kid on the block from Abbott. Uh, it is, I'm calling a new kit, but it's a uh, significant change from the portico valve. It has all the key benefits of the portico valve in that it is self-expanding, resheathable, repositionable. But importantly, uh, it also has an active outer uh, layer for the skirt. This valve also has other key advantages. Cornea access is really easy with this part because it's a large cell. <clears throat> it is tri-leaflet and it is bovine leaflet, and you can get size difference between. 19 to 27 uh, anatomies. What's unique about this technology is that the skirt expands on diastole, fills up all the gaps, uh, this then endothelizes and forms a permanent seal. So it's very unique. It is delivered by the flex and delivery system. And I think this is the most deliverable um, system now uh, for Tavi technologies. And when you guys um, get your hands on it, you'll be able to feel that yourself. And hopefully, hopefully it will be there in the next few weeks or months. Mm -hmm. So this patient has a perimeter of 66, which met the requirements for the Navator valve, has some calcifications uh, at the LVOT. But importantly, you can see that it's quite angulated anatomy, about 53 degrees. Now for the purpose of um, education, I'm also giving you the angulation for um, cusp overlay, you'd have heard those terms being uh, mentioned. Ashu, I know, knows it very well, and Chandra as well. And just remember that, that for, if you are following the CT for cusp overlay, it's REO9, Hodo27, and we'll come back to that. So pre dilatation is performed. Uh, I normally just take a angulation about LAO 10 to 15 degrees, in this case 17, under rapid pacing, 18 balloon was used. Then the valve is then advanced uh, to position just at or just above the coronary sinus of the uh, non coronary sinus, the pigtail is in the non coronary sinus. Now you'll note that I've now started off with LAO32. The key thing about this technique is that you always align the base of the frame to be coplanar. You allow the valve, and most self expanding will migrate a little bit, so you allow the valve to migrate in its own way as you're releasing. Mm -hmm. And then you maintain the depth, and usually I, I pick about two, three to four millimeters. I'm not too fixed about it. The most important thing is to keep an eye on your conduction. If you see a conduction change, then you're probably a little too deep for your patient and then come up a little bit. The next step of this procedure is to gently lift your nose cone away from the LVOT. So once you have the optimal depth, you've aligned the frame, you can see now I've gone to LV36 to do that. The wire is then gently pulled back to lift the nose cone away from, away from the LVOT. And the reason for that, I believe, is one of the main differences between why you have high pacemaker rates with self-expanding and low pacemaker rate with balloon expandable. When you advance a Edward Sapien valve, for example, you, they have a very unique uh, phenomenon where they can retroflex a device that pulls the whole device away from the LVOT and centralize the device. I do believe this 18 French nose cone uh, will traumatize the left bundle and cause all the conduction changes. You know, you guys have done a lot of coronary intervention 
even at five French right diagnostic catheter, when you're doing a right angiogram, and if it slips in the LVOT, it costs trans in left bundle. So by pulling the wire back very gently, a little bit to lift your nose cone away, I think minimizes the conduction changes. So at LA 36, I start releasing the valves. Um, and at this point, you don't need to do anything uh, apart from just releasing the valves. You can see the valves are slowly being released. And the key thing is to always maintain the inflow portion to be coplanar of the frame. So you can see I'm going more LAO. And the, the other important thing about this technique is you cannot go caudal or cranial. The minute you go caudal or cranial tilt, you will foreshorten the image and you will get artificial depth assessment. You might think you're too deep, but you're actually probably too shallow. And you may think you're too shallow and you're actually probably too deep. So we've now moved more LAO and we're now to LAO 44. The depth is still about three to four millimeters. I like where I am. So from now, from one third, I go, I rapid pace of 180, not 110, 120, 180 to two thirds. And you can see that when you do that, the valve position, angulation, anatomy does not change. It behaves itself. Now, you don't technically need to wrap a piece of the portico valve or the nevator valve because it's an annular functioning valve. But I do that now for all self expanding whether it's a metronic valve or this valve. It just maintains your depth and stabilizes it. Then you check. And you can see that one of the benefits of this technology is that both the non coronary and the left coronary depths are quite similar. similar. So for horizontal anatomy, this valve actually has features in it that makes it uh, very suitable. The depth is about 4.5 on both sides. Now, the other important part of the technique now, you now go to ARIO caudal. None of us deploy a stent in one view. So I think Tavi is no different. I think you do need to take a second view. Now, you remember that when I told you before the cusp overlay measurement was ARIO 9 caudal 27. You can see that when you go to the angulate, that angulation by CT, the valve is not coplanar. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to know what depth this valve truly is. And if you've freeze it and do various measurements, you can get various depths from minus uh, one millimeters to eight millimeter depth. And I think that's one of the reasons why some people find uh, the cusp overlay technique confusing occasionally. This occurs in about a third of our patients when we do this. So the most important thing now when you go to another view is you go again to the frame alignment technique where you align the base of the frame. Uh, and to do that is ARIO 9 quarter 49. You can see the depth in the ARIO quarter 49 uh, is similar to the LAO view, it's about 4.5. I like what I see. I now release the valve. This is another thing I now do. I rapid taste a 180 again, drop the pressure completely. Takes about 10 seconds to release the valve. The Nevator valve has two anchors. The Metronic has, two, uh, has three and the Metronic has two anchors. Just remember to be sure that the anchors are fully released. And then you check your position. Most times in self expanding, once you finally release, you may need to come back less LAO because the valve adjusts to the anatomy and you get a different view for coplanar uh, an analysis. And I'll come back to LAO 25. <clears throat> you can see the depth is excellent. It's no conduction disturbance in this patient. There's no leak either. This patient went home uh, in day two. So to summarize the tap, this is a very busy slide. So it's very simple. You position your picture, non coin sinus, you advance your valve, get your depth, and all you do is go LAO only on fluoroscopy, maintaining the inflow portion of the frame. You go from one third to two thirds under rapid pacing. You then go to another view. Uh, I go to RA portal view, align the frame, check your position again. You like it, you go back to the LAO view. You take an angiogram again to double check. And these are only 10 most contrast injections. Uh, you rapid pace again, release the valve, uh, and then uh, close the thermal access. And Geza did a lovely presentation on large bore access closure, uh, and then you go home and the patient goes home usually the next day. So uh, with that now, uh, I will stop and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Excellent presentation. So we'll take some comments. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, Dr. Praveen, would you like to comment on the commissural alignment and yeah, so you know, uh, this is uh, the technique which Dr. Ganesh Manoran showed is I think very, very interesting. I saw that happen, you know, two, three times. And this is not the commercial alignment technique, actually. It is, you know, what he has shown is that we do it in the LAO po uh, position, which is not that same as the commercial alignment, which you see on the RAO projection. But it works very well, as he already showed. Now, Ganesh, you know, uh, one thing, uh, how do you know, like, 
why do you say it is so different from the commissure alignment technique? What, what is the advantage of doing this? Ah, okay, everybody's so, interest, yeah. Really good point. There was also a question in the chat about can this use, be used for uh, the Medtronic technology? I actually started using this with Medtronic technology and it works very, very well for any sector, self-expanding. Um, one of the nuances of self-expanding, Chandra, as you know, as you release in the valve, the frame interacts with the LVOT and it constantly changes. So people are preoccupied and aligning the three sinuses, or if you go to the cusp OLA, you align the two sinuses. But that's not what the valve does. Uh, the valve does what it wants to do depending on how it interacts the LVOT, annulus, and the STJ, and the ascending. What this technique does is, in the 99.9% .9 of patients in the world, the non coronary sinus is usually the lowest coronary sinus fluoroscopically. And when you put the pigtail in the non coronary sinus, whether you're using cusp overlay or this technique, your final reference of depth is on the pigtail. Now, people who advocate for cusp overlay always say, oh, you know, the LVOT is elongated. Yes, on CT is elongated, but please tell me who in this planet deploys the valve on the day looking at the LVOT. You don't. You, you reference your valve on the pigtail, which is the reference we all trust and believe. So you make sure your pigtail is a non coronary sinus. Then you, your objective is to make sure your lowest part of the valve is just below the lowest sinus and ignore every other sinus. When you go to two thirds, you wanna make sure the valve is also lower on the left coronary sinus. The right coronary sinus always will take what you give it. You will never be higher than the right coronary sinus. So essentially then you're converting your eye from a 3D structure to a 2D structure, which our eye can manage and handle, at least today. Now, five years from now, we may be deploying these things in a 3D you know, imaging technology. We, don't, we are not there now. So using this technique, I've consecutively assessed my patients from 1st of September till now. Uh, because of COVID, as a first operator, I've done 91 cases. Consecutive cases, complex emergencies were all included in it. 91 cases, half and half. 50% patients were metronic valve, 50% were Abbott valve, but only self-expanding. All were transpamoral. One pacemaker. Now, I know in India, the pacemaker rate is low because I think the patient type is different. My patient's average is 83 years old. And I think one out of 91 is pretty good. Huh? Uh, and, you know, five-year data for us as a group, we are pacemaker rate about something like five or six percent. So there's something that we have done, which is very different from what you see with self-explained data commercially and in trial data. And I think one step is this. And the other important step, I think, is to lift the nose cone away. Uh, and, okay, this technique doesn't mean that you're not dependent on the wire anymore. I know some people get nervous by it. But um, with, with the resheathable, repositionable technologies, the wire, I think, becomes less relevant uh, when you're deploying these uh, valves. So, Ganesh, <clears throat> Ganesh, I'm just going to bring in a few points which are so important. I'm a great proponent of cusp overlap. Uh, and I'll tell you where <clears throat> I want to uh, have a clarity from you, because you said you go to the LAO, and the lowest portion of the pigtail is your depth. But you know that yourself that you can change angulation and you can actually believe that you're a one millimeter lower than your pigtail or you can be three millimeters lower than the pigtail. So just because you're looking at the pigtail, unless you are in line with the analyst, <clears throat> you cannot be sure of that depth. Now, when you start actually, off, actually, like, uh, Ganesh, just listen. Yeah. If you start off with a cuspal overlap view, that's the one position in which a marker band is absolutely parallax removed as well as the analyst is parallax removed. And that is what I want to say, that at the end, that is the annular plane by itself, because you, if you go into the LA projection, you're always trying to remove your band parallax, which is totally not in line with your annular plane, with a coplanar view. So I, I therefore am saying that it is not when the valve is deployed that it's important, it's when you start releasing the valve is the depth you're going to be. So when you come from LAO to RAO, obviously you're not going to see the valve frame in a parallax remove view. But if you start off in the RAO projection in the cuspal overlap view, it's the start which matters, it's not the end which matters. So you position it at the right point. That's what I'm saying. 
Uh, those are important points, Sasha. I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, in my uh, 91 cases, I also consecutively went to the cusp overlay by CT. And in one third of the patients, the frame is not aligned. Um, but the important thing, I think, when people look at depths and com compare depths, when I go LAO, it's only LAO. The minute you do a caudal tilt, you have foreshortening. You think you're a bit very shallow, but you're not. And the analogy I give is when you're walking down the beach in Chennai or Mumbai or somewhere, and you watch two people walking towards you from a distance, you, it's impossible for you looking at them coming from distance what depth they are. It's impossible because one could be ahead, one could be low. And that's what LAO, caudal or cranial gives you. But if you are looking from them from side, which is what pure LA gives you, because the pigtail is only one millimeter away from your frame, you get real-time depth analysis. And of the 91 patients, I, I analyze the depth on the pure LAO view and the RAO caudal view, and the depth assessment is exactly the same, bar 0.1 of a millimeter difference. Um, and the other important thing, I think this technique is applicable for any anatomy. But if you have a type not, I mean, India has a lot of bicuspid valve, as you, as you know. If you have type not anatomy or type two anatomy bicuspid, the cusp only doesn't make any sense because the, the, there's, no, there's no three cusps aligned. You only have two cusps. So you then you have to think of something else to do. And this technique can be used for those kind of patients. So I think we are talking the same thing, but perhaps not the way. Cusp overlay, but for my view, is a CT assessment done on a patient six months ago, three months ago. RAO caudal angulation is probably the right terminology to use. And in fact, when you go traveling, a lot of people actually do that. They call it cusp overlay, but as they're deploying, they go more caudal to align the frame. So, and the other important thing I think to remember is, you know, Asha, you've done plenty of CTs, and I know, I know you analyze your own CTs. When you use CT to assess cusp overlay, and if you do retrospective CT analysis, every degree that you take on a CT, either systolic, diastolic, 30, 40, 60, 70, the measurement you get for cusp overlay changes. Yeah. So then, you know, so then if you're teaching people, it's very difficult to say, look, you take systolic when you don't take diastolic, but oh, diastolic is clearer, what do I take? I think this technique allows you to have real-time assessment of both on the non-coronary and the left coronary. And more importantly, you also get the really true assessment of depth. Um, and you know what the coronary arteries are doing while you're deploying. So, and can be used for valve involves, can be used for bicuspids, can be used when you're going carotid, right uh, jugular, right uh, subclavian, which all can be challenging for the, the CT analysis using cusp overlay. And finally, I think when you have somebody with kyphosis, very large females or males, which we tend to get quite a few in Northern Ireland, uh, you can't, it's very, it's almost impossible to go to a cusp overlay angulation if it's very steep. So I think when you have all that, first of all, this is not to go against cusp overlay, by the way. I think if you are using cusp overlay, you know the technique well, and you get good reproducible results, for God's sake, please don't change. So as what? the techniques evolve, I think uh, what Ganesh is making a point is there will be several ways to do the same thing. Right. And yeah. uh, you need to find your best uh, way how you are getting outcomes and uh, which are favorable. So we're going to move on to the next uh, presentation by Dr. Praveen Chandra. And he's going to talk to us about a balloon expandable valve. And uh, we'll have continued discussions following this. Please stay with us. OK. So uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, wonderful program today. And I think this is, for me, this is the first on-site program which I'm attending. And I'm sure uh, now people will gain more confidence. So this is your first step towards bringing people together. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, we saw a very wonderful presentation by Dr. Ganesh Manoharan, who is the you know, the pioneer of all these techniques. And we saw that now techniques are changing and evolving. But now I'm going to take you to the balloon expandable arena, where, uh, again, in balloon expandable, you know, there are steps which are similar and also slightly different. So CT assessment is the key in deciding the valve size and approach for tower for balloon expandable also. And of course, then valve selection based on CT analysis steps involved in TAVI with balloon expandable walls I'll show, and the post-procedure assessment, how do we do that in these? So 
basically as we see the ct so i'm taking you through a case which is a valve in valve case and here you can see that you know it is not so difficult because you can see the valve on ct very well and also if you know exactly which uh, size of valve has been put there is an app which is the tavi uh, valve in valve app uh, and it is available on the mobile phone you can quickly download it and use it i'm sure most of you are using it so in this we all have the indication which size of valve can be used which type of valve can be used and uh, how do we use it that is also there so that is a step by step already it's available on the mobile phone one can use it it is both for aortic valve and valve and for mitral valve and valve so still you will have to look at the cts to make sure because many times and we have found it once when, when we were doing our first five cases of valve and valve there was a discharge summary uh, which was showing that this particular valve has been used and the size and this was in our previous institution where rajneesh and we were all together and uh, the the you know the uh, discharge summary showed that the valve is of this size particular and this make and when we checked it it was different because earlier it was not so you know uh, meticulous to write the exact size and etc once the patients are being discharged so be aware of that and also try to reconfirm it on ct so this is the ct analysis and in here what we look at this is that the ct will tell you the inner diameter which is very very important the inner diameter of the ring and as you can see here this is 19.9 and this is uh, on the outer diameter is actually not so important the most important is the inner diameter and also which type of valve it is because sometimes we have to if it is a small valve we can do a cracking of the uh, the ring and that can only be done with few types of valves some valves you cannot crack the ring and uh, the, one of those valves which is used is the metronic valve where we cannot do is the mitro flow i don't think uh, in india it has been used uh, so commonly so we look at the ct we look the whole uh, do the whole analysis about the sizing of the valve looking at the you know the aortic root that is also very important and of course finally because many of these patients will have a very dilated root or a horizontal aorta so looking at this in this patient it is a 23 millimeter valve which is virtually one can do a virtual implant also and see how much is the valve to coronary distance also can be assessed especially in small anatomies as you can see in this case it has been done and the distance was 5.2 millimeters which was quite reasonable so in this patient on the basis of this pre-implanted bioprosthetic valve we decided to implant a 23 millimeter sapien 3 valve and the femoral artery was sorry femoral artery was 5.5 so for this it is okay it is in the orange zone as we saw in this uh, previous presentation it is but since there was no calcification it was all right to go ahead otherwise one would choose a uh, alternative uh, access so e sheath helps in easily navigating because in with the balloon expandable valve the sheets are self, you know expandable sheets we are using both for uh, adverts and also for the my valve both these sheets are expandable sheets first we put it in, in the sheath inside and then dilate it with the 18 french dilator especially with the my valve sheath so in here you can see that there is no calcification at all and the sizes are looking all right so we went ahead and this is the sizing chart which all of you know but still you know one has to see that the sizing chart of the you know these valves for both balloon valves is slightly different so this is the adverts chart and one can if one is using the my valve which is the balloon expandable valve you can use the my valve chart and because my valve has quarter sizes also for example between 20 and 23 there is a 21 and a half and between 23 and 26 there is a 24.5 so that is how we can do the you know sizing with the my valve and you can also see that the depth the the length of the frame is 15.5 with the 20 millimeter and 18 millimeter is the height with the 23 millimeter valve so in this patient we selected this and also a very interesting thing that we did this last year and Naginder, myself, and we all went to do this case when there was nothing happening. There was no single flight taking off. At, at, at the airport, there was only birds. There was nothing else. And we had to go in this, uh, uh, in the intense heat. We were sweating completely. It was very, very difficult to do this. And we had to come back on the same day and we, our flight was stopped. And on the tarmac, we were pulled back 
So it was quite an interesting case which we did uh, in this um, uh, valve and valve. And the patient was in cardiogenic shock failure, so we had to do that. So this is the you know the, the first step in any uh, valve in, you know in any tower procedure is the access because as we saw from the morning's presentation, the most difficult, the most serious complication which happens in a valve is a puncture site access and or the vascular uh, complication. So we have to be careful from the very beginning. So in, in here, what we do is we do a uh, you know, puncture at the right spot by, you know, and we have different techniques. People do use it. Somebody use, uh, uses a ultrasound guided, some, someone uses a contralateral puncture and then do a, you know, injection and do the, uh, you know, access with that. And the, some people use a pigtail catheter in the artery and then do the puncture. So any of these is okay. And we do a coronary shoot because the coronary was not taken done at that time. And many times these days we do the coronary if contrast is not an issue. We do the coronary also at the same time. And in case there is a need to do any intervention, we go ahead and do the intervention at the same time. So this is the coronary artery, you know, angiogram. And soon after that, uh, we, you know, take this uh, AL1 diagnostic catheter after, after the temporary pacemaker has been put. And this is the balloon tipped pacing lead, which we use in always. Because earlier, sometimes when we miss the balloon pacing lead, we had a complication of perforation with the uh, non balloon tip lead. So we use that always. And in uh, here, you can see a AL1 diagnostic has been used. In valve and valve, sometimes it is difficult because these valves are quite uh, degenerated and uh, uh, eccentrically uh, stenosed. So what we do is we do the you know the crossing with the termo straight tip wire and uh, it's always the termo straight tip wire which we use and once the valve is crossed the the al1 diagnostic catheter is pushed inside and then we exchange that with a pigtail and after that we put the you know whatever wire you want to use I mean, mostly these days we are using the safari wire for the balloon expandable valves and the Medtronic comes with the Confida wire. They are already pre-shaped wires. <clears throat> they are quite good. And most of these cases actually are done with a small curve, which is available with the Safari. So once the wire is in position, we navigate this valve. And this is a, uh, you know, uh, an adverse valve, which is a sheath valve. So we have to pull down the sheath. Once we are in the middle of the thoracic area, we remove the parallax and then pull the balloon inside the valve. So here, this is the only difference. Whereas in the my valve, it is preloaded. We don't have to do any uh, changes here at the side because there is no sheath. So when then we take it inside, uh, once it is already, uh, the balloon is pulled inside. And as you can see here, that uh, this is the valve positioning. And this is very important that we do the valve positioning according to the frame. And because in normal non you know there's native valves we do the positioning according to the injection which we do with the annulus and as you saw that uh, mostly we start with the coplanar view and then we do the positioning and in here uh, the one should also know how the valve will shorten because the edwards valve shortens from the distal to proximal whereas the my valve shortens from both sides so that is a slight difference here and once uh, the positioning is done, and then we do the deployment and with the pacing on, and the pacing is to be done very carefully. So the sequence of pacing, you know, balloon, you know, inflation is to be very, very accurate because if we do some something wrong, then the, the valve will pop out or go deep inside. So here you can see one, unless until the balloon is deflated, we do not, you know, stop the pacing. And all this is done by one person in the cath lab, whosoever, so that there is no confusion that every two people are saying, okay, pacing off, pacing, that should not happen. So once the valve is in good position, it is uh, flared from both the sides, then we remove the wire, put the pigtail inside, check gradients, do iotogram. So these are the steps we have to follow in each case. And in here, you can see that the valve is in good position. There is no leak. 
the quandaries are flowing all right and there is no you know injury to the aorta so once that is all confirmed then it is time to take it out but this is the, also the one of the very important steps uh, when we are uh, finishing up the procedure that you know we have to do the final assessment of the vascular puncture site which you can see that we are doing it although it was a slightly tortuous uh, arteries but we saw that everything is okay and that should be confirmed always if, whenever you miss it you are in problems so i think with this uh, these are the very simple steps very easy and let me tell you that with balloon expandable uh, the difference between balloon and self expanding is in balloon is much faster that you don't have to do pull and push and recapture and stuff like that it is one shot and you are done but the most important thing is that you have to do the proper selection of the size of the valve and proper selection of the case and because the chance of having a annular rupture is higher with balloon expandable valves and that only happens if you select the wrong valve for the wrong patient so with this i'll stop here thank you very much excellent presentation uh, praveen as usual you know the very relaxed and uh, so we'll take some comments uh, from the panel maybe uh, dr rupa and dr bali would you like to make some comments the valves which have been implanted they are small for the the, the ppm and in such cases one is trying to fracture them the valve can be fractured but uh, would you think that uh, supra because self expanding valve which is a supra valve valve would give us a better valve area in such cases rather than choosing a balloon expandable valve yes so in very small valves we start thinking in those lines but we also have to consider the anatomy the age of the patient the coronary future coronary axis so this is something which we were thinking in this case also but this is a young patient unfortunately he had a valve degeneration much earlier so we kept that in mind thinking that you know he did well with this size of the valve for 10 years or so and if we give him another 10 years with this valve it will be fine because he is young if he was 75 years of age i would have thought of giving him a self expanding valve so the coronary axis issue is a little bit tricky because with the self expanding valves you can access but it becomes difficult with the balloon expandable valves the coronary axis is absolutely clean and nice so that is why we chose this valve but yes your comment is very right that in a very small valves it is a reasonable idea to go for a self expanding supra annular valves Rupa. however it also depends that you know uh, what is depending if the a patient is 80 years of age generally then it doesn't matter you know because he is not going to be so active he won't have those symptoms of ppm in that case do you think now the time has come when there should be a heart team approach in the first place itself if we are going to have a ppm yeah. it's better to go with a uh, self uh, with a uh, tower rather than a sour unless you're doing a you know surgical aortic root dilatation so that time should be taken in the first surgical uh, discussion itself first point itself absolutely yeah. that you know heart team discussion a clear clean heart team discussion and rajnish is sitting here he is the supporter of this therapy we started together many years back and uh, certainly you know that is always very helpful and uh, fortunately uh, the surgeons which i have worked with have been very supportive so it works out quite well you have a way with the surgeons no <laughs> doubt <laughs> rupa your comment yeah so you know what he's saying is very right i don't think the surgeons talk to us about the valve they are putting in the way we measure ppm they are not measuring ppm when their patients go to ot and this app needs to be used by them themselves it's a surgeon who's made this app and very often we are seeing patients uh, you know who are symptomatic young patients also are symptomatic i mean you used to have short stages with a tall patient he's sitting with a ppm and a bad surgery now ppm is also causing degeneration of that previous valve so you know i don't know how we are placed and every case has to be individualized by what you're going to do finally i mean the coronary protection versus a smaller valve in that valve which will also degenerate faster that may have lasted 10 years but now with the ppm this is not necessarily going to last 10 years now the second comment actually we couldn't if you could allow me dr mathur was on the frame alignment technique i think you missed that point which uh, was said very nicely by dr ganesh that of see when you hold the non coronary cusp he is getting the nose cone back is as the valve opens and it holds the left it's not where you started 
it's happening slowly. He's getting the nose cone off. He's getting his central aligned and then it's holding the left. I think it's brilliant. It comes through a lot of observation and it's not here, I do it and cut, it's gone, you know, like a balloon expandable bag. It's very dynamic and uh, we must have an open mind to this with all the limitations of where you can't get that uh, a cusp overlap and there wouldn't be cusp overlap in a bicuspid. I think it's a very brilliant uh, technique which all of us should just approach with an open mind. It'll help us. The alignment of the nose cone by getting the wire back is as important to catch the left sign as well. A last comment from Vijay, uh, Dr. Vijay Sena. Mike can be switched on. Yeah. Dr. Praveen, what was the gradient at the end of your procedure? Because uh, the valve I saw was 19 size uh, internal diameter. And generally, we take a, uh, uh, either a 20 millimeter or a 21.5 balloon expanding, which again will have a chance of giving a prosthesis patient mismatch. So valve fracture, how frequently or uh, I think we should consider, especially if you are taking balloon expanding. And the other thing is, the advantage of self-expanding valve in these patients of valve in valve is that apart from the supraannular placement with better hemodynamics, you can uh, coronary occlusion is a very impending uh, risk in these valve in valve patients. So the advantage of supravalvular, supraannular self-expanding valves is that you can do a balloon dilatation or you can just uh, check before releasing the valve, you can see whether your coronaries are occluded or not. Because even if you have checked the VTC, even if you have checked the annulus STJ junction and everything, still there will be a fairly 4.5% risk of coronaries getting occluded. So it is uh, self-expanding valve has an advantage in terms of supravalvular hemodynamics. Number two, coronary safety. And number three, the patient prosthesis mismatch, uh, if you are putting a small valve again, will be there. So valve fracture should be, I think, practiced. So Dr. Rupa has stimulated Dr. Rajneesh Malhotra to make a comment. And the, the last thing I just want to tell you, I mean, because the cardiology meeting. So for, I mean, you can discuss with the surgeons and the current generations of the surgical valves have already incorporated. I think they are future ready. They are TAVI ready. So these, I mean, always have a marker on this. So you can make out, I mean, what kind of size of the valve which was being put. And it, the frame has got a sliding mechanism. So, so it always expands to the next yeah. size. So these next generation valves, I mean, when you are putting, I mean, our surgeon is putting a valve, you can always discuss. So these adverse resilia valves, they've already made, I mean, for, I would say the future TAVI. So, I mean, if you can discuss with the surgeons and you can put this, these valves. So I think your job is already, I mean, sorted yeah. out. So we'll have yeah, the in fact, you know, on... this is a new valve which is now being yeah. used the Inspirus Resilia. Yeah. And this is a, a, from Edwards only, and yeah. it has a possibility of expanding the so ring. I, I always which can this be Tavi ready. So the Tavi compatible. Is very smart. Yeah. So it's already mm. done. The only thing is that the cost of this valve is almost like the Tavi valve. <laughs> yeah, so they have to match you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Praveen. And we are moving to the next presentation by Professor Ashok Seth who's the chairman of uh, the Fortis Escorts Heart Institute, and he's a very avid interventionist on the structural front. Ashok, would you share your presentation? And then he'll talk about how to preserve the coronaries, and because that is a dreadful complication during tower. So over to you, Ashok. Can we share his presentation? Yeah. Yeah, we can see you, see the presentation. Yeah. Am I? I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, good. Good. I was just going to make one very important comment to the last topic. You know, we always felt that the surgeons should not implant small valves, and that's one of the problems that we say and we face regularly <clears throat> is the gradients and rapid degeneration. Uh, they should always expand the root. At the same time, we should also say that we shouldn't be expanding ourselves balloon expandable valves, which are less than 23 millimeters. I think it's unfair to expand to put in balloon expandable valves of 21.5 and 20 millimeters in our patients. We should follow the same rules. Uh, moving over to optimizing uh, uh, tower techniques through coronary protection, I think it's a very important aspect. Hang on. I'm trying to move my slides and they don't seem to move. You see my slides, but I don't think I'm moving. Okay. 
yeah. yeah. It is not moving. So now, now it's moved. It does. Has it moved for you? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It it has, it has. Okay, good. So, so, we, and I'm going to have to take you through a number of cases to address this issue, which is very important. We must understand that coronary occlusion is rare. It happens in less than 1% of instances, maybe 0.54 to 0.6%, but it's one of the most disastrous complications which can actually happen to a patient. Uh, <clears throat> and especially as we move towards low risk patients, the importance of both coronary patency in the long term, coronary access in the long term, and safety on table becomes of paramount importance. So great attention just does need to be paid to the interactions in the sinuses themselves. So there's an interaction happening with the osteos of the coronary artery between the native leaflets and the osteo of the coronary arteries, chunky, severe calcification on those leaflets, the size of the sinuses, the height of the sinotubular junction, and your own valve, which is the tabor valve, are all very important to start analyzing and protect the coronaries. Now this is 0.6%, this was the multi-center registry. And some important data to understand is that while it happens after valve impl implantation, acute coronary occlusion is commoner with a balloon expandable valve than a self-expandable valve. While delayed coronary occlusions happen more with self-expandable valves, with balloon expandable valves, and we'll come to what early acute or delayed coronary occlusions are. It happens after post balloon dilatation. So that's another reason to be very careful about. It usually happens to the left main in 90% of the instances. The survival after coronary obstruction is low, which means 50% of the patients would practically die in a, in a month's time, especially if you're unsuccessful, gradually most of the patients would succumb to that acute coronary occlusion on the table itself. Of course, if you're successful, you do salvage 75% of these patients. And what is interesting is that prophylactic stenting in those at high risk has actually been found to be safer than just wire-based protection and removal of the stent. Uh, and this is very interesting Italian registry data, which also makes us understand that maybe in those with extreme high risk, to prevent delayed coronary occlusion, it might be a good idea to just stent the ostea of the left main anyway, uh, because that's what's expected to do better than just leaving alone. Uh, and that's related to, by the way, delayed uh, coronary occlusion. So if you look at this graph, you have the early occlusions, which happens on the same day usually, but can happen up to seven days. And then the ones beyond seven days, which can happen much later. And the reasons for that is of course, we well understand that we have to an analyze these CTs extremely well because you have narrow sinuses of Valsalva, you have low coronary heights, which are less than 12 millimeters and certainly get worse at less than 10 millimeters of coronary height. There's excessive calcification. And of course there are procedural factors which were not mentioned in the previous talk, which is a very important analysis of the VTC distance when putting a valve in valve, which is the virtual ring to of the, of the transcatheter valve to the coronary distance, the leaflets of the previous bioprosthetic valve, degenerated bioprosthetic valves are known to close off the coronary arteries and the distance between virtual ring and the coronary artery origin, less than four millimeters is a higher, indicates higher chances of coronary occlusion during valve and valve precision. So once we've understood that, it's actually this which is also worrying. 0.2% incidence of very delayed uh, obstructions, which is related to creating of the neo sinuses, which happen in these instances and stagnation and pooling of blood in the neo sinuses, which have been created between the previous leaflets and the new valve leaflets leading to thrombus formation. And this is what is more commoner, which is commoner with the self-expanding valves. The acute one is commoner with the balloon expandable valves. Uh, yeah, this is just demonstrates the new sinuses which get created with blood pooling of blood, and that is what is one of the reasons. And of course, in a self-expandable valve, the other reason is that the expansion gradually continues to happen over a period of time. Delayed coronary occlusion, of course, is 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 commonly presents with cardiac death, or in many uh, in, on, in one third of the cases, it may present with an acute MI, which you may be able to salvage. So uh, prevention is still the best best issue. Um, just to go over the representation of what we look at, we're looking at the 
sin the height, the width of the sinuses. We're looking at the height of the coronary arteries from the annulus. We look at the height of the sinotubular junction. And we look at the interaction of these leaflets, which may be long and with chunky calcification to come over the coronaries. Of course, the ones with the shallow sinuses and the low coronary osteo heights are worse. You can actually have a low coronary osteo height, but if you have large sinuses to accommodate these, these uh, diseased native valves, then you're okay, as can be seen here. Now in this, what, how do we figure this out? So this is, these are the risk factors which we look at, but importantly, heights of, uh, of uh, coronary arteries less than 12 millimeters, and especially if you're getting to less than 10 millimeters is important in, in, uh, in guiding us towards protection. We of course have non-roomy sinuses, face sinuses guide us towards protection, short sinotubular junctions, which may therefore actually the leaflets may close off the sinuses completely as they open up the native leaflets. That's another important aspect and valve and valve is primarily four times more common to have coronary occlusion than, than others. We must remember about other aspects of what we talked about. So won't go with the protection aspect. Uh, we could talk about the basilica later, but let's just say how not to do. And I'm gonna go now the best practices of how not to do it to then how to do coronary protection. Here's a 36 year old male who's post radiotherapy for Hodgkin's, refused by surgeons, absolutely calcified porcelain aorta. Only choice for this severe aortic, heavily calcified aortic stenosis was, was this effaced sinuses, as you can actually see, totally effaced sinuses, uh, small size sinotubular junction, low coronary heights, everything which was bad for this. <laughs> this is how not to do it. This was in a very early day, in our early days of coronary protection. We have the protection, but what we've got is the guide catheter sitting out. And then we've got, of course, the stent in the right place. But we must also remember that in such instances, the stent actually has to be a longer stent if we're going to use a balloon expandable, a self-expandable valve like the, the Evolute platform. So here it is. I think we've got a reasonable size stent. I think it's a 23 millimeters, but stents up to 30 millimeters need to be needed because you need to come out of that frame and in a manner that you're above the skirt. And therefore you actually have to snorkel it rather than just come out slightly from the left main. Anyway, having, having the guiding catheter out is a bad idea. The guiding catheter is not the catheter to use straight away. You can see that what we tried to do was that the artery stayed open. We should have actually implanted the stent. We tried to bring it out. And of course it would not come out from behind the strain and it sleeved off from, from the balloon. And therefore we just implanted it somewhere behind from the frame into that uh, sinus, but we still had perfusion of the coronaries and the patient went home fine. But that was the wrong way because really what's needed is a support wire, the stent inside the vessel, a guide liner, which sits at the ostia of the left main and a guiding catheter which sits back. The reason also not to use a guiding catheter as can be seen here is that if you just have a guiding catheter into the ostia of the, of the left main, as can be seen here, you will see that during balloon inflations and certainly during navigation, during navigation of your guiding catheter, the navigation of your devices, as you push them across, will push this guiding catheter deep, deep throating into the left main with the guide catheter causing trauma to the left main as you can actually see here. So this is clear demonstration of how deep a guiding catheter can actually be pushed into the left main. And therefore the best practices are what? So firstly, coronary protection, when in doubt, just do it, but then do it properly. When I say just do it, is that even if you've got a half an indication, we must remember that we need to get good at it firstly. The second aspect is that if the patient crashes and you haven't got a coronary protection, patients will die because it's very difficult to get into that left pin when a patient is actually having ventricular tachycardias and fibrillations and in cardiogenic shock. And when you actually got to have other support measures like ECMO to put on the patient at the same time as revascularizing his occluded left main through the, through the frames. Uh, and then do it properly. When I say properly, it's not just a wire down, 
It's just not a half-hearted effort. You need to get a wire down and have a stent in the vessel distally so that it can be pulled back to the ostia. And not just pulled back to the ostia, pulled back long enough to be pulled back prior to the frame so that you actually have a perfusion. But just keeping the ostia and keeping the proximal end of stent in the sinus is a disaster. That's an idus for thrombus formation. That's an idus for delayed closure of that coronaries. Okay, so here's a 90-year-old flayed lady, heart failure, high risk, STS code 12.3. The lady had a, uh, the left main uh, at 8.5 millimeters. She had calcified in small sinotubular junctions. The left vein was calcified. This was a small uh, balloon expandable valve that she was having, 21.5 balloon expandable which was 15% oversized and coronary protection is planned. This is how to do coronary protections. The best time to actually start protecting coronary arteries, in which case you have a pigtail from the radial, you have coronary protection going from the femoral, by the way, because you just need the best supports and the best uh, approach to actually having coronary protection. I therefore would actually put that to the left femoral, as in this case, but the best time to actually put these coronary protection devices is after you have actually crossed the valve and put a pigtail into the left ventricular cavity, because then you know that you're on. After that, you put the devices just prior to balloon dilatation of the valve and stent implant and tower valve implantation. Here it is, guiding cat. This is a, gu a guide extension catheter. The guiding is way back. The, the stent is within the vessel. This could actually have been a longer stent. Uh, but because it was balloon expandable, we thought a 23 millimeter or stent would be adequate. Pre dilatation, you can see what happens. But I think the best thing to see is this. As I put this uh, balloon expandable valve, look at the way the, the guide extension catheter dives deep in into the left vein, right up to the LAD. It deep throats itself. That's why guide catheters are bad, guide extensions are softer and can provide the safety. You can also see that once this is through and once this valve is crossed, look at what happens to the, to the guide extension catheter. It actually twists itself, and yet it's easy to correct. Here it goes. It's easy to correct, and then that's corrected in this left side frame. I just pull it back. It's all there. Everything is intact, and that's the reason to use guide extensions because they provide a great, not just support, but a flexible support, even if trapped behind the stents, to be able to deliver stents, deliver devices, or withdraw stents smoothly. Of course, this is implanted, as you can actually see here. This is a slightly lower implant you will see me do. 70-20 is what I'm doing because, of course, I want to be able to access coronaries. It's slightly deep purposefully. This is another aspect that you have to remember. If you're going to deploy high, you have a greater chances of coronary occlusion. Left main flow is checked, but I will also point out to you that as you have to look at it carefully, give it time. Don't be in a rush to start withdrawing your, your devices or your stent that you put in. You actually watch for what's happening and then gradually bring the stent back. Your wire should be the last thing to come back because you then have to have access because sometimes your guide liner may just be supporting a leaflet. Sometimes your device there might be supporting the leaflet, which may just collapse back the moment your, your guide liner has been brought back. And therefore, here is the guideliner trapped. And you can imagine if the if the if the guiding catheter was trapped, here it's a guideliner guideliner trapped. The the guide catheter is brought close, untrapped. And this is a jailed guideliner. You'll be able to untrap it, still leave the wire, still look at it, still make sure that we got a flowing artery. And you have you have a flowing artery. There's no reason for this to close up, and we are able to take the wire out. So that's the last. So these are the best practices that you can actually achieve. Uh, in this patient, uh, with again, with low coronary heights, you actually have a self-expandable valve. And we actually have uh, uh, coronary heights, uh, which are, and, and we've got a sinus, uh, we've got uh, low sinus heights at 14.7 on the left side, and we've got low ostea height of 7.4. Anybody who says, I can predict when coronary occlusion occurs is absolutely wrong. I've seen, people demonstrating, oh, look, it was 4.55. I just went ahead and did it without protection. Look, I got away with it. Well, try not to get away with it. Try to do protection because that's what it's all about. Patient safety is, is utmost important. Heroism around these 
can lead to loss of lives. And anyway, you want to get better and better at coronary protection. So this is again going through the same steps as I said, protection, confida, wire. Uh, and, and I think in this is, again, start understanding deep implantation of these valves. It's better to have a pacemaker than to have an occluded coronary. That is uh, utmost important. And here, I think I went in, did I go for a deep, uh, so again, the same guideliner, guiding catheter, way behind, uh, stent in to an all-star wire into the LAD vessel, device deployed. Uh, and yes, I did, and have enough place there. Even during post dilatation, make sure that you actually have your, your, uh, your hardware in place to be able to bring the stent back and deliver it. The stent should be at least, if you're using balloon expandable valves, it should be long. This has not been a long stent, so that's wrong. It should at least be a 28 millimeter stent to be able to get you away from the skirts. And then just remove it again slowly as a seen here. I think I'm gonna show you one case to end up and I won't show you all these uh, cases, but the case I want to show you is that you can actually, here's a deep deployment. Here's again to protect the corries, making sure that you have a deep deployment of the valve. This is at six millimeters. Luckily, it didn't result into a conduction defect, but it actually secured this very uh, important coronary artery. And you can see that I'm just okay just because of where I have implanted the valve and spared the coronary fairly well. Otherwise, this was a close miss because it was at 7.4 and the sinuses were small. You can still be taken by surprise. And I think this is an important aspect that I want to finally close my uh, uh, talk with. It is multifactorial. Uh, and in fact, despite all your measurements, what you can't understand is two aspects. Are your leaflets long enough to close your, cor your, your, your coronaries? They may be not heavily calcified, but they may be long enough, firstly, to close your coronaries. And secondly, you might actually cause a closure of the coronaries yourself. This 81-year-old who's actually a low risk, theoretically low risk, I would say that she was a moderate risk for, for surgical aortic valve replacement, and has a 14 plus coronary ostia height, has sinotubular junction height absolutely okay, is going to have a balloon expandable uh, stent, balloon expandable valve, normal iliacs, nothing wrong with any of her features. And of course, she had calcified coronary arteries, so we just went ahead and shot the coronary arteries and you will see that the right coronary artery has some osteal disease uh, which can just be seen through a flush examination, but not too severe because there was no damping of pressures. Uh, and then of course, 23 millimeter my valve navigated to the aortic root, position checked and deployed nicely. Uh, nothing wrong with that, a shoot, you can actually see the both the coronaries flowing well, 1820 deployment, deployed successfully. Now I was, my action up subsequently was that the wire came out, so I was just going to take a gradient. Therefore, I pushed the pigtail across the my valve. It didn't go across the my valve, so I actually took the wire. I pushed it into the pigtail. The wire went into the sinus. I pushed the I I pushed the pigtail. The pigtail went into the sinus two or three times. It was forcefully tried down. Finally, I got my wire through this and got my pigtail into the left ventricular cavity. But soon. This is the gradient looking good at, uh, at, the, at the end of the procedure. No, there was still a gradient. This was what is looking good. We were very happy, zero gradient after that post dilatation. Uh, that was pre, this is post. Subtle ECG changes appearing, as you can see. And soon, this is what happened. Instead of having ventricular tachycardia, hypotension, chest pain, broad QRS complexes, and a real impending collapse of the patient. And of course, the RCF flows disappeared. So what have I done? I probably actually two apps. There was sinocalcified sinotubular junction, may have pushed calcium down. I could have actually just compressed the leaflet against that disease RCA orifice uh, because I did push wire down and I did put my pigtail down, which went into that sinus. So I actually must have caused something with my actions. And there it was totally occluded. This is a collapsing patient and it was very important to get him okay. It was a huge right coronary artery and luckily it was not the left main. So we still had time to function. Various, of course, guiding catheters, a six of guiding catheter trying to locate that close RCA ostia. And you can just see that 
you just have a trickle of uh, blood going through that ostia, finally managed to see that trickle, finally managed to get a wire down it over the next five to seven minutes. And uh, then of course, having parked the wire, it was still very difficult to get any form of flow down it. Predilatation was still possible, so restored the flow straight away with the predilatation of a three and a 3.5. But then getting a stent has to be through a guide liner because I'm still outside the frame. I still can't get through that frame and therefore got a guide liner down into the vessel, as you can see here. And then of course, it was in simpler to get the, uh, the stent, a long stent, which was 18 millimeter coming to before the stent frame, before the prior to the, uh, to the valve frame and then flared it well with a four millimeter balloon outside for future reference. And that of course restored the flow, patient was fine. We actually had a good result and successfully did it and then the patient did fine. It just went home accordingly. So analysis of everything is very important. Every step that you take become very important. Every step uh, can actually lead to coronary occlusion and salvaging them becomes very important. And the more and more we want to do commercial alignments more and more we want to actually make sure that we are able to access coronary arteries, certainly for self-expandable valves, putting the, the flush port at three o'clock. Well, in 80% of the instances, have the hat marker outside on the outer curve and give us commercial alignment to be able to access these coronary arteries for the future. I think I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here to actually have any discussions that may be necessary. I have not touched valve in valve purposefully because that's based on the VTC, but it's probably one of the most important aspects of coronary protection when we do valve and valve. Thank you very much for your attention. And I haven't covered, covered coronary access, which would just be another excellent. topic this in itself. Excellent, Ashok. Can I, we'll take some comments from first uh, our chair over here, Dr. Rajneesh Kapoor, and then Malik Parikh, if you're there, please unmute. Yeah, wonderful deliberation, as always, Dr. Said. Uh, so uh, very good display and a real salvage. Last case was a real salvage, I would say. Uh, just one point I'd like to add, you know, uh, once we are having the red flags as far as the coronary things are concerned, I think you absolutely clarified that when to go for a coronary protection. But while we are dilating the valve uh, with a balloon uh, prior to getting the valve in, uh, native valve, so if we take a good aotogram at that point, that tells us to quite an extent that whether we are at risk of coronary occlusion once we de deploy a valve, uh, especially we have to take one, one thing in mind, uh, you know, the balloon size should be near to the minimum size of the native valve. So if it is 21, we take a 20 balloon, go, go with the dilatation, then take a aotogram. Uh, obviously, a protection is on. We have, we have uh, secured the protection, but uh, that gives us a good clue. It may not be 100% true, but yes, it may be, uh, you know, a good message for a operator that this is a case where things may go uh, out of control. So Rajneesh, you brought in a very important point and I'll make my comments brief, but very, very specific. Firstly, yes, our valve and valve is, is absolutely a disastrous situation, can rupture the valve completely, can actually lead to to, to torrential AI and, and, uh, and a cardiac arrest and can also lead to cerebral strokes, embolism and strokes. But you're absolutely right. I don't think it's, it's you're right that if you get your balloon dilatation to at least somewhat a larger balloon, you would get an idea of whether the coronaries would occlude or not. But you also understand that it's by no means a sure way, unfortunately, it gives you an idea and perhaps gives you an idea much more for sizing the valve uh, and decreasing on the size of the valve, say in a self-expandable valve to avoid coronary occlusion rather than per se whether coronaries would occlude or not. So yes, you can rely on it, but I think you must put everything together and it's a good idea in such cases, but <coughs> please don't make that the decision just on this alone. Yeah. <clears throat> because none of the features suggested that the RCA needed protection and based on either the leaflet, either the sinotubular junction height, the coronary height, as you saw, was 14 and 15 millimeters and the sinuses were adequate. You see, there was no reason to protect it. Actually, if you saw, after even the balloon dilatation, the artery was flowing. So we know how it actually happened because of the way my, my pigtail, when I wanted to cross the valve, to measure the gradients because the wire had come out, 
it actually kept going into the sinuses. And I guess what I did was kept pushing my pigtail into the sinus. So the valve, by the way, the valve, native valve leaflet is sitting right there. And there was an osteal disease. And I actually must have pushed it, that native valve leaflet or the calcification right to the ostea of that closing of the ostea. So you saw it wasn't there post and it was soon there after five minutes. Can the guideliner give ischemia in a dominant circle, a short left main, and how deep would you keep the guideliner? Because, I mean, it can cause ischemia, can't it? Actually, you have to have, if you have, if you have a six guideliner. I, I mean, when we use a guideliner, have... LED, it's very fast, but, you know, Tabby, it may be in for a while, and uh, can it cause ischemia? You just have to keep it, at, so Rupa, you have to keep it at the ostium of the left main. You can't keep Not it back. Me. You can't keep what it. What you were far. saying was the way it's moving in and out. Basically, Correct. I'm just cautioning that in the middle of everything, you just may be causing some ischemia by even that guideline. It's soft. But it That's why you've got to pull it back. That's why when you actually mm -hmm. put it back, you saw my next step was pulling it back to the seat. So deep throating is what's happening, but you're not leaving the guideline in the LED. You're actually leaving at the ostea of the left. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so like wonderful to discussion. To yeah, Dr. Bali. Yeah. You yeah, I think first and foremost is that such a situation should be avoided. That is, we shouldn't be, you know, doing it seven millimeter or eight millimeter as far as possible. That is one part. Second part is if we are suspecting, most of our cases now are done without a TE. So it's a good idea to do such a case under a TE so you can look at the left main and have an idea what is happening there. Third, which is the most important concern is that once you're stenting this and putting a long snorkel about the, I don't know what is the long-term results of such a left main stenting, because the long-term outcome of left main stenting depend on how optimally the stent is deployed. Now here we are deploying a stent. We're not using an IVUS. We are not post-dilating the stent. So there would be some concern about long-term safety of such a situation. So these things should also be taken into consideration once we are trying to, protection is all right, but giving an optimal left main standing in such a situation is extremely so these, important. These adverse anatomies so, against tower when there's a good uh, surgical option. Atul, Atul, can I just put that into yeah. perspective yeah, sure. and I won't yeah. take more than a minute. I think Bali said a very important aspect which everybody should understand. He said that if there's extreme high risk for coronary occlusion, and you actually have a person who can actually have surgery, there is no reason not to consider surgery, which is very important, Bali. On the other hand, there are numerous borderline instances which, which you see where you can actually go ahead with proper protection. Proper protection, I always keep saying, so that you can be able to deploy a stent. And Bali, by the way, big registry on, on snorkeling stenting hasn't come up with bad results. In fact, the results are so good and that's you know, close to 230 patients in snorkel uh, registry, the results at two and three years are looking extremely favorable. So yes, you can do even IVAS in these circumstances. It actually, to the extent that it's been said, that if in doubt, just implant the stent in a snorkel manner, because that actually prevents further closure of the vessel, delayed coronary obstruction, and may be the way to go. And there are numerous editorials written on elective snorkeling in those who you feel have a higher risk of coronary occlusion, even while you're protecting it. Just go ahead and at the end of the procedure, stent it. It avoids your delayed closures. Right. Quick comment. Uh, you, great person, Ashur, but you can use the basilica technique as well nowadays. Yes, yes I did. It, that's Dr. another topic in itself, isn't it? But yes, Correct. you can use the Correct. basilica technique. Dr. Vivek Absolutely. Javli, you know, he's a star surgeon from the South. Uh, your comments on the interventional cardiologist playing with these low coronaries, you know, when they're doing TAVIs. So what is your concern when you do surgeries? No, no, absolutely no comments, actually. Things were quite clear, and I think we have come a long way. Uh, we have now got clear-cut border lines where we would like the cardiologist to take the case off and do the TAVIs. And there is very little gray left between me and my cardiologist. So I think uh, we have moved quite a distance in the last couple of years. I really, I, the, and all the presentations were so clear, I really have no comments. Excellent. Dr. Malik Parik, are you there, logged in? or? So this has been an excellent session and such great presentations from the masters. And I thank all of you and uh, my uh, moderators and experts.
And I would uh, move over to the next uh, session where we are going to start with a very interesting presentation by Dr. Sengo Tuvalu, uh, who is going to talk step by step TMVR uh, process. How do we do the procedure? So uh, while Dr. Sengo Tuvalu, you share your slides, let me invite some uh, star faculty over here. Ganesh Manoharan is requested to please stay on. Panik Chopra is joining us virtually. Dr. Praveen Chandra is present with us and Dr. Ashok Seth is also <coughs> there with us. So uh, we have Dr. Mirwat Al Aslang uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, she is uh, she's very active on social media and they have developed a very good interventional program on structural heart disease in uh, their country. So Mir Mirwat is a close friend. Dr. Nagender uh, Bhupati will request you to please join us online. Dr. Vivut Pratap Singh, please join us over here on the dais. Dr. Amit Kumar, Dr. Sajal Gupta is there on the virtual. Dr. Omar Hassan is joining us virtual. And as pe people keep joining us, uh, I'll keep uh, introducing you. Dr. Ankur Rahuja, you're already there. So we have a lot of people over there. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, can I request you to please join us on the dais over here? And Dr. Vijay, please join us for the discussions. So over to you, Dr. Sengatuvelu, for your presentation. Please share your slides. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I think I, Dr. Atul, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah. Yes, we can see them. Okay. So uh, thank you. I think for the excellent meeting after a long break with a nice hybrid meeting. So uh, and uh, I'm going to talk for the next 15 minutes on uh, a step by step uh, TMVR uh, with one of our cases, so that uh, we'll go from basics. So as you know, I'm going to restrict myself to the valve and valve uh, TMVR, uh, which is now being uh, regularly done in our country. So uh, as you know, uh, uh, the mitral valve uh, uh, for people who are already doing mitral procedures, uh, uh, it, it is not a difficult procedure to do. So let me start with the, the initial steps and planning. I think the planning is uh, very important uh, in a TMVR. Uh, one should be very, uh, very, very clearly look at the previous surgical notes uh, look at uh, what type of valve has been used. I think that is uh, very important to know the valve type and the size. Uh, so we know that uh, depending on that, we decide on the, uh, the transcatheter valve. And uh, the next is uh, the surgical notes will also let us know whether the left atrial appendage was uh, removed or whether there is an AML was resected. Uh, we know that there's a large AML if it is left out, it can cause LBOT obstruction. So that is why we have to see that. And also whether the surgeons have... Uh, Across the intraatrial septum or this patch, so again, we need to do a septal puncture. So with all that, uh, then we, we possibly allow us to do, do an echocardiogram, uh, which will uh, give us uh, to know the severity of the prosthetic valve uh, dysfunction. And uh, also the transesophageal echo uh, can also look at whether there is uh, any left atrial appendage thrombus and also more uh, assess if there is any paravalar leak. We know that uh, if there is a mitral leak, if you have a paravalar leak, and uh, we, that, that should be excluded because we are not going to solve the issue with the transcatheter valve. So then uh, cardiac CT uh, is uh, useful, uh, particularly useful for to look at the uh, the LVO, LVOT and the neo LVOT area, uh, which is uh, very important in a in a T valve and valve TMVR because uh, TMVR itself because once we uh, put in the valve, it can cause further narrowing and cause uh, LVOT obstruction. So uh, that is uh, important to look at the CT. Also, we can look at the previous, uh, the prosthesis, uh, the, the diameter, uh, the inner uh, diameter of uh, the prosthesis. So also the CTs can give us some more information. So the other uh, next step is to, uh, to plan a proper septal puncture. I think uh, we'll go in the case and uh, discuss more about it. And valve selection. So, uh, so basically we look at uh, the CT, the previous valve size is the first important uh, information. And also, we have to look at the uh, the CT will give us some information on the, the, the diameter. Also important, uh, we have a, a valve and valve app for both mitral and aortic uh, developed by Winnie Bapath, uh, which is again useful uh, to decide on valve type and the size. Uh, generally, we want to upsize the valve, particularly in a regurgitant pathology, a regurgitant valve, we, we want to put upsize the valve or the previous valve. Uh, if it's stenotic valve, maybe slightly lower, but still we don't want to upsize the valve. So the procedural steps, I think I'll go through a case and then we can go uh, step by step. So I think we'll go step by step. So I'll let me go with one case and slowly take you uh, step by step on the procedure. 
so this is a patient who had a severe uh, mitral regurgitation for which uh, she had uh, mitral valve replacement in uh, uh, about eight, eight years ago with the 27 millimeter Senjutes Biocar valve. So this information is very important. Uh, we know that it's a 27 Biocar, biocar valve. So she had presented with uh, uh, class uh, three dyspnea on exertion when, uh, and was diagnosed to have severe prosthetic valve uh, stenosis. So echocardiogram again uh, clearly shows that there was a, uh, a huge dilated LA with a significant gradient with the high pulmonary artery pressure with 80 millimeters uh, PA pressure. So this is a significant prosthetic valve stenosis, uh, definitely requiring uh, re-intervention. And uh, with heart team discussion, we decided to go in for uh, uh, with a uh, valve and valve TMVR. So the first step, as I told you, uh, is looking at the surgical nodes. We know it's a 27 by a car. So then is to look, do a CT. Uh, so, so CT, uh, we look, we have to look at, uh, the, we can look at the diameters, the inner diameters, and the aortic mitral angle. Again, that will also help us to know how di difficult it is going to uh, take the valve inside. So the most important measurement is to look at the LVOT and measure the new LVOT. We can put in a uh, uh, virtual valve and then uh, check uh, whether it is going to cause uh, any obstruction. So here uh, we are placing a valve, a valve and looking, measuring the new LVOT. Generally, the new LVOT, if it is more than 250 millimeter square, then it is uh, relatively safe to uh, uh, and unlikely to cause uh, any significant LVOT obstruction. So we can place virtual valve, we can place a, we had a 27, we can place a, a 26 valve, we can put a 29 valve, and then check uh, how much it is going to narrow the LVOT in the CT, in a virtual valve. So some people even use a CT to see uh, the site of septal puncture and see how uh, difficult or how angulated it is to cross into the LV. Sometimes it may be challenging. The septal puncture is, again, the location is very important to have a, a good uh, delivery of the transcatheter valve. So again, uh, you should be aware of the fluoroscopic uh, uh, markers, uh, how each valve looks like in fluoroscopy. And uh, the biocore valve, as you can see, is uh, only a thin line. You have to, again, get a view uh, where you have a coplanar view uh, to, to, so that we can align uh, the, all the markers in a straight line uh, to, to have the working view. So this is the valve and valve app. So once you uh, choose the valve type and the valve size in the mitral valve and valve app, then it will give us what are the possibilities that here your suggestion is uh, sapien 3 26 valve so we uh, we know that uh, uh, so here we decided for a uh, uh, 26 valve so so the plan is to do general anesthesia and uh, uh, and a, a turtle puncture with the transesophageal echo guidance and the right femoral vein uh, that is for the main uh, procedure for to take the uh, the valve transcatheter valve through the right femoral vein, and uh, the option if you generally uh, rapid pacing is optional when you want to uh, have more stability during valve deployment. Uh, some of them use uh, rapid pacing. We do use uh, sometimes, so we can put a pacemaker. Uh, we generally won't put an artery line, but some of them also put an artery line to monitor the aortic pressure. For septal puncture, generally we don't put a pigtail since we have the TE guidance for puncture. So uh, the, I think uh, 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 septal puncture, most of you may be aware, I think the important point is to get into a good uh, location, as I told you, more, more posterior and inferior. And uh, this bicable view in TE really helps us, the SVC, IVC. So we go down and call, get a, try to get a puncture site more inferiorly. Also, if you do explain, we can get the site uh, iota here, so we, as posterior, so posterior and inferior would be a good site to puncture. Uh, so once we do, the first step is to get a uh, optimal septal puncture. I think uh, the, that is, I think to even to take time, take a good puncture uh, and the location is uh, very important. Once we get a good septal puncture, uh, then we can, uh, the, then we can uh, take a agile sheath. So agile sheath is, uh, uh, is very useful. Uh, it's being used by uh, our EP colleagues, which helps to, uh, we have a, we can, we can uh, rotate the tip of the catheter so that to manipulation inside the LA is uh, much more easier with this catheter. And then we put in a regular uh, three five or three two wire, and we we cross. We can either use a wire to cross into the LV, or some people even put a pigtail which just crosses into the mitral valve. Uh, if, or you can we we can also use wire and a catheter here. I think we have used a, a Jenkins right catheter uh, through which we have crossed into the mitral valve. 
and uh, once you cross uh, the mitral valve uh, then you can put in a pigtail exchange it for a pigtail and then you will see the stiff uh, lv pre shaped wires now we have the safari wires or so safari uh, extra small or uh, small wires can help and uh, or you can use a pre you can have a wire which can shape it uh, manually so once the wire is in place uh, so we have put in also a tpi in this case uh, a temporary pacemaker so here uh, one i would like to emphasize the the position of the wire if you look at the wire the wire uh, is uh, is just opposite to how it looks like in tavi so this curve or the loop is facing down in this uh, uh, for mitral valve whereas in tavi we want the curve to be uh, uh, to face upwards so this is uh, this is uh, uh, this is to face it uh, down and then once you have the good uh, position of the wire uh, then we can uh, uh, take in uh, uh, now we have to do a septal dilatation and this is an again very important step uh, before we take in the sheath and the valve so here uh, we use uh, a 12 mm balloon and uh, some of them uh, sometimes in a, in a large uh, valve or in a thick septum you can even use a 14 mm balloon so here we have used a 12 mm balloon and uh, it's important to inflate the balloon nicely in the, in the septum and also floss it we keep it for at least for about 16 seconds and then floss it nicely up and down to make sure you have a good dilatation and uh, generally we don't uh, pre dilate the valve but here we did a little bit of pre dilatation in this case but uh, uh, generally it's not needed uh, particularly in a regurgitant uh, uh, pathology it is not needed at all uh, some since here is synodic pathology we did do a small dilatation the same balloon so once you do a good septal uh, dilatation uh, we can remove the agilis sheath put in the the e sheet here we are planning a sapien 3 valve so we are putting a e sheet uh, either a e sheet or whatever sheet like python sheet this other option we may plan a my valve so we once we put the she e sheet in then we take the valve here we take a 26 mm sapien 3 so the valve so this is a, a small uh, a recording which i want to show it which you have done it one for one of the meeting so this is uh, so the sapien 3 valve is the Uh, uh now uh, uh, you can see that the e sheath is already there so we are pulling back the e sheath and we have to have, have make a sufficient space you can see the e sheath is being pulled down for sufficient space for the valve for the balloon to be brought inside the valve so so that is being done here you can see the valve the balloon is put into the uh, into the into the uh, the valve into the valve and once the balloon is in position Uh, then we can advance the valve with the pusher catheter will give more support to the uh, so we have to make sure the wire is in good position so you always look at the wire also uh, flu and you can see the wire is now in good position and uh, then the, the balloon is now being pulled back to get a good position so uh, if uh, you have to be very important to make sure that uh, the septal dilatation is done adequately so so that uh, there's no difficulty in positioning the valve and uh, sometimes uh, it may be difficult to cross over if you have not done a good uh, septal dilatation again uh, the, the wires we had done with if you have sometimes uh, the my, my valve advantage in case the valves don't cross we can pull it back and uh, again uh, try to change the wire or do another septal dilatation uh, to to cross the uh, across the septum so now that the valve is uh, uh, now ready now we are trying to I take the valve in the entire assembly in so so let me go there so the valve is now being advanced uh, through the uh, septum and uh, the valve is being advanced and uh, you have to see the fluoroscopically the the markers which is quite faint in this case of biocore valve so uh, you can see it uh, faintly here this is the valve which is now in a in a it is in a straight line so this is the working view so now we have positioned the valve across the uh, the uh, so across the the native mitral valve the, the previous process where you can see that it's positioned now so it's important again positioning we want to achieve about 20% atrial and about 80% ventricular and uh, for that we now we have removed the pusher catheter out after that now we are ready to deploy so we have placed the marker uh this is again another important step i want to tell you is the valve orientation needs to be checked properly as you know the, the uh, it is opposite to that of tavi because here we are going to cross the we are crossing the valve anti gradely and hence uh, the skirt will be uh, down 
so that is an important thing to look at before uh, low, uh, before you low, uh, before you take the valve inside the next important thing is uh, the the e sheet when you load we can normally for tavi we put paste the e logo up we can here we uh, we just invert when you take the valve the e logo is kept down this is because to to give a torque to the valve in the opposite direction uh, it helps so that uh, uh, we can turn the valve manipulate the valve so that may be required the torque the flex uh, is uh, useful to take the valve in some difficult cases so as you can see now the where the mark central mark is positioned just below the 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 uh, the uh, pre fluoroscopic uh, valve the previous biocore valve uh, and less so you can see that now the uh, the marker is just below that so we can once we are uh, uh, valve is uh, quite stable so one can stop the ventilation for a few seconds to make it more stable we can do rapid pacing uh, so that will stabilize the valve some of some sometimes we don't do always uh, rapid pacing some of the cases when the valve for, for when the position is not very stable uh, rapid pacing also will help so uh, again uh, so again it's important to deploy the valve uh, very very slowly uh, because the valve can move or dive down and uh, it's important to see how where which direction the valve is moving and then appropriately uh, uh, move make counter movements to make sure the valve doesn't embolize that is why it is important to uh, uh, to very slowly deploy the valve so we are going to start uh, deploying the valve uh, very slowly uh, so if you can see that the valve is now started to deploy and keep looking at the markers about how the valve moves during that uh, inflation. So we have, we have done a rapid pacing here in this case. So then we are just slowly deploying. Well, it's pretty looking quite stable. If you know the valve foreshortens uh, from above, So you can see you can see the foreshortening very well. So the valve looks uh, very nicely in position. As I told you, twenty percent uh, in the atrial side and about eighty percent in the ventricular side. So we stop the rapid pacing. So a good position. So then you can uh, deflate the balloon, stop the pacing, remove the valve, remove the balloon, and look at the uh, TE. So some of them, if you have, a, you have to have a good flare like that in case uh, we can always always make, make it. Uh, you can here you can see there is a, from, from already there is a flaring the LV side. So we, we are, in this case we got a good result. You can see the post uh, gradient was uh, just three millimeters mercury. You can, you can see in the three D. You can see the catheters inside. We have a good uh, opening of the mitral valve. So then next is to check for any LVOT gradient. And here uh, you could see that there is no gradient at the LVOT. And uh, so uh, so uh, we got a good result. And generally, we uh, these patients, uh, we don't uh, reverse the heparin. And uh, we generally give them anticoagulation at least for a period of three months. And uh, uh, so, uh, so to summarize, uh, so TMVR is... Uh, uh, quite uh, uh, and another final thing is uh, looking at the ASD assessment of ASD. Generally, if the ASD is large, unless there is RV dysfunction or very high reversal of the shunt of PI uh, or RV uh, dysfunction or failure, we don't close the ASD again. That also can assessment can be done. And uh, finally, to summarize, uh, careful planning is uh, very important to uh, study the valve previous valve yeah. and, uh, anatomy in detail. To plan with the valve and valve app, it is uh, nice to decide on the valve size. And uh, and a good uh, perceptual puncture, slow valve positioning, and slow deployment are uh, very crucial for a successful TMVR. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sengotwil. This was a wonderfully done case you showed. And you know we all now have started seeing so many TMVR cases being done in valve and valve as a valve and valve procedure. And luckily, the good thing is that most of the surgeries which have been done in India are not valve sparing surgeries. So the problem of LVOT obstruction is typically not so much bothering us as of now. 
So we also have you know a good fantastic panel here. Dr. Meerwat is from Saudi Arabia, yeah. and you know she is a very experienced structural heart interventionist. So Dr. Meerwat, what is your comment on this uh, uh, TMVR? What do you look at it? Well, congratulations to the um, operators. This was a very, very well um, demonstrative case of, of the steps. And I think the uh, presenter clearly mentioned the most important key points. One is planning. Um, it's important to have an imager that is able to give you the appropriate size, anticipate and predict LVOT obstruction, and um, to help us select the appropriate size uh, valve that needs to go in. Um, and the second thing is, um, you know, the, the, the Edwards valve, the Edwards sapien valve was designed primarily for the aortic valve. Um, and so we need to know the limitations of the valve when we're trying to cross a septum and into, um, you know, a dilated left atrium and into a ventricle. And again, the operators did a spectacular job of showing the importance of dilating the septum, um, positioning the wire appropriately and having it face down uh, checking the the valve, which uh, I think most of our, you know, techs and nurses that are preparing are used to the tabby, and so you want to make sure that you've flipped it. Um, and sometimes the nose cone is difficult to cross, um, and so you may need to do a little bit of tugging on the wire and a little bit of wire manipulation uh, to help deliver the um, the valve, the transcatheter valve, uh, uh, even though you've dilated the septum. And so um, it may take a little bit of manipulation and the smaller the LV, the more difficult it is actually. Um, but I think uh, then depending on our imagers and not taking shortcuts where we have a TEE um, that you know, helps you look for um, gradients and so on uh, as you do it. And of course, slow deployment. So again, congratulations to the operators. This was a, a very, very well done educational case. Thank you, Dr. Mirwa, for the fantastic uh, you know, overview and comments. <clears throat> But certainly, you know, in India, we have been now using both the Edwards and the MyVal, and both are really working out quite well in these cases. So, Dr. Uh, Ganesh, uh, what do you say about in, any new technique you, you can think of or you are doing for this valve positioning or, you know, anything about the TMVR? Uh, thank you. Insights? Thank you, Chandra. Uh, thank you to a great case. Uh, as always, very methodological, step by step, and a lot of really important teaching points there. A um, couple of comments from what has already been said by Merwat as well. Um, it's reassuring that in India, you have a lot of uh, uh, patients where the anterior leaflet is not there. I think it's important to remember that even though you have CT to look at the LVOT size, that will not necessarily predict the outcome if you have uh, the anterior leaflet still there, because if it's a very long uh, scallopy anterior leaflet, no matter what size you have, uh, you still could get LVT obstruction. And I think the most important area to look for is the angulation between the aortic annulus and the mitral valve uh, anatomy. So if you, the steeper the angulation, the more likely you're going to, or the more acute the angulation, the more likely you're going to have LVT obstruction. Uh, and what I think people are looking at is trying to lacerate a bit like the basilica. Uh, for the aortic uh, anatomy, we are now trying to look at how we can lacerate the anterior leaflet percutaneously. Uh, another area that I Mer uh, pointed out to in small left ventricles, very hypertrophic left ventricle, uh, trying to get the valve frame to align to the annual, uh, mitral anatomy may be challenging. So you may then need to do a uh, VA loop uh, between the venous system, the arterial system, so they can tug and pull the wire to reorientate the valve. Um, but those are pretty rare, but, but you if you have to, it's better to do that than to trying to push and pull the wire when it's sitting in the left ventricle. Then you may have a left ventricle perforation that can be much harder to manage. But great job. Thank you. Uh, the, does anybody have experience with the uh, mitral annular calcification uh, valve implantation? That's, that's a very challenging situation. And uh, the surgeons are not very happy touching them, but often we have patients who are having very significant symptoms and heart failure. So Dr. Sengatuvalu, what's your opinion and Ganesh and Mirwat? Uh, we haven't done any of those questions. We did evaluate a few cases, but again, uh, because we, we, we know that the, the, the results uh, are, are not that, that great. I know that you know, the risk of LBOT obstruction uh, is again a ch challenging issue. So we have not had experience, Dr. Ganesh and Dr. Mirwat can add. 
It's interesting you brought that up because we just published last week our nine series um, of uh, Bath and Mac. Um, it's a it's a surgical approach, uh, and I work with a really good friend of mine called Mr. Jagannath Rubin, a talented young surgeon. And what we have started doing now in patients with significant MAC is to uh, go down the surgical approach, open the left atrium surgically, but deploy a adverse valve under direct vision, uh, very closely looking at the calcification to make sure you're not pushing the calcification too much. Uh, sizing is done based on CT. Uh, and then because of the, I mean, the biggest challenge of MAC uh, and transcatheter valve is power valve leak. And what Ruben has designed and developed is a nice way of using the the native uh, lapidal tissue to buttress it on the frame of the um, uh, safe and valve. And, uh, and we've got really, really, really surprisingly really good result. And again, it goes back to picking your patients well, uh, looking at the CT well, and then consider preoperatively, do you need to lacerate the anterior leaflet uh, intraoperatively or not? But it can be done. I think doing transcatheter like it in is transeptally or apically to do valve and MAC uh, can be done, but the risks are that you will most times, most times be left with quite significant power valve leak. Then you spend the next uh, five to six hours putting various closure devices in, which now looking at how Ruben and I do it and colleagues of I do it, I think it doesn't make any sense doing that anymore. I think uh, the current technologies don't, can't deal with MAC very well. And I think the surgical approach or a hybrid approach is the way to do. So we have a question from the floor, uh, the cardiac surgeon, Dr. Rajneesh Malhotra. I just want to give you a surgical perspective, I mean, for the cardiologist. So most of the time, I mean, it is the posterior mitral leaflet, which is, I mean, calcified. The anterior mitral leaflet, fortunately, for the valve and valve is not, um, not severely calcified. And most of the time on surgery, I mean, while we are doing the surgery, we, I mean, take away the anterior mitral leaflet and try to leave the posterior mitral leaflet. So that is, I think I would say the future uh, surgical, I mean, uh, valve in valve, it's a, it's a saving grace or it's rather a boon when you can very easily put a valve with the anterior leaflet is already not there. So as surgeons, we always take out the anterior leaflet and then we leave the posterior leaflet and implant the valve. That's excellent. Yeah. So we have more comments uh, from the floor. Uh, mm -hmm. Please step up and introduce yourself, sir. Wonderful presentation, sir. I am Dr. Kalmut from uh, Ami Hospital Arandar. I'm a cardiac surgeon again. So in continuation with uh, sir's question, any experience of valve and valve for a post mitral valve repair cases wherein the AML is preserved? and how it is dealt. So this question uh, goes to Dr. Sangutvalu. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sangutvalu okay. or Dr. Ganesh or anyone. Yeah, other. Ganesh or Dr. Sangutvalu. So AML preserved, repaired mitral valve. Do we have a scope for a valve and valve? Ganesh, for take it. Uh, the risk of uh, valve and valve when there's a ring there, uh, you really need to know whether it's a full ring or a partial ring. And if it's a partial ring, the valve and valve usually doesn't work because uh, the annulus is usually quite large and none of the valve we have today will be stable enough to be in position and not cause problems. Uh, and certainly if the, uh, if the AML is still there, it's uh, technically uh, highly challenging and you will not get a stable outcome. And a comment again from the floor, Dr. Ramji Marotra. Yeah, very nice presentation. And I, I agree with Ganesh. I think the MAC will be something where we as a team will look forward to like a suture-less valve where you suture uh, the LA tissue around the cuff so that there is no risk of palatable and you place the valve in the frame in a way that accepts the flow with less of the gradient. So this is something which future may look forward to. Yeah, in fact, you know, there is a technique which is being done, which is a hybrid technique where the same Edwards valve is implanted through a left atrial approach yeah, where they, you know, they yeah. stitch a tissue, you know, this is a felt. And then on that felt, you, one can, you know, just implant this valve. But, you know, as you asked about the question about this uh, repair, 
basically you know if there is a ring which is a full ring then it can be done but if it is a partial ring and the same is with mac if the ring is full so that we assess by ct so we keep doing all those assessments and look at the size the other biggest problem is that we have assessed many cases now the ring is you know generally many times the ring is so big that the biggest edwards valve will not fit in but now there is a my valve which is 32 size which is coming up that we can use most likely but there will be a little high chance of a uh, you know this lvot gradient and one last comment from the floor introduce Hello. yourself sir uh, i'm dr bilal i'm a resident uh, dnb resident surgeon from batra hospital i just want to ask that uh, it is just uh, uh, not related to the this well uh, a patient with a young patient 36 years old uh, with abstains uh, operated and a mechanical valve is there and now he is again having this tr and the flow is through half to the valve and more than half paravalvular flow from the uh, tricuspid i just want to ask that uh, can we uh, close that uh, paravalvular leak the flow from the ra to the um, this uh, right ventricle can you close it with the devices the yes. atrial septal yes. devices or yes. other devices Yes. So, as I understand, you are talking that there is a paravalvular leak for the mitral valve, is it? No, tricuspid valve. Yeah, I mean, basically, you can even do that. But, you know, typically, we have been closing my paravalvular leaks <clears throat> for aortic valves, for mitral valves. And so I have not done a tricuspid valve paravalvular leak closure yet. But certainly, it is possible to be done. It's all T-guided. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll move to the next presentation. Can we have uh, Dr. Ranjan Shetty's uh, case shown over here? It's recorded with us and Dr. Ranjan Shetty has joined us and then Dr. Badi's presentation. Yeah. So Ranjan, are you there with us? Yes, I'm, I'm there, I'm here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Dr. Ranjan Shetty is one of the pioneers of uh, LA appendage closures, and uh, he has evolved this technique of uh, closure of the LA appendage. So he'll take us through the steps of the LA appendage closure. Vivid, are we ready with his presentation? Yeah. Can we share it on the screen? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mathur, for inviting me to this uh, session. And it's my pleasure and uh, to talk about left atrial appendage closure tips and tricks. So uh, this is, I'll start with a case. It's a 78 year old gentleman who had presented with diabetic. He had uh, CAD, post PTCA, had uh, CKD, AF, and had recurrent syncope. He also had a history of uh, oral anticoagulant, uh, you know, bleed, intracranial bleed with oral uh, uh, anticoagulant. So this case is probably one of the uh, uh, patients who has no other option but to undergo left atrial appendage closure. And it is, this is some of the case which most of us see almost uh, uh, daily. So AF, as we are aware, is a very common problem. It's a population problem. And with the aging population, more and more patients will have atrial fibrillation. It's responsible for 15 to 30% of the stroke. And in them, the stroke is more disabling because the AF stroke actually occurs at left atrial appendage. The clot is actually from the appendage. So it's more disabling for these patients. We do have option, which is oral anticoagulation, which could be newer drug, which could be orfarin. But unfortunately, not many patients receive it. People who receive it also receive it in subtherapeutic dose. If you look at this chart, as the CHAD-VAS score increases, now we, do, we use CHAD-VAS score instead of CHAS-2, but the other hand, the has blood score also increases because some of the parameters are same and most people, the very patient who is likely to have stroke, is also the very patient who is likely to bleed and hence most people don't receive a therapeutic uh, a proper anticoagulation. So there is definitely need for uh, alternative treatment because there is a significant risk of bleed with these drugs. There is also a high rate of discontinuation and more than one third to half the patient actually do not uh, uh, receive anticoagulation or even when they receive, they are not on therapeutic range and people do stop this medicine. So uh, these are the very few challenges and there is, that's why there is an alternative. 
Is there a rationale for alternative therapy, which is left atrial appendage closure? More than 90% of the clot in so-called non-valvular AF actually occurs in left atrial appendage. Now, non-valvular stroke means stroke, which is not due to mitral stenosis or prosthetic valve. So that means if you have any other valve like MR, AR, AS and stroke or HCM and stroke, they will also be considered non-valvular AF. Reason being in most of these non-valvular AF, the clot actually is in appendage. So it's, if there is a way you can safely exclude it, then uh, these patients do well. They do not need anticoagulation. Indication obviously varies uh, across the globe. We do realize that most people receive it when they have bled on anticoagulation or our anticoagulation is contraindicated. But the clinical trial of protect and prevail is actually here. It's where, where it is used as alternative to anticoagulation. Now let's come to the procedure. Uh, which is uh, very, uh, which is the uh, the uh, uh, the gist of today's talk. First, we should know LA anatomy. We know that LA has been named with different different anatomy. It can be called as broccoli, cactus, windstock. But in true sense, each LA is independent, and it is it's very different from each other. It's as unique as your uh, finger, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, as unique as your fingerprint. Hence we have to individualize the therapy but fortunately in today's era whatever device you have in your shelf 98.5 percent of the la can be closed that means you don't need to have more than one device you also don't need to have uh, multiple imaging modalities so whatever whatever comes to us most of the time 98.5 percent we are actually able to cl close these uh, appendages now in LA, there is ostium and there is neck and there is body. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a structure which has two axes. One is the axis of neck and there is axis of body. So depending on different device, a different measurement is taken. So it could be, you know, uh, it could be same LA, but if you are using a watchman device or if you are using a ACP, amulet, lambre device, then your measurement could vary. That is what we should understand. So the above example, we are trying to show the, uh, 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 the measurements actually for watchman device where both depth and the neck measurement is important. So you see here, this is the circumflex and the line is drawn perpendicular to circumflex and that is the measurement. So you take this measurement at 0, 45, 90, 130. So T is enough. You don't need a pre-CT. A transesophageal echo is enough. And you could take measurements in multiple of these views and get a number. This number, then you upsize the device by three to four millimeter, depending on the type of device, and choose the type of device. So that is how LA uh, sizing is uh, chosen. And we need to know the device. So it's not uniform. Based on the device, we get a different number and different uh, structure. Now, this is how typically LA looks. T is extremely important for to do LA appendage uh, uh, closure. So it's a two-person process. You need to have your echocardiographer or a cardiac sonologist who could actually image it for you in be uh, beautifully and identify. So now today's case, I'm going to show you an AMOLED device. AMOLED is a device which is approved in India. It's available. Now we have four devices available, which includes ACP, AMOLED, LAMBRE, and Watchman. So you could choose on variety of these devices. AMOLED device itself is more at a, it's, it's on the neck. So it holds itself on the north neck. It has two parts. It has a lobule and it has a disc. Lobule is the one which will be held in the neck and the disc is the one which covers it. Now, this is how it looks. Almost all currently available LA device actually have hooks, and that is the one which holds it. And these so-called, this double protection device actually do very well because they have extra protection. Now there is lobule which occludes the neck of appendage, and also there is a disc which closes the mouth. So currently three of these devices have almost similar structure and they work uh, well. Now the device wise, these are made by just like other uh, yeah, AST devices from the same company. Circumflex is a very important landmark in um, 
uh, in the TE also, we want the device to be within circumflex. The device actually closes the left atrial appendage like a lid, and by around four to six weeks, you see the endothelization which occurs on the device and it works well. Comes in different sizes and shapes. So, is amulet itself come from 16 to 34 in size. So, this is one of the even the biggest devices are available, and there is a separation between the lobule and the disc. So now going back of the procedure itself, what we need to do is once once we deploy the device and once it finally appears, it should ideally look like this. A disc, the device should be slightly compressed. We call it tire shape. There should be a good separation from device and the disc, and the disc should be concave in shape and beautifully opposing the mouth of the. Uh, the left atrial appendage. If you see it something like this, it's an undersized device. If you see it something like this, it's oversized or strawberry. Although strawberry looks more stable, it's not the most stable position because the hooks are not fully released. The good position is actually what you see on the left. So coming back to this case, what we do, we do a septal puncture. Septal puncture is extremely important. It is done in bike view under TE guidance in AP view. Half of the heparin is already given. The puncture site has to be posterior inferior. So in bike view, we want it to be somewhere here, very downwards. And in aortic view, we want it to be away from aorta. Tenting can be seen, and with this, you enter appendage. You can see it in the lower picture, the way we enter, we puncture, and we enter appendage. And as soon as you enter, make sure you measure LA pressure, and make sure it is more than 10 millimeter. If it is less than that, hydrate, and make sure it is better. Once you do that, the sheath is now positioned in the upper pulmonary vein, and you exchange it to the proper sheath of uh, amulet. Amulet comes usually as double curve and it is a 14 front sheath. So you exchange it in the appendage. Once you exchange it to the appendage, you take the device, which is now pre-decided. We already discussed how to measure. It's at the level of circumflex. If the size you get is 20, 22, you upsize it by three. So you take a 25 device. So when you are in the in the upper pulmonary vein now, you make a small golo of this device and the whole device is pulled down. So if you see here in this fluoro down, the actual initial position, it is actually in the upper pulmonary vein. The whole system is pulled down and as you pull down, it falls into the LA and as you push up now, if you see here, you're actually entering the appendage and you can confirm this by uh, your TE, the TE shows. And at this point, once you're sure you're already in appendage, you have a fair size where you want to do, you need to look at this picture. It, you start, start unsheathing the sheath now. You form a triangle and you visualize that triangle in the T above. And as you do, once you're happy with the position, continue unsheathing more. The device opens up, the lobule opens up, the hooks are expanded and it sticks to the device. That is how you position. So maintain a good anti-clockwise position as you're unsheathing the device. And you can see the unsheathing further and you can see the echo on top showing us. So as you all know, this is done in RAO cranial view. You know that the, now the device is open, it is compressed and the disc is released and you're trying to show that the position of the device and the disc is good. So if you see this down floor, you realize that the device is fully open, it's positioned well, and the disc is covering this, and we are trying to do a wiggle. This is not a very forceful wiggle, this is a little milder wiggle, and it's a good wiggle. As you see this wiggle, you realize that device is in position, the disc is concave shape, and in TE, you realize that the, it is most of the devices within circumflex artery and you don't see any peri device flow. Today's era, we do not like to have peri, uh, you know, peri device flow or peri device leak and we want the device to completely occlude and beautifully occlude the left atrial appendage. And this is how it looks in, uh, uh, you know, the you can see the upper two echo images, how the disc has opened, it's catching the appendage very well. And, the uh, you know, the, uh, the lobule is beautifully positioned and the disc is now 
occluding it completely with time when it endothelizes LAA completely gets excluded. You can also see upper pulmonary vein flow on top image. It looks good and it also looks good in floral. This is how it looks. Once you are comfortable, you release. In this case, it's already released and then pull the sheath back. And most of the time we do only a venous puncture. So we just do a figure of eight. Good heparinization is done around five to 7,000 for each of the patients. And with figure of eight, you don't have bleeding risk. Like any other procedure, there are complications which includes air embolism if you're not careful. Device embolization itself is uncommon. It's only one in 200 because the device holds itself well. So that's fortunately uncommon. As far as the procedure uh, also is uncommon because uh, you know, it's only the venous puncture, the hematoma and other things are uncommon. So uh, with this, I stop my presentation. I thank once again uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me and uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ranjan. So yeah. we'll, we'll have some uh, good discussions. And we've got Dr. Sai yeah. Satish, the dynamic... Uh, Structural interventional cardiologist from Chennai, you know, he's busy doing his mitra clips in the last whole week. And uh, your opinions on uh, LA appendage Sai? Uh, I, I, I'm always mesmerized by Ranjan's talks, and uh, <laughs> it's so simple and lucid. But I, but I definitely think they have a role. The only difficulty I have had uh, with trying to convince patients is to take a stable 80 year old. And subject her to risk of a procedure and she just doesn't compute, you know. She says, I'm all right, Beta, why do you want to do a procedure on me? But it's definitely got uh, a very important role, especially in stroke prevention. And I think that we all should look at it more seriously. Definitely true. Ganesh, uh, do you have any experience uh, on LA appendage closures? Uh, limited, but I think, you know, Ranjan did a wonderful presentation and very clear steps. Congratulations. I guess like any of these new uh, or newish technologies and techniques, we lack long-term data, right? We don't know what this happens, uh, how this device behaves three, four, five years, and also in the different age groups. And we know, you know there are 30-year-olds who can't take Warfarin uh, or Dovac, and there are 80-year-olds who can't take Warfarin or Dovac. And we, you know, I, I don't think um, data from one age group is transmissible to all age groups. And I think that's why we, we as clinicians will need to push all these companies, great for the technology, but let me see the data and get them to do the trials in the different age groups and the different risk factors. You're very right, Anna, because this uh, procedure has been sitting on the fringe for a long time. And then especially now with the advent of NOACs, where the bleeding risk has gone significantly down, uh, there is a lot of review on uh, the true indications. And that is what, uh, Ranjan, what is your comment on that? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. You can hear me, sir. Yeah. I yeah, think it yeah. has a good role, sir. There are patients who have been studied in trial who could take both the both anticoagulation as well as device. But we do have lots of patients where anticoagulations are not given optimally. For example, if you take a renal failure patients who are on dialysis, they probably cannot tolerate any of the docs and uh, the one third of them actually have stroke. We also have patients with cirrhosis, um, GI bleed. So all of us do have some patients who need this uh, procedure. People who tolerate anticoagulation, it, uh, you know, where we could discuss with them, but there are also neurological patients who tend to fall and, uh, uh, you know, who have, uh, you know, because of fall who are bleeding risk. There are lots of patients. If you see the picture from a neurosurgeon or a neurologist, they do have a lot of patients with intracranial hemorrhage and stroke. So uh, I'm very sure all of us have some patients who need it, sir. Yeah. Dr. Rupa, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, using this device for a patient, I want you uh, the opinion of the house. A patient comes with a GI bleed today, the NOAC is stopped, and it takes about seven, eight days to stop bleeding. You can't do anything at that time. What is the best time to or, uh, intracranial bleed? When I mean, when they come in early, it's a good time to do the closure. Otherwise, you need to stabilize them again, be sure there are no clots. You can't go and handle that appendage which has been on no anticoagulation for a week, 10 days because of the other event, whether it's an intracranial bleed or it's a GI bleed. So how do you really time a real-life patient of when to do the procedure? That's a tricky question. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. 
so we have been you know doing many such patients now where patients came with a severe bleed and uh, they were on anticoagulation therapy and of course you know many you have to stop anticoagulation in any case in these patients when they have such severe bleed and uh, let me tell you two examples uh, one lady was having critical as and was having af and she bled a lot and then she was brought here in heart failure and severe anemia so we had to stop everything the first step we had to do then is to control her heart failure do a tavr procedure first and once the tavr was done then we did the la appendix closure but you know that there will be a period interim period where she will be you know not fully protected but then the thing is that you don't have a choice at that time similarly a big you know uh, rectal hematomas and you know then these patients you have to stop anticoagulation once the patient is stabilized hemoglobin is maintained then you can do the procedure so in same hospitalization these procedures underwent you know these uh, implantations and many of these patients uh, were just put on aspirin also this is you know one of the things which uh, we have to understand so, you know, i mean i work in a multi specialty hospital so i see the patients with shower of emboli and stroke in the neuro unit as much as pure intervention hospital would be and truly we do i mean it's so I mean, you do a t and if they have lots sitting out there you can't do it after all the patient has sitting on a lot of thrombus and it's very hard I and mean, when you see the neurologist watch you realize that a lot of what we do we are not seeing it yeah. when it's out of our units so risk of stroke assessment has a very important role and definitely if you find clots sitting in the la appendage you may have to act more urgently and you know, that's how one can titrate and uh, i'm yes. sure there's no clear cut answer there's any right. comment coming no so yeah. uh, it's a question yeah. for dr shetty yeah dr puneet so verma uh, just for yeah. dr puneet verma is making a comment Yeah, uh, thank you, Doctor Atul, for the kind invitation and the wonderful talk, Doctor Ranjan. I wanted to ask Doctor Ranjan as to what makes him decide between the choice of devices in LA closure. We yeah. have the amulet, we have the Watchman device. So, what are the anatomical or maybe some other factors which influence the choice of device? Yes. i think it's a very good question dr punit one of the device is suitable if there is a distal clot and that will be lambre because lambre has a uh, you know uh, as a uh, when, when you partially open it you can open it in la and go inside so risk of embolization with lambre is very very minimal if you have any you know previous history of uh, proven stroke and if the depth is not enough then watchman may not be very ideal watchman will be ideal if the depth is enough and also it's been the decision also is been partially data driven and cost driven we know that the data is highest with watchman so we give this option to people that if you if you can afford it that becomes a good device because there is lot of data other device the data is uh, limited but they are preferred if there is a, if la is uh, shallow or if there is a history of clot or you know if you end up being some uh, some speckle uh, you know some speckle uh, or lots of spontaneous echo contrast then the uh, so called neck based device become better yeah i'll say that you know certainly you know as uh, dr shetty said that these are the considerations in selecting the device but it is better to start doing your cases with one device to start with and gain more experience and let me tell you 90% times you will be able to finish up with just one single device and we have been using now about 30 35 uh, these of watchmans and there was no case where the procedure had to not it had to be abandoned or not to be done by the watchman so watchman is a very good device that way it is and of course you know amplarzer is also a good device but uh, it is uh, generally okay to do that it takes very little time once you have done many procedures and certainly the length is little bit of a issue especially if there is a very small length of the device uh, you know with long, small length of the la appendage otherwise 90% as i said it is absolutely okay to go with that and earlier the data was with you know um, you know this watchman only but now amplifier also has a new data which has come one last comment from the floor while we request dr bali to come and set up his next presentation I, so there dr. you dr rupesh from amdavad my question is to dr shetty sir in his case Uh, mm-hmm. you you know actually emphasize that device being partially and she is in the upper pulmonary vein and then bringing it back to la and pushing it to the appendage so why is it uh, so important why cannot we start unsheeting it in the appendage itself 
yeah yeah so this is a very very i think it's a very important question uh, left atrial appendage is a very very thin structure and pericardial effusion is the most common complication so the general rule is as much as possible have minimum uh, uh, you know uh, your catheter mob- uh, movement in appendage so when you are using device like acp amulate or sheath exchanges it's better to do in the appendage you know this is a stiffer sheath you are not really uh, puncturing in fossa this area you are not pre dilating the septum so most of the time the bigger sheets when you take you might injure appendage so most of us actually try to uh, you know exchange to these bigger sheets in the appendage in case of watchman after the sheath is parked you take a pigtail take it to left atrial appendage and then take your device in and start unsheathing when you are dealing with devices like acp or amulet or even lambre you could use the device itself instead of taking a pigtail you could use the device itself to form a small round structure which is practically atraumatic and then pull the whole system down but there are there are definitely more than one ways of doing it you could do all the exchanges in the appendage but you have to be extremely careful when you do it otherwise you tend to see you know anybody who seen the appendage in real life you know all those specimens you realize it's a paper thin structure so respect the appendage do minimal manipulation in appendage try to shift everything in pulmonary vein and uh, with great respect start unsheathing in the appendage thank you very much ranjan and yeah. especially you took an effort to get out of your vacation time to yeah, yeah, yeah. manage this presentation <laughs> Yes. Is there Thank any you. comment coming from somewhere? Okay, so we move forward to Dr. Bali's uh, presentation on the trick valve. And uh, this is the tricuspid valve is now coming up in the forefront, and a lot of exciting interventions are happening. And some cases have been done in our country. So Dr. Bali has done one of those. Uh, thank you, Dr. Atul, for a wonderful conference. And uh, this is the first conference we're attending in person, and I hope there will be more to come. I'm going to talk about a valve which is at this moment used only for compassionate grounds and it has not got commercial approval. So tricuspid regurgitation is a major problem world over and uh, we see the complications of tricuspid valve, especially severe tricuspid regurgitation and those who are not surgical candidates can have severe problems. Uh, now, uh, in such patients, we see uh, there is a higher mortality if they are left untreated. And there are a number of causes of severe tricuspid regurgitation. And we see that those who are associated with severe tricuspid regurgitation have left ventricle disease with significant it, with atrial fibrillation and heart failure have worse prognosis. Now we see that uh, in some of these patients, percutaneous devices may be becoming available. And there are a number of uh, percutaneous devices which are being tried word over, but there is none which has uh, stood the test of time. As of now, trials are awaiting. So this is uh, one such device which is now become available. It's the tricuspid valve, and it's a bicuspid valve system. Here we don't take care of the tricuspid valve as such, but the two uh, devices are put in this periovenicava RA junction and the inferiovenicava, and we look at the effect of that tricuspid regurgitation on congestive symptoms rather than tackling the valve itself. The device has two uh, components. One is a SVC component and the IVC component. Made of nitinol, SVC component is dumbbell shape, and the long st- skirt is uh, made of bovine p- pericardium, and IVC has a short skirt, and again uh, made of n- nitinol. And uh, this has been a C approved device now, and we do a CT angiogram to find out various parameters to choose uh, which particular device would be su- suitable for a given patient. Now, there are two uh, d- devices, two sets of devices which are available. And depending on the size of uh, SVC, IVC, and uh, various parameters, which we look at CT, this device is selected. So how do we select patient? Patient has to be more than class three, uh, New York heart session uh, function class, EF of more than 40%, six minute walk test of more than 60 minutes, and life expectancy of more than 12 months. And the absence of untreated left side, uh, valvular heart disease, severe renal failure, or liver cirrhosis, cirrhosis, child C. And this is what, what are the uh, parameters we check on CT angiography. 
Hemodynamically, V wave in IVC and SVC is more than 25 millimeter. On echocardiography, it appears of 14 millimeters, and uh, systolic pressure, pulmonary systolic pressure less than 65 millimeters. Now, this patient, which we're uh, going to talk about today, was a 77 year old female. She presented to us with chief complaints of uh, congestive heart failure, intractable congestive heart failure. And she had been to various hospitals, had been admitted in hepatology in PGI, investigated for congestive cardiac, for uh, decompensated cirrhosis. And on investigation, she was found that tricuspid regurgitation was the cause of her cardiac cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. So on echocardiography, she was in atrial fibrillation with control ventricle rate. On echocardiography, RA and RV were dilated. Uh, TAPIS was uh, 15 millimeters. Uh, there were free tricuspid regurgitation, moderate pulmonary artery hypertension, the systolic pressure of 60 millimeters of mercury. LV was function was fairly normal. And uh, ultrasound abdomen showed that uh, she had ascites, bilateral pleural effusion, and abdomen showed, abdominal ultrasound showed that she had severe heart failure symptoms with the congestive hepatomegaly and early cardiac cirrhosis uh, signs. So this is what echo images showed, free uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And uh, we decided that how do we go about uh, uh, tackling such a patient? She had been to multiple cardiac surgeons, four cardiac surgeons that refused treatment. So we looked at a compassionate treatment, uh, whether we could uh, uh, use this device in this particular patient. Uh, Dr. Parveen Chandra is here and he had very kindly agreed to be with us on that particular day. And this is the uh, parameter which we checked on CT angiography. We found that the device could be suitably deployed in this particular patient. Uh, one uh, pigtail catheter in the pulmonary artery, one through the left jugular vein to see the RA, uh, SVC RA junction. And then we, uh, the device was deployed using a Lundercoast uh, wire. This is the SVC component of the device being deployed. A rather easy method of deployment, not very complicated procedure. Uh, slow deployment to continuously see that the device is uh, optimally getting deployed. This is the SVC component has been deployed now. And then we went ahead uh, with the IVC component, one uh, catheter in the hepatic vein to see that uh, what is the site of hepatic vein. And we wanted to keep this device above the hepatic vein because the segment was short. So some component of the device had to be kept into the right, right atrium. And then the IVC component being uh, deployed. Again, uh, rather simple procedure to deploy. And a final angiogram to show that uh, it's uh, doing well. And then uh, we have a good follow-up on this patient. And we have about three months follow-up now and uh, the congestive heart failure symptoms have disappeared. Our tretinin, which was 3.4 at that time because of cardiorenal syndrome has normalized now. And uh, she's uh, reasonably okay. And she's able to walk about a kilometer or so. So congestive heart failure symptoms have taken, over, taken, uh, taken care of. Echocardiography showed that uh, IVC was a uh, component of the device was doing very well. There was no regurgitation. Similarly, the SVC component was doing quite well. This is IVC component showing that there is no regurgitation. And uh, so this is another device which we uh, can use now as, uh, as we talk, it, it has got a C marking now. And uh, as I said, there are a number of uh, devices which are available for uh, transcutter tricuspid landscape, some use direct suture endoplasty, other direct uh, ring endoplasty, some use cooperation enhancement, and some are actual valve replacement. But the strict valve is one area where we only use the SVC2 uh, IVC component and do not touch the tricuspid valve. But it has some initial data to show that it improves symptoms and, uh, and improves uh, six minute walk test, improves quality of uh, uh, care treatment. And then um, weight obviously would reduce because the congestive heart failure symptoms would uh, go away. So RA diameter uh, volume, right ventricle diameter volume do reduce on implantation of this particular device. So again, I would repeat rather uh, uh, early days for this device, very limited experience. Some trials have been started. Uh, I, I learned that Tricus one trial has been started. We have only uh, early six months data which shows that there is improvement in symptoms and there is no device-related mortality. So in conclusion, I would say that's a new device promising 
uh, and uh, but we have a very early time to say anything about long term uh, results of this particular device but looks uh, easy to deploy and uh, safe to deploy and in patients who are have no other option such is not an option this can be considered as a treatment of choice thank you thank you very much that's a very sharp presentation very sharp and crisp and uh, obviously we need to have the right choice of patients who can uh, benefit from this device one comment from dr praveen chandra and then we have one presentation from dr sai satish he's uh, having to go into an urgent case post lunch so praveen yeah. Yeah. yeah so you know uh, one thing about this trick valve that it is a rather simple nice procedure takes about half an hour or so to do it and uh, it is not necessary to implant both the valves so but if one is looking at because it is a palliative therapy right now it is not a, a curative therapy that you know it is going to happen to the tricuspid valve so if cost is one of the issues and of course you don't want to do the I, svc valve you can just do the ivc valve to improve the you know the renal so and the liver uh, you know to protect the, both these organs and then you can see how the patients improve and many of the thought is that if these patients improve and they become operable then they can go for surgery after the ivc valve implantation but only the congestion goes to the upper limb then the yeah, for the goes. for the upper there is not a problem because you know then the re kidney and you know and liver is protected so the organs and then these patients be can become operable after that's some time that's a good suggestion one one floor question last one uh, good afternoon. And while Sai, can you share your presentation in the meantime? I'm Dr. Purvej. I'm from uh, Dayanan Medical College, Ludhiana. It's a theoretical question. I mean, we are uh, uh, putting a valve in SVC and uh, IVC, but the tricuspid regurgitation remains. Uh, is it not going to adversely remodel the right side of the heart? We are closing the decompression, uh, uh, you can say, uh, vessels. So the pressure on the right vent, uh, atria is going to increase and that may be adversely uh, uh, affect the remodeling. I, I, I think we are, as Dr. Parveen very rightly said, we're talking of a palliative treatment here and we are choosing those patients who have isolated tricuspid regurgitation or there is no significant left ventricle disease or no, not much of pulmonary artery hypertension. And it's been seen that the RA volume and it does decrease, as I did uh, mention in my slide. But again, it's a palliative procedure. We expect once the congestive symptoms improve, when the cardiorenal syndrome gets taken care of, patient is in a better position to be operated. And then we can take care of definitive treatment for such a patient. We're looking for three to six months of stabilization and then treating them, those patients. This is no not a definitive treatment for tricuspid valve disease because we're not touching the tricuspid valve. So that would remain to be taken care of subsequently. Thank you very much, Dr. Bali. Thank Over to Sai. And truly, the PA pressures have to be uh, within a reasonable limit. Otherwise, if the yes. PA pressures are high, then the RA is going to bulge. Yeah. Correct? So, if, so this is a good procedure for low pressure low TRs. Pressure TRs. Yeah. And especially one of the other indications I can tell you, which we did in two of our patients, was post pacemaker severe tricuspid regurgitation. Right. Sai. Over to you, Chennai yeah. Express. Hi, hi, Dr. Martin. Uh, hello, Dr. Chandra. It's lovely to see all of you, Ganesh. Uh, I, I, I'm just so disappointed I couldn't be here with all of you. I, I barely missed it, uh, but this is what I'll have to do. I have a 80 year old lady with cardiogenic shock who I have to go in a bit. So thank you for accommodating me a little early. The I'm car is still to... waiting at the airport to pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One, two, so we can see your slide presentation, Sai. Yeah, but uh, there we go. So I'm I'm going I I, I Ravinder has the step to step by step so I'm going to allow him to eloquently go through that I'm just going to discuss a couple of cases uh, before I go in one brief slide uh, Dr Martin I have about ten minutes right yeah yeah clearly okay. audible and well seen the slides are seen okay perfect so just so there are about twenty six million patients of heart failure worldwide and about thirty seven point seven million if you take the undiagnosed cases it's the number one cause of hospitalization in the world today. Over 50% of these patients are re-hospitalized within six months, and we have a one in five lifetime risk of developing heart failure. Several reasons for this, skyrocketing uh, incidence of diabetes, hypertension. Uh, the important thing here is that these patients also have an extremely high mortality of almost 60% in five years. I'm not going to go into the details. 
Okay. So I thought I'll show you two cases, both of which I did recently. Uh, one was a month ago and one was a little over a month. So 86-year-old gentleman, diabetic and hypertensive, coronary artery disease. He had an ACS, had an ad hoc primary PCI to left main and circumflex, severe MR with a flaty P2, more towards P3, cardiogenic shock, lactate at 5.6, liver enzymes climbing, creatinine climbing. They were unable to get him off the balloon pump and ventilator. He was too sick for any surgical option. Um, the children called me from Bangalore saying that we're not able to remove the balloon pump, we're not able to remove the ventilator, and we're getting him in an ambulance to Chennai. So now, acute MIs and cardiogenic shock are a little trickier than the FMR cases because the LA hasn't had time to enlarge. So this is a really small LA. It was about two centimeters across by about four centimeters long. And you can see the flail P2 overriding the uh, A2 and a torrential MR jet. Wide MR, valve area was 5.82. And the LA was so small that I could not puncture traditionally in the mid fossa. You can see the bicable view here. This is where I would have gone for because if I had gone there, I didn't have enough height to do the case. So I'm actually just below the SVC RA junction. Uh, you can look at the location of the puncture site. I had to go that high, took the puncture, and since the LA is so small, I've not even straddled, I've not even moved the clip to where it should be, and I'm already in the superior pulmonary vein. So I literally had to pull the entire device back. And if you keep looking at this device, you'll see it fall out of the superior pulmonary vein. Uh, just how Ranjan likes to have his uh, LA appendage devices behave. But I, but I had no choice in this case but to pull the entire steerable guide into the right atrium. So I, have, I had to compromise an entire anterior-posterior motion by taking the steerable guide into the right atrium to get it off the superior pulmonary vein to point towards the valve, then checked it on 3D MFOS, deployed the clip, and in this, you can see the leaflets bouncing off the two arms, and here with the grippers down, the bouncing is far less, and verifying with color to make sure that the MR jet has been focused on closing the clip. And these are just fluoro images. I'm, I'm always presenting echo images alongside fluoro images because it helped me get up to speed because we as interventional cardiologists, we're so used to looking at it, at fluoros and working. It takes a little bit to look at the echoes at work. And the patient went from torrential MR to no MR. Uh, that is the beautiful double orifice. The gradient didn't go up. This is the LA pressures. I always like to keep a pigtail in the LA. That's a little trick I learned from Saibal. Uh, it tells me, even before my echo can tell me how good the grasp is, the hemodynamics from the LA mean and the V wave tells me how much of the MR is reduced on table. This was him 24 hours post-procedure. That was him one week post-procedure playing with his great, great grandchild. The next case I have for you is an FMR with cardiogenic shock. Again, 70-year-old male, diabetic and hypothyroid, old antral wall MI, PCI 2005. They found a ramus, um, but they didn't treat it. Severe biventricular dysfunction, EF 25%, severe MR functional, worsening on max medication, uh, came with azotemia, liver enzyme derangement, lactate at 9.6. Uh, he was so sick that they sent me a message saying that the first air ambulance uh, would not board him. And uh, uh, by the time he reached me, his pressures were barely 80 systolic. Look at that LV. It was an abysmal LV. My anesthetist was very uncomfortable about taking this patient, saying that there's such a torrential MR, and if you actually close the MR, the afterload would be just too much for this limping LV to handle. Look at the MR. Huge, wide torrential MR. And look at the gap, almost one centimeter gap of non-coaptation. So uh, you can see from the fluoro images, the cardiac silhouette is barely moving. Went in, septal puncture, steerable guide in place. Uh, I kind of like the FMRs. There's plenty of room to move. Take the clip in. So initially what I thought is I would find the gap and just put one clip, reducing about 75% of the MR, allow the LV to get used to it, bring him back after three months and finish the job. So I went a little medium, put the first clip, and right after the first clip, my anesthetist tells me, what did you do? I said, why? He said, I don't know what you did, but I was barely managing to maintain 60 systolic pressure. And now I'm having to reduce pressures because pressure is going over 110. So finish the first clip. And then I was brazen enough to take a second one. And I quite like what you're seeing here. So what happens is when the lungs are up, the clip, you can line it up nicely to the first clip. 
And then you go under the mitral valve into the LV and just go lung down and the clip will move medially and tightly hug the first clip. And then you can see the clip above and you can see the one clip in the LV and the second clip right over the residual jet. And you can see that huge non-coaptation hole after two clips. It's making that little alien face that I like so much to see. So the torrential MR became trivial. Look at those LA V-waves. 84 was the V-wave when he came, 55 after the second clip, 26 after the third clip. This is pre-procedure lactates is pushing nine, post-procedure 1.36, post-procedure blood pressure is 130, 70 with minimal support. CVP came down from 31 to six, saturation is 100. Within the next three days, his creatinine went from 2.4 to normal, liver enzymes recovered. This was him 12 hours post-procedure. That was an image he sent me 36 hours post-procedure from his house. I think I've taken about six minutes with this. I'm going to stop. Thank you all for uh, the patient listening. And the floor is back. Excellent. Yeah. Case. Yeah. Raveen, uh, your comments. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I must say that I love size presentations. And, you know, he has done a great job uh, with these cases, which you have seen. But otherwise, he has done a very nice series of cases. And especially these patients who were in cardiogenic shock, they really improve quite a lot. And the best part with MitroClip is that, you know, it really doesn't harm. It, it has, because it's a venous procedure, it is like, it doesn't have any contrast injection to be given. And these patients, once they are done, they really improve very fast and the patients can be discharged the very next day. That's the beauty of this whole thing. And, uh, and seriously, you know, those patients who have uh, severe mitral regurgitation and who can undergo this procedure and who are not best candidates for surgery, I'm not saying that surgery should not be done, but if they're not possible to be taken by surgery, if they have the good indications as shown this morning by Samir and now you saw these cases, it works very well. Excellent. Ganesh, uh, comments from you? Uh. Just very briefly, I think Chandra was a bit uh, polite about saying how this can be done easily, but I think, you know, Chandra and Sai, they have a lot of skill. You do need skill and you do need, uh, in terms of learning the technique, it's a much, much harder technique to learn than Tavi would, I would say. Uh, the transeptal function is important. If you get that wrong, everything goes wrong. And then also being, you know, knowing when to stop. I think that's important. Uh, and I like the idea of Sai of deploying one and the pre planner coming back later to deal with something else. And then finally, I think, Sai, how do you survive those days with no WhatsApp? Huh? Oh, your patients are communicating with you WhatsApp, which is quite... That's all quite they funny. do. I, I, I'm the WhatsApp doctor. That is size style. Start from WhatsApp and finish with the photo. Very good. <laughs> you know, you know why? Because Congratulations. Of, thank you. Yeah. Thank Typical you so cases, much. nice results. Do we thank have Mirvat uh, on the panel with us for her comments? Final, last comments. And of course, Senna, it goes without saying that you need to have the, the echocardiographer as your best friend. You know? I, was, I was just going to say that Absolutely. you need a supremely good echocardiographer. He's probably more important than the operator because un you can see what beautiful images I had. And that gives me so much confidence to go ahead and do it. And I have to make a special mention to Professor Chandrasekhar from Mayo Clinic, who has been with me for all the 30 cases that have been done so far. Uh, he's just a pillar of support and his images are like 4K. Sorry, I meant to say that, uh, you know, when I mean skill is not just the intervention, the, the imaging skill is really is the key. If you, do, if you don't see what you're supposed to see and you can't see what you're supposed to see, you'll put the clip uh, all over the world and think you've done a great job. And the echocardiograph make it, can make it look like you've done a great job because they don't <laughs> give you the images you want to see. So I think the imaging person is key, absolutely. So we are going to take a brief break for lunch of around 35 minutes. And after that, we have some exciting international presenters because of the uh, time zone adjustments. We have some exotic cases and some complications coming up. During this lunch process, we have two very interesting cases, one from Dr. Grube and one from Vinnie Bapert, going to be running on the side when you're having your lunch. Do appreciate that and hope to get back with you again in another 35 minutes. Bye-bye, all of you, and thanks a lot, all of you. So welcome back, all of you, after this uh, lunch break. And uh, we had an exciting pre-lunch session with such interesting cases. And uh, now we are going to move into 
the the higher end of this meeting today with some great stalwarts from across the globe who are going to show some very interesting teaching cases so i take this opportunity to uh, invite the moderators for the session and uh, dr praveer agarwal is uh, over here with me he's joining in and we have peter andreka i can already see peter peter is the ma managing director of the heart hospital at budapest and he's responsible for training of so many structural heart interventionists in our country and it's always been a pleasure whenever we are able to meet physically last to last year and we really look forward that we can do that all again so welcome peter dr ashok seth is going to be joining soon again he was there before the lunch session also dr molik parik are you there yes i can see uh, dr molik also over there and uh, dr vishal dasogi is there uh dr pradeep yadav from piedmont is uh, likely to be joining us soon on the panel and he has some presentations in the next uh, session dr giza is uh, is he back with us after his breakfast lunch yes giza welcome back yes hi i'm here great great to have you back again and uh, can i request dr pramod joshi and dr pradeep harnali to please join us on the panel <clears throat> and dr sanjay professor uh, sanjay tyagi also please to join us dr rupa can we request you also to join for some discussions and rajneesh uh, it will be a pleasure to have you there so we'll get started with the session after the lunch uh, the first presented complication of vascular access so peter uh, can you share your presentation i am sorry for interrupting but today is a teachers day can you hear me yes yes loud and clear yeah, yeah. so today in india is 5th september which is teachers day and it so happens that i am here with two of my teachers peter andrika and giza fontos so on this day i would like to express my gratitude to both of them <clears throat> definitely and i'm sure they are very proud of uh, what they've been able to teach you you know because yeah, i mean are, i couldn't the, the day progress. couldn't have, the day and platform couldn't have been better thank you so much for that and peter and giza i thank you so much for everything it goes it goes without saying that molik has been doing great guns in this country after his uh, excellent training and uh, pradeep hi welcome it's very early in the morning for you over there in us <clears throat> yeah hi no thank you this is very exciting yes it's little over 4 in the morning but it's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be among friends and yourself thank you for this early wake up for for, for us So Peter, are you ready to uh, roll on with your presentation? We can see it over here. And yeah, on with yeah, you. yeah, definitely. I'm absolutely excited. Uh, but first of all, Malik, thank you very much. But you have to know that we all learn from each other. Always, there are no teachers and students uh, in the field of the uh, experienced interventional cardiologist. <clears throat> When we do proctorings with Geza, we always learn a lot. uh from the other interventional cardiologists but anyway let's let's talk about the uh, vascular access complications so uh um, first of all i would like to let you know that uh, uh i'm absolutely honored uh to be able to have this uh have this presentation uh but uh, it is not fair because you are in india uh together Uh, with the beautiful indian food and i'm still talking to the monitor of my computer uh looking the face of my faces of my indian indian friends but hopefully soon we will be able to meet physically and not only virtually but anyway uh it is a great time to be an international cardiologist uh because we can do a lot of other things uh, than the uh, car work however Uh, the corners are also important but touching the aortic valve or the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve or the other parts um, of the heart is really a fun so uh, it is it is a great time for us but we have to be aware uh, that if you are working with uh, uh, large uh, sheets uh, we have some vascular complications and even major vascular complications and the problem is that even if we are extremely responsible 
uh, and very experienced, uh, these vascular complications do exist. Uh, our responsibility is to minimize uh, this vascular complication rate, and there are routes to follow uh, to be able to comply with that. Because there's a very, very strict relationship uh, between the major vascular complications and mortality. And we are well aware of that. So uh, uh, the first is, if you are talking about the TAVI procedure, uh, what are our vascular access options? So we can go for surgical cardan, of course, which is, of course, still good. However, we can have some, some logistical problems with that, or we can choose the full percutaneous way with a prostatic cell device or two proglides, or only one proglide plus an angio seal, or the new Manta device. It is basically up to us uh, what we choose. However, uh, we should know our device, what we routinely use. So there is uh, some comparison between the uh, percutaneous and the uh, cut-down way, this data, uh, are from the uh, partner trials. And if we take a look at the image, uh, we can see that there is, there is no uh, significant, um, um, so they are, they are really, really similar uh, to each other, or uh, we still don't know uh, uh, which way to use and which is safer than the, uh, than the others. So here on this, uh, on this screen, you can see a comparison between the prostatic cell device and the, uh, and the uh, proglide. Uh, we just probably like uh, all the, um, the uh, TAVI centers, we started our uh, percutaneous procedures with the uh, prostar device. And of course we stopped using the prostar device a couple of years ago and we switched to the uh, two proglide system. And then in the past, like a couple of years, uh, we use only one proglide uh, plus, plus an angio seal because our experience is that in our lab, using our hands, uh, the complication rate is the smallest if we use only one proglide plus one, uh, plus one angio seal. On this screen, uh, you can see the uh, Manta device. Manta device is a plug-based uh, device, not like the, uh, the uh, ProStar or the uh, ProGlide device. It, is, it um, uh, gives us a simple and quick closure and a fast hemostasis if you are very careful uh, with, uh, with using the device. Um, we have quite a... Uh, we have some experience uh, with this device. Uh, we use it routinely. So how we can how, uh, uh, prevent the uh, vascular complications? So first is the proper iliofemoral screening, the uh, proper access technique, the sheet and the guide wire management, uh, the vascular closure technique, uh, the operator experience, and the detection and the management uh, of the uh, complication, what we, uh, what we uh, all experience. So here on this screen, you can see the uh, uh, iliofemoral, the proper iliofemoral screening. Of course, the gold standard is the multi-slice CT, which gives us a very proper uh, vessel size measurement. Um, a good image of tortuosity and calcification. Of course, if it's not enough, uh, we can add some angiography data on the top of the uh, multi-slice CD because we are interventional cardiologists and sometimes we quite like to see um, the uh, iliofemoral system on the fluoroscopy screen. Uh, so it can give us some additional information but it is only a 2D image, uh, and it definitely underestimates the, cut, the uh, calcification. So if we wanna uh, lower the contrast rate, we don't really need 
the uh, peripheral uh, angiogram. However, it is always up to the uh, operators. Uh, and of course, if we still think that it's necessary to, uh, to use some, some additional devices, uh, we, can always, we can always use some MRI or IVUS. However, uh, these are not part of the uh, routine assessment. They can be helpful or harmful as well if we don't know how to uh, evaluate the result. So we all know this slide. Uh, I'm, I will not be going, going through that. It is the way uh, how we can uh, uh, safely puncture the uh, common femoral artery, uh, even on the small sheet side and the lower sheet side as well. But here, I would like to show you this method. This is the old Turing method. I don't know whether you still remember these slides. Uh, it is important for us, for Gesa and me, because we know uh, Dr. Zoltan Turi personally and originally he's from Hungary. And he developed that this method a couple of 10 years ago in the United States when we all used the uh, family lottery uh, for our PCIs and coron I mean, uh, coronangiograms uh, as well. But for the TAVI procedure, uh, we can modify the Turing method a bit because we know the CT, as we can see on the left side um, of the image. And if we go for a fluoroscopy guided procedure, uh, we know where we should puncture uh, the uh, artery to hit the uh, common femoral part. But I definitely suggest you uh, to use an echo guided puncture or the fluoroscopy guided puncture as well on the other side. We use a combined method, use an echo guided puncture on the small sheet side, and then we do a cross uh, contralateral uh, image, plus we use a wire and we puncture the uh, artery parallel to the wire to hit the anterior wall of the artery. And of course, it's always mandatory to check the position of the sheet. And it is always mandatory uh, to check the result uh, after the closure. So that is the combination technique to use to avoid the uh, complication rate on both sides. So it's a problem. So uh, my duty is uh, to talk about the nightmare vascular complication to learn from. But the thing is that I cannot comply with this task because even after a couple of thousand implantations, we haven't had a nightmare vascular complication. And this is not because we are very good. It is because we always follow our protocol and uh, there's no exception. Uh, and we always use the technique and those devices uh, we uh, know. So that is, I think, our way how to minimize uh, the uh, vascular complication rate. So, um, however, uh, I can show you uh, a case what we can what we can learn from. So this was a very very simple and the uh, average heavy case. Uh, after a proper patient selection, we found good femorals, not a huge amount of calcium, uh, and we inserted one proglide suture. Of course, we checked the position of the shield, as you can, as you can see here, and we nicely uh, implanted a 29 millimeter Evolute Pro valve uh, using the inline sheet um, of the system. And our plan was uh, to uh, close the uh, femoral hole with using only the uh, one implanted proglide plus an eight French angiosil. So we did it. And uh, it is always mandatory uh, to check the result of the closure. But here you can see that there is bleeding. So the next is to go for a, a manual compression. And if we experience that, of course, you always antagonize the heparin and then 
go for some manual compression, but we still had a bleeding. So uh, since it's a very fragile patient population, uh, we saw that it would be a good idea to close this bleeding. So uh, uh, the uh, contralateral sheet, uh, we just crossed the lesion uh, and we opened it up uh, with a wire. But here you can see that there is a huge thrombotic lesion. So there's a big amount of thrombus which uh, covers the bifurcation um, as well. So uh, we decided to of course cover this thrombotic lesion together with the bleeding hole uh, with a Bentley B graft. It is a balloon expandable uh, stand. And that is, that is always our third choice. Of course, we can, we can uh, go into a discussion uh, which stand we should use in a situation like that, balloon expandable or self-expandable, but that is our first choice. So we put a seven by 28 uh, millimeter B graft. And here you can see that we still have a bleeding. It is like an edge bleeding. So that is the upper edge of the stent and there is a bleeding plus a fistula uh, which reaches the vein, uh, the femoral vein as well. So the next was to cover that part of the common femoral artery as well with an other uh, stand graft, plus it was dilated, the first stand graft as well, and we just stopped, we just stopped the bleeding. So um, the first step in this case was uh, to detect the complication and to manage the complication the way how we always do. So we should anticipate the complication and that's how we can minimize it. So we should be ready for the catastrophic situation and we have to control the bleeding rapidly with using our hands or using a balloon. And we should have our bailout technique in the room. So the coda balloon, if it is needed, the crossover sheet and the crossover balloons and the peripheral stands and the peripheral wires and the peripheral experience. So uh, we with Giza, we think that is absolutely essential to have a good uh, peripheral experience if we, uh, if we do the uh, TAVI procedures. And of course, we shouldn't forget the vascular surgeons. So the vascular surgeons should also, also be available. So um, uh, even, if we go for a minimalist approach, and of course the percutaneous uh, technique is the part of the minimalist approach, we should be aware uh, of, the, uh, of the problems. We should be aware of the acute and late uh, problems as well. The patient selection is a key point. We gotta understand uh, our uh, devices uh, the, prompt, the prompt recognition and diagnosis is a must. Uh, we should have all the equipment in the lab, not in the peripheral lab and not in the other part of the building, but in the lab where we do the uh, heavy procedures. Even the surgeons should be available. The experience is a must and we should be always uh, prepared for the worst. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, for your attention. Uh, we are here as cardiologists and we are coming and getting, getting closer to that part of the, of that part of the heart, uh, what we didn't touch uh, in the future, but we gotta be very careful with the technique and during the procedure what to do. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, uh, <clears throat> Peter. And uh, this, uh, it goes without saying, as you have very clearly underlined that Vascular access has to be respected, very carefully scrutinized before you start the case. You should be ready for the worst complications with all the hardware which is required. Never ignore your femoral access or whichever alternate view. We we'll take some comments from our friends. Uh, Peter, you want to add something? Uh, no, so I absolutely agree, absolutely agree with you. Ganesh. <clears throat> You have seen uh, a lot of a lot of water water has flown under your bridge. 
and you have seen lots yeah. of kinds of vascular acts. Strange noise, I can. Um, okay, it's a timer. Okay, say it again, please. You hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now very clearly. I, I can hear you now. Yeah. Um, I must, I've been hearing that noise as well. It must be somebody's mic. But anyway, I just think yeah. great job, Peter. You went through the, the, the um, present very, very nicely and you in, you brought all the key points. I guess three comments. One is, um, over the years, I used to use ProStar uh, religiously and what I, I, I like it. It is a, it's got a very steep learning curve. Uh, but what I noticed that, you know, every two or three cases, you need to compress the groin a bit longer than normal. As of 1st of September last year, uh, consecutive cases, what I've done is I've put one ProGlide and one ProStar pre-closure. Mm -hmm. uh, of 101 cases, I have no complication at all mm -hmm. and compression less than five minutes. So um, I'm currently in discussion with Abbott and how to transfer that knowledge to the masses. But I think technique and technology will change. The other point is about using ultrasound guided puncture. I think it's important when you're using ultrasound guided to know how far the artery is from the skin. Uh, Absolutely agree. So you need to understand Pythagoras okay. theorem. It works really, really well for thin patients and shallow arteries. If you have a large patient with a very deep femoral artery, remember that every degree turn or tilt of your ultrasound, mm -hmm. what you think you're seeing is not where you're puncturing. You may be very high or very shallow. So just mm -hmm. remember that. And then finally, I think um, always remember that if you have a lot of calcium in the puncture zone, please, please speak to your surgeon and try to look for an alternate access. There is absolutely no need in 2021 to try to be the hero in the cath lab uh, trying to do stuff that really doesn't make sense. If you have a lot of calcium in the puncture zone, your closure device will fail. You will create a big hole. And when you create a big hole, the vascular surgeon will not like you because they will have to go in and put a background graph which they don't enjoy doing. They can't repair the artery. So upfront, plan ahead, try and think about alternate access, Work closely with the surgeon or vascular surgeon to to, to you know to bring them on board. That's it. Bye bye, Joe. Thank you. Ganesh, as always, I absolutely agree with you. Great comments. Thank you very much. Pradeep Yadav, uh, can we have your comments on the vascular access and complications you face and how you avoid it? Yes. No. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. It's a great presentation, and I fully agree that it starts from a meticulous planning, you know, analyzing the CT very well, picking up your target zone, picking up which side you're going to access. And then as uh, mentioned, really avoid if it's an anterior calcified vessel and small lumen, it's not worth testing. There's no point of testing will the sheath go in or not go in. At the end, it will be an issue. So we try to avoid those, use alternate access in about 5% of the cases. And our 100% ultrasound usage for all accesses, whether it's a big sheet or the contralateral small sheet. Uh, the only minor difference uh, from the talk was use of a stent type, which stent would you use? We prefer self-expanding, especially if it's a common femoral high movement, uh, high flexion zone. But other than that, I fully agree what's been mentioned. So uh, th there's another school of thought where people are still using uh, fluoro guided puncture with a pigtail right there at the point where you want to puncture it. So, but ultrasound guidance, I think is uh, made the procedure far more uh, safer. I uh, will take comments from mm -hmm. Malik uh, and, uh, and then Manik Chopra. Yeah. I thank you very much. So I, I usually don't like to put the pigtail in the, in the Tavi groin. I just uh, put the JR or the Lima little deep on the bifurcation on the Tavi groin and just inject from there and take a puncture on the road map. Because sometimes even putting a pigtail or trying to push a pigtail down the femoral can dissect your main access site and you can have a lot of complications. So I personally like to keep the uh, punctures, I mean the main Tavi groin completely clean without any hardware going down from any side. So that is one. And apart from that, I think, so my, my, my boss has spoken, so I don't think there is anything more for me to add. Manik? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm in agreement with whatever was discussed, but the only thing is, I, of course, calcium worries us at the puncture side. But if the vessel size is okay, I would still probably, you know, try to go from that side. Because uh, definitely transfemoral axis makes the things simple. I would probably put a safety wire from the opposite side and be prepared for 
uh, using self-expanding covered scent if something goes wrong. Because in present day world, I, I really don't think that putting a self-expanding scent at that area should be considered as major vascular complication. Unless and until you are completely going in a four millimeter vessel, just calcium at the puncture site, I don't think should restrict us from choosing, choosing an alternate axis because most of the advantages are going from the, from the transfemoral axis. And, and this local complication, if it is happening also, you're puncturing the groin below the inguinal ligament. If, if you cannot fix it, then probably your surgeon would definitely be able to fix it. You're not going in abdomen. And, and of course, you can use your covered stents all the time. So we'll mute you for the time being. And uh, Rajneesh wanted to make a surgeon wants yeah. to make a comment on this. So I would say uh, from a surgical standpoint, I mean, it's still easier for us to manage the peripheral vascular complications. So I always wonder, I mean, if there is a central complication, means like ascending aorta, if there is any aortic dissection or something. So is there some backup plan or how do the cardiologists manage it? I mean, I always wonder that if that happens in the cath lab, then what's the, what's the plan? So, uh, uh, yeah, there are a lot of endovascular things. Uh, Peter and Giza, would you first uh, like to address that? If there's an aortic complication while doing the procedures. So, uh, so luckily, luckily, an aortic complication is very rare. So uh, in, uh, in, my, in my TAVIC career, it happened to me only once. Uh, it was in India. And that was a dissection of the ascending aorta. And uh, the patient ended up with, of course, a surgery. So that was, that was the solution of, uh, of, that, uh, of that problem. Uh, but uh, if, if you remember, I put the name of the coda balloon. Uh, it was on my slide. So uh, I think that even the coda balloon should be, be available. So that's the, that's the only way if there's, a, if there's an aortic bleeding. However, um, um, we have never needed to, to use a coda balloon uh, with this indication uh, with Geza. Amit, uh, would you like to make a comment? Dr. Amit Chaurasia? here. On, switch it on. Sorry. Uh, hi, <laughs> Peter, how are you? Hi, Amit. Hi, it's nice to talk, hear you. Yeah. Uh, I talked to listen to that. Uh, last, uh, ascending aortic complication, uh, most uh, important thing to notice is that what is the diameter of the ascending aorta? If the diameter of the ascending aorta is more than 4.5 if and a bicuspid aortic valve, or more than five in a tricuspid aortic valve, even if the patient is a non-surgical candidate, you need to be very careful. And sometimes what happens is like you finish a procedure very well. There is no dissection anyway, but uh, two hours later you find the aorta has ruptured. Now, we don't know whether it is procedure related. If it was a procedure related, definitely the patient would not have sustained for two hours. Whether it is that same two to three percent of the big aorta rupture over a period of time in a year, whether that was the thing, no one can say. But of course, once a aortic rupture or dissection occurs, generally it is very life-threatening and very difficult to control on the table for us. Yeah. Commence with uh, Dr. Ganesh. He has one more. Ganesh Manohan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I don't remember the surgeon who brought up the point, but you brought up a really, really important point. Um, if you, as, uh, if you have a dissection uh, on the table, in my kind of patients, we're usually high risk and extreme risk. Our treatment strategy has always been conservative management. Make sure the blood pressure is maintained uh, sub-110. Uh, uh, we monitor overnight and repeat CT the next day. But conservative management is what we would do. Opening a chest for these kind of patients is usually counterproductive and counterintuitive that they don't survive it. Uh, if you have a rupture, as already mentioned, they usually die on the table. The other thing you can do if, if the dissection is very low uh, near the FTJ, actually releasing your valve, a self-expanding valve, will tend to seal it. Uh, so you can think about that as well. Um, but if it's very high uh, near the uh, origins of the major vessels, they don't, they don't do very well. So I think this is where you do need to have your discussion uh, during the consenting process with your patient. Uh, explain to them what the risks are and explain to them what up to where do we, what, what is the ceiling of care? Um, 
you know, and this discussion will become more relevant, I think, when you start dealing with uh, 60 year olds and 70 year olds, which is going to happen. Uh, but I think those patients have a less, less, much, much less likelihood of having any risk of dissection of the aorta because the aorta is a lot more healthier and uh, probably a bit more maintainable. Personally speaking, I feel that if, uh, if the patient uh, is a bicuspid aortic valve, then generally the patient will have some kind of aortopathy. And even if uh, the size of the aorta is in that borderline, it's always better to send the patient for a surgical repair rather than have a TAVI and other complications later. Yeah. I agree with Amit and I agree with uh, Ganesh that uh, the, the strategy in the Western world where you would only take such patients only if they're high surgical risk. But here we are dealing with a lot of low risk patients, especially a lot of them having bicuspids. And uh, they will have some kind of ascending aorta dilatation or aneurysm. So in these patients, I think a decision to surgery versus TAVI should be carefully taken. Yeah, especially younger patients. Yeah, very right. So any more comments on this? This has been a very good uh, case yeah, discussion. Can I small comment? Yeah, Praveer. You see, Peter, like uh, you have just uh, put the covered stand there, and two of them in, in the high flexion zone. Is it not a good idea to just get the surgical closure, which is a very simple device, just open that and put two stitches there and the panthers hole will be sealed. Vis-a-vis long-term putting in two covered stents in that area, which is high flexion zone. Yeah, so I think that it's a great question. Uh, and we need to carefully evaluate the case, the patient and the surgical risk. Uh, that patient was an old patient with, the, uh, with a high surgical risk. And uh, she was not a marathon runner, definitely. And we didn't anticipate it even after, even after the procedure. So I think that in this case, it was a good idea uh, to fix the problem percutaneously. But if the patient had been younger, if the patient had been more active, uh, we might have chosen something else like the surgical, surgical uh, solution as well. So we with Geza uh, have a firm belief that having a surgical, vascular surgical procedure in the cat lab when it is needed, it's not a shame. So we are a team together with the surgeons and we have to evaluate uh, the uh, case and we have to do that type of procedure which helps a lot uh, to the patient what the patient can benefit uh, from it really. So in this case, I still think that it was a good idea. In another case, I might have chosen something else. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, excellent presentation and a big hand. There's been a very good discussion. Yeah. So we'll uh, now invite uh, Giza uh, yeah. to, uh, Giza could share his, yeah, any comments you want to make, Peter? No, 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 no. I, I have to apologize. Uh, I have to leave, leave the session because I have an official, official duty and I would like to hand over all my responsibility to uh, Giza. Uh, it was my great honor uh, it was really good to see you on the monitor. So thank you very much. Definitely. For It'll be a pleasure to have you physically next time. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you very <laughs> much. And have a nice meeting. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank Bye -bye. you so thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. And so we move to the next presentation by Giza. Uh, so there is a complication of a coronary occlusion during a tablet. So that's another catastrophic complications. And we all dread such things. We always try to ensure we measure heights. We take all precautions. But let's see how Giza has handled his case. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? And do you have my slide? Yeah, we can see your slide and very clearly we can see you and yeah. hear you. Okay, so I got into a difficult situation while preparing my, my presentation. I asked one of my fellows to, to collect all our coronary occlusion cases that has happened so far to choose the one with some, some teaching points. And um, you can see here altogether, we had four coronary occlusions out of more than 1,100 cases. And the latest uh, happened in 2016. So you, you might think we were just lucky, and I confirm we are. But uh, honestly, I think we had to work a lot uh, on this luck. Um, 
so finally, I concluded that showing an occluded and standard, standard artery out of, out of the four is, um, is useless in front of a, a very experienced Indian audience. You are all extremely experienced experts in the field. So I'd like to concentrate on and show you a case where I can draw your attention on, on how uh, we can prevent coronary occlusion. So just to run through these four cases, the first patient was as a valve in valve, it was stentless, uh, uh, where uh, the valve was implanted by the surgeon supraannually. Practically, there were no uh, sinuses. Uh, the height of the coronaries were less than five millimeters. Um, and finally, we decided after a clear uh, surgical refusal to try this procedure. It went well. The control angio showed patent coronaries, and then probably delayed coronary occlusion occurred a couple of hours after procedure, and we didn't even have time to come back uh, to the cath lab. Then we had a patient who had, during the pre-BAV, -A, pre a left main LAD spiral dissection, which we could fix, and the patient was discharged without problems. Uh, we had uh, right coronary artery, uh, osteal occlusion, uh, heavily uh, calcified um, aortic wall, which was like a shepherd cook um, uh, right coronary artery. So we had to fight a lot for this artery and finally we could stand it. And the, the, the last one was um, a circ coming from, from the right, which got occluded. It was a, a very small vessel. We opened up with, with a balloon and it uh, uh, remained patent. So the importance comes that we know from, from the meta-analysis that even after a successful opening of the artery, about one third of the patients will die uh, during the, the hospital stay. If you send the patient to surgery, the situation is even worse. Uh, more than half of the patients die if you send them to, to emergency cabbage. And practically we, lose all patients who are, we cannot uh, recanalize. So this uh, uh, representation we all know, uh, if the patient has high coronary uh, osteum, uh, no matter whether it has um, a how uh, a narrow um, uh, the sinuses, the coronaries are basically safe. If we have wide sinus of Valsalva and low coronary ostium, the coronary takeoff, we have to carefully individually assess uh, what uh, should be uh, made to deprive the coronaries. Such cases sh should be performed uh, with extra caution. And if you have shallow sinuses of all solvo and low coronary osteum, these patients are really in danger for coronary occlusion. And there is, we all know this, this data, uh, the experience of the heart team and, uh, and the interventionalist has a major role in uh, preventing coronary occlusion. Uh, in the short summary, we have several tools for the prevention. Uh, the most important thing is to have a very uh, uh, careful uh, pre tavi assessment with the coronary height, the sinus of all of a diameter, the bulk leaflet calcification, uh, any uh, circ coming from the right. There is a, a, a method I'd like to show you is the pre bav testing of the patency of the coronaries. Um, we have some, uh, yeah, the choice of valve can uh, be important in preventing uh, coronary occlusion. Uh, the choice of the valve, the size of the valve we have, we have chosen, and even the depth of implantation where you want to put our valve can help to, to prevent uh, coronary occlusion. And that, then we can uh, decide to go for coronary protection uh, with a guiding catheter, guide wire, balloon, or a stand, or has um, uh, different advantages and disadvantages. The diagnosis is uh, usually very, very fast. Acute hypertension, the ECG, the first thing through a lot of the complications like tamponade and, and bleeding, make a short injection to the aortic root. And in most of the cases, we, we kill, will be able to see very clearly what is um, uh, uh, the background of this problem. So the only real treatment option is the PCI. Um, this is what we have to do as soon as fast as possible. But this is the, the case I'd like to show is, you can see here the bulky, huge calcium on both of the leaflets. And we did a BAB testing. You can see how the valve is moving towards the coronary. 
We made an injection and it became clear that we are safe. We are far away from the left main osteum, which was very difficult to predict. We don't know where exactly the hinge point is uh, 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 at the leaflet. If it were a bit uh, closer, more lateral, probably uh, the left leaflet would have uh, uh, had uh, uh, come closer to the left main. So finally, we implanted the valve and you can see how far we are from the left main. It was not that evident from the CT scan. The case I'd like to show is an 80 year old frail female patient who has um, uh, two cardiac surgeries in the medical history. The second was a replacement of of her uh, aortic valve to uh, sodium freedom 21 millimeter. The patient has recidive GI bleeding, so I did an early closure as well. It has a good ejection fraction, high gradient, and um, we had a significant regurg as well. Uh, we wanted to send this patient to surgery, but after two uh, cardiac uh, open heart surgeries in the medical history, it was clear that the uh, our surgeons uh, refused to, to take this patient. So this is the, uh, the CT and you can see that the coronary height of the left is extremely low, it's like 5.7. And we also measure the length of the leaflet and the, the, the sinuses. It's very easy to imagine what happens if you put a valve in and you unfold um, this long leaflet to the very low uh, osteum of the left main. We had the same on the right side, that, uh, less than eight millimeter was the height of the right coronary artery. The length, the, the length of the calcified leaflet was longer on both sides than the height of the coronaries. So we did an aortic root angio uh, to see what we got to, to check the anatomy. You can see the rigors and the appendage closure device as well. And we decided to put wire and to put a, a stent on both the left and the right, right coronary artery uh, to, pro to, to, to protect it. So this is when we put in the right guiding and the wire and, and we've parked both stands inside, uh, inside of the coronary after checking uh, uh, with the PBAV. The, during the PBAV, we could see clearly that the leaflets are closing, uh, coming extremely close to the osteum. So this was the point when we decided that not only the wire protection, but also we want to have a stand along like a 28 millimeter long stand to both uh, the left and, and, and the right coronary artery. At the point of no recapture, we still had flow, but with some limitation on the left side and a good flow on, on the right. We implanted the valve and we had the same, some limitation on, on the left, the patient was stable and we had a huge regurg towards the left ventricle. So we went for uh, the post dilatation. After post dil, there was only traces of, of regurg. And then we went to assess uh, the coronaries. And here you can see uh, from this projection, which was the LAO cranial, you can clearly see this white one. This is the calcified leaflet that practically covers the ostium. There is only a very small channel which is probably only maintained by, by the wire and, and, and the stand. This is how it looks like if uh, I uh, make it bigger. So we went for um, stand deployment to the left main. This was the deployment of the stand. We did the post dilatation. And the, on the contra NGO, you can see there is a good flow and it opened up completely. We did the same assessment on the right. You can see here uh, outside of uh, the frame, it is this huge calcified native leaflet that ends above the right coronary artery. So we decided to, to stand uh, the osteum of the right as well. We did the same method, POSDIL and the control angio. So finally, the patient had minimal gradient, minimal leak, and was discharged five days after procedure. A couple of weeks later, we did a multi-slide CT to, to check what we, we got. And this is how it looks like on both the left and the left side, the stents are patent. This procedure was done almost three years, more than two and a half years ago, and the patient is still 
degree of symptoms. So in conclusion, I would say that core inclusion is a, a rare but life-threatening complication with high periprocedural mortality despite successful treatment. It's more frequent in older women and with, without any history of cabbage. And it's more likely to have it if you do a valve in valve procedure. The most important anatomical factors are uh, low coronary osteum, shallow sinus of valsalva, and uh, the length and calcium burden of uh, the native leaf, that's also an important factor. Uh, so important, I'd like to draw your attention on the importance of anticipating and preventing the occurrence, because after it happens, we are just trying to, to save the life of uh, the patient. Thank you for your attention. That's a great presentation, Giza. So do you think this uh, presence of the pigtail in the sinus, the coronary sinus, uh, uh, and once the valve is deployed, uh, trying to pull out the pigtail can dislodge some material and embolize it into the coronaries? Does, does that risk happen? Yeah, I think the risk is always there. So this is why um, practically we do all the procedures very similarly with Peter. This is one point where we do we follow dif different steps. Peter always leaves uh, the pigtail in the coronary. I always remove it before the final deployment. I don't see any reason for leaving it there, so I remove it. He yeah. says it gives some extra confidence that you are there, but anyhow, after the valve is deployed, there's not much thing you can do with the height of your, your valve. Very recently, we had a case like um, uh, a week ago when the pigtail got stuck, which was left outside of, uh, of the evolute. So we had a really difficult times removing it, but finally it, it was successful. I never had any case in my practice, uh, not even abroad, when the pigtail that was left outside of uh, the frame made any complication. But um, if there is no reason to leave it there, I just remove it before. I, I agree with Giza that one case which you showed uh, circumflex coming from the right side. Uh, I had one of those complications and it was like uh, the CT was done around 15, 20 days back. By the time the patient was on the table, I forgot that the circumflex is from the right side. So the extra protection that was needed, that wire to be kept in the circumflex pre-hand, that is what is to be done. In case the circumflex is running between the two large vessel, when you place the valve, that is going to compress that and you will get a, a coronary occlusion. I forgot about that. Just deployed the valve later and could not cross the circle. Exactly. So this was an anomalous circle which had yeah. a lower height. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's it's a always a good idea that if you have an anomalous origin artery, always protect the artery with a wire inside the artery. Yes. That assessment will depend on the CT. Yeah. Which you will Complete, do. yeah. Ganesh, uh, comments from you and uh, after this, Manik and... Close, quick comment. Thank you. Here's a lovely presentation, very succinct as usual. Just using Gaze's example that he showed, I think he didn't mention a couple of things that he did there. It looks like, Gaze, you purposely went lower with the valve by doing that. Uh, you then used the natural curvature of the evolute to sit in front of your coronary artery. So people always talk about, oh, if it's a case that's going to have high coronary risk, I would use a balloon expandable because it's easy to access coronary artery. In that patient, if you use a balloon expandable, you almost definitely will occlude the coronary because the left and the right were all below, well below 10 millimeters. I think in those cases, I think it's probably safer to use a self-expanding and something like Evolute, where you do have the natural waste of the Evolute. Uh, the patient was already paced, so it doesn't matter. So I would go probably at 12 millimeters. So you leave the valve a bit much lower than you normally would. That gives you two advantage. One is, less likely to occlude the artery by the frame. But also, when if you have to deploy a stent, the stent is not going to get crushed by the frame of the night knob. No matter what people say, having tunnel stents and chimney stents and all that stents, if it is going to sit in front of your frame, the frame will always win. Your stent will not win. So it's important not to kid yourself. By putting chimney stents and stuff like that, your frame will, get, will crush the stent. So you want to extend sitting in that space one or two millimeters between the austere and the evolute frame, just somewhere in there. 
and that can only happen if you deploy the warp loop otherwise uh, i agree with everything you say guys good job what yeah. would be the best guiding much. catheter shape uh, to tackle uh, coronary occlusion post tower is is anybody working on it uh, any catheter that gets between you and the frame i think <laughs> i that i thought i i've been lucky like gaza i've had three coronary occlusions through my over 3000 plus tavis uh and uh, two of them did not make it one made it the two didn't make it was in not my unit um and uh the one that made it was a lady actually the important thing to remember sorry it, it's not always leaflet that occludes your coronary artery embolization can also cause acute occlusions and the one i had in my unit was uh, valve release blood pressure went down we couldn't work out why st started going up and then i just took a gl35 diagnostic a guide uh, and so get a catheter that you're happy using gl35 is what i tend to use within a frame because it tends to have a bit more maneuverability and there was a distal occlusion of a embolic thing i sucked it up with the export and instantaneous improvement blood pressure instantaneous improvement of uh, uh, settlements stg so it is important to always think about uh, embol- embolic source of uh, occlusion as well So GL35 or JR35. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mathur, if I may ask a question. Yeah, Arun, please. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask you, uh, uh, how likely is it that the patient uh, does not have occlusion of the coronary artery at the table during the time of the procedure, but you have uh, a significant um, rolling up of the leaflets and you feel it is possible they will occlude later. Uh, how often have you seen that? and uh, what to do i saw that you did um, a prophylactic sort of uh, uh, procedure here but uh, how often does it happen this way giza would you like to take that yeah we only have one patient who had coronary occlusion uh, when uh, she was already removed from the table a couple of hours later i think if you have a very narrow sinus and the, the height of the um, the sinus is also a factor that you need to consider Uh, it can happen that you have a delayed coronary occlusion. This is exactly what uh, Dr. Ashok Seth mentioned in his presentation. So if you have a limited flow in the sinuses, it can happen that it gets thrombosed. And if it's not the non-coronary, uh, non-coronary sinus, then you can easily get a coronary occlusion later. It can happen a couple of hours or a couple of days after procedure even. We only have one case like that, but it's a known phenomenon. It can happen. the other area where it can happen sorry is um, in patients where you've released your first valve it pops out and you've left it where it popped out in others is sitting somewhere in the sinus of valsava you haven't pulled it out into the ascending aorta left it there and you plan to a second valve and deploy the second valve within the first valve in the correct position but when you do that the leaflet of the first valve will get pushed out then effectively what you will have is a dacron graft from the annulus all the way to the stj now if the stj is nice and high you may get away with it but most times when you do that a day later a week later or two weeks later they will occlude because the flow in the sinus of valsava is so limited the thrombus will form and the thrombus will migrate and occlude the left main when that happens i'm going to say when because it's not a if when that happens your patient will not survive so if you i mean today with resheetable reposition you should be able to resheet and get it not a zero but one or two millimeters of annular but for whatever reason during post dilatation if the valve does migrate into the aorta please 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 snare the valve pull it into the ascending aorta park it there and deploy your next valve in a correct position do not leave your valve sitting in the sinus of valsava your first valve it will cause a problem I totally agree with Ganesh on this point, and uh, I already faced uh, this problem once. And it's like uh, after your valve mom- uh, embolizes, it, when you pull the valve up and you form a tunnel kind of thing, if you see that the first valve leaflets are still moving, and the second valve leaflet is down, it actually forms that first valve when the blood flow goes above. the diastole feeling is gone because that valve closes so on the table you may not see that the coronaries are getting closed mm-hmm. sluggish flow will be there ecg changes slightly late it starts the solution is either you put in a, a you know stent graft to open the first valve leaflet 
crush it. You can do with a CP stent also, or you have to send the patient to the surgery wherein the surgeon has to open, pull out the first valve. That's the only solution. The second valve remains in place, the patient does well. So we, we want yeah. uh, it's a very basic question to Giza, like what kind of stent that you're choosing in case there's some left coronary occlusion is there and how long you want to come out from the ostium? So try to choose the stent which has uh, the greatest radio force. So this is the only thing uh, we, we try to do. I think at that time it was one of the, the promo stents. And the important thing is to have the proximal part of the stent above the skirt of uh, of the valve. Okay, great. Couple of so things, this... probably. Uh, hi, can I add? Yeah, please. Couple of things for Indian patients. We in general, if we see, we have small sinuses in comparison to the Western world. Our coronary heights are also low. And most of our valves are bicuspid, which, which probably have longer and thicker leaflets. So the chances of coronary occlusion, of course, in Indian scenario, I find it much more uh, common than, uh, uh, than during my fellowship uh, uh, in Europe. That is one thing. Second thing is, if you anticipate such things, please uh, try to analyze pre-CT for co-planner views in which you would be able to see the ostia of the LCA and the RCA. At the same time, your, your, your valve, at least your native valve should be also aligned and your, your ostia should also be aligned, which is typically would be somewhere, you can mark dots on the LCA ostium, two to three dots, and the same can mark be, uh, would be at the, at the native valve. And you can get angles in which you'll be able to align both. So in that, you will be able to clearly see the distance in between your valve frame and your actually aligned valve. So it would be typically in LAO cranial view for LCA. And as Dr. Giza had shown, it would be probably in lateral view for RCA. And, and third thing is if you are planning, you should have a low threshold for coronary protection if you're going in such cases. At the same time, it's a good idea to use guideliner along with a guiding catheter and, and your wire because because sometimes if you are if you are uh, trying to you know decide that okay this doesn't require stenting then probably sometimes it is difficult to get the the, the stent out because because the stent frame as as uh, Dr. Ganesh said there would be very less space in between the aortic valve and the frame so so your, the two things your guiding should be unhooked but of course it should be very near to the ostia and second probably a guideliner with a guide with a, with a wire if you decide to take it sent out would be helpful. Dr. Mathur, I'd like to add something here. Pradeep, yes, this yeah. is Pradeep. Yes, so uh, we were looking at our TBD data. This is not published. It will be coming out soon. 30-day mortality in a low-risk patient post-tavor is going four times higher than inpatient mortality. So the inpatient mortality is 0.4% in low risk in the U.S. TBD registry for the last year, and at 30 days goes to 1.6%. So something late is happening, very remarkable. So either it's a conduction disturbance or it's a late coronary occlusion is our hypothesis. And uh, as mentioned, it's a sinus flow issue sometimes. You know, the sinuses are small, maybe they form thrombus and close coronaries. So at least at our center, uh, whether right or wrong, we're trying to anticoagulate these suspected patients who visually we think that, okay, this is a shallow sinus, bulky leaflet calcium. Uh, we try to give them three months of anticoagulation. What do you give? What do you use? Anything, either NOAC or Coumadin or e either one. Okay. But And time will tell whether that's the right strategy or not, but it's uh, just to keep these low risk patients. Yeah, that's interesting data. That's any more comments or we'll move to the next uh, Rupa? Oh, just one, more, one comment. Yes. Just remember that if you, are, if you have a patient who you're really, really worried, really, really worried about coronary occlusion, you can use the silica technique at the moment. It is complex. It's got very little data, but it, it will potentially minimize your risk by lacerating uh, the, you know, the left coronary, right coronary Leaflets, and there's a company I'm working with now who have produced a early phase of doing it very much easier, where they actually uh, have a device that goes in pre tavi and, you know, just cuts, cuts the leaflets into two pieces. Uh, I think when that happens, we will, this kind of talks will be historical, I guess, but, uh, but until then, you need to be careful. Fully agree. The silica works very well. 
only issue is it's a little bit tricky to do, yeah. uh, but it's very, very effective. One, one thing I want to highlight is uh, there's always a little confusion between balloon expandable and a self-expanding valve. It's always important to em emphasize on the fact that it is the frame of the, I mean, it is not the frame of the valve, but it is the native leaflet, which, and, and the sinuses of valsalva, which will give rise to coronary occlusion during tower. There's a lot of confusion between coronary occlusion and coronary reaccess after tower. So uh, whether it's a balloon expandable or a self-expanding valve, the rates of coronary occlusion or the risk of coronary occlusion is almost going to be same depending on the uh, anatomy rather than the type of the valve, as actually, far as the occlusion is concerned. Actually, it's slightly higher with, with balloon expandable yeah. uh, yeah. for, yeah. for coronary occlusion acutely in whatever register we have. So. Yes. Self-expanding would, uh, especially Evolute, would have less chance because, it's you know, it, is, it has a waste. So probably waste. Yes. there's a space, as Kanesh said. So but traditionally, I would say probably Evolute will have a lesser chance of coronary Occlusion. Of course, once it occludes, probably putting stents might be slightly more challenging, but your risk would be lesser. And if, if you can probably, as he suggested, if you can probably land the land slightly lower, then your chances, I mean, uh, it's it, uh, you don't have to be too low, but of course, you have some sp more space for, for manipulation. Thank you very much, uh, all of you in this. Uh, we'll move forward to the next uh, presentation, which is again on coronary, how to deal with the low coronaries. So Amit Chaurasia is a young uh, structural heart interventionist, not very young in his work. I just uh, wanted to uh, have a lot of discussion again. It's, it's, a, it's a case, but uh, in between we'll discuss on each slide because this, uh, this is one slide, uh, one case which will teach us more about coronary occlusion than any other case I think. So due to iotopathy, what happens is either the, uh, the right coronary artery moves low or the left coronary artery moves higher in the case of bicuspid aortic valve generally. These are the normal things for uh, coronary occlusion, so I'm not going to move into it. If you think about uh, coronary occlusion in valve in valve, then the position of the surgical valve plays a great role, whether you're, uh, it is intraannular or is it a supraannular. In a supraannular placed uh, valve, uh, the coronary height obviously decreases and there is a chance of a uh, lot of occlusion. I wanted to specifically bring out this point. While you are doing a BAV, while you are doing a BAV to loop into coronary occlusion, where should the pigtail be? If your pigtail is right into the sinus, when you inject it with the balloon inflated, both the coronaries are going to fee, uh, fill in very because it's because the contrast is in the sinus of vessel bar, and that is going to fill the coronaries anyway. So what you need to do is pull back the pigtail into the ascending aorta above your balloon and then inject. And then that is going to give you the right idea whether this coronary is going to get closed or not. That is another important point I would like to highlight uh, uh, so let me just come down to my presentation, 75 years old female, AVR 12 years back with a 20 millimeter uh, Edward Perry Mount valve, very sick patient, uh, already uh, had a lot of uh, other issues, turned down for surgery, uh, the plan was to do a TAVA in this patient. You can see this is the internal diameter, for a 20 millimeter, the internal diameter will be something like 19 millimeter for it. The sinus of SLY, you can see it's very narrow for a 23 uh, millimeter valve, we need at least 25. And this is uh, only 125, you can see on the right side, non and everything is less than even 24. The ascending aorta diameter, uh, the LVOT diameter is quite roomy, but the ascending aorta again uh, is uh, very much, uh, STJ diameter is very much uh, uh, narrow for the valve. Let's look at the coronary height. The coronary height on the left, it is just 4.3 millimeter. On the right, it is 8.7 millimeter. So uh, these are the deploying angle, just to stop over here and ask like, uh, what would be your strategy for this patient? Can I, I think Ganesh? Dr. Dr. Ganesh? Any, can comment, any comment on, on that? 
Uh, what valve is this again? Sorry, I missed that one. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Edward Perimont. Okay, so um, the Perimont being an in, uh, intra-inlet valve and also the leaflets being within the frame has much lower risk of causing corneal occlusion. Um, and if I think if there's any doubt, I will uh, lacerate the leaflet. Uh, I certainly will not pre or post delay. Uh, and uh, I'll pick a valve like a Evolute and go a bit low. Patient looks like he's already been paced. So. Okay, thank you, Ganesh. Uh, Pradeep, Pradeep, any, any idea about it? Yes, uh, so this is definitely concerning, right? So if you measure the valve to coronary distance, you would most likely be under four millimeters here, which would be a risk for uh, coronary occlusion. Okay, this is the valve to coronary distance. Uh, on, the, uh, on the left side, it is 1.7. On the right side, it is three millimeter. Yes, yeah, so the minimum required valve to four. coronary distance is four millimeter. Uh, for the corner is not getting closed. Yeah, so we would we would do double basilica on this. And Manik. So so uh, honestly, I'm not trained with basilica, so I would definitely pr protect with wire and stents. So what would be a valve choice? It would be evolute. Uh, why evolute and why not? Probably you said it is uh, it is uh, it is twenty or maybe it would be nineteen or twenty one because the internal diameter would be really very low. I would be really concerned about the gradients, and I I really don't think that uh, uh, it would be of any benefit to to put uh, to put a intra annular valve uh, thinking that it would give you a uh, less chance of uh, coronary obstruction because everything is below the level of valve frame. So, so it doesn't, doesn't change anything. Mehta, sir. Uh, Giza, this is a very low coronary height. Le right side, it is 3.8. Left side, it is 8. Point, uh, right, left is 3.8. Right is 8.3. Uh, VTC is just uh, 1.7 in uh, the left side. Right side, it is uh, 3. Previous valve is a uh, perimount Edward. What, it, what would be your choice in this case? Giza, that's a question to you. Yeah. Would you unmute? Yeah. I, would, I would go for Evolute. I would implant it a bit deeper to have the waist in, in front of the coronary ostium. And uh, I would definitely put a wire, at least a wire in the coronaries. But probably I would also park two stands in the left and the right coronary as well. OK, so what was my thinking I'm just uh, going to uh, tell uh, in some time. So this is the valve that we are looking at. Uh, already a perimount valve is there, even if it is not there, when you put in a, uh, when you put in a self-expanding valve, what you need to understand is where is your uh, new sinus of vesselva going to be? If your new sinus of vesselva is going to be above the coronaries, then access to the coronaries is going to be difficult later on if you suddenly close up the coronaries or something like that. So whenever you are planning a case with a, a very low coronary height, you always try to make the new sinus uh, below the coronary, the native coronaries. And uh, that's the concept. So what I thought in this case, okay, I'm going to uh, take an injection while I do the uh, BAV in this case see if the coronaries are going to get closed or not. In any case, I'm going to protect both the coronaries with the wire and the artery, arteries. Also put the stent, pre-stent, uh, pre, uh, uh, put the stent into both the arteries. And in case uh, the coronaries closes off, then I'm going to uh, pull back. And I would not take a, a balloon expandable in this because the STJ height is also low. And if you are going to put a balloon expandable valve and you close off the whole STG segment with the, with the skirt of the balloon expandable valve, then it is a disaster. You cannot access the coronaries. Or in case you have not aligned the, uh, the struts of the valve properly, then also it's a disaster. You may not access the coronaries at all. So just let me show what I did. This is the left corner. And another 
a good uh, thinking i'll just uh, show you if you see this stent pole the coronary somehow seems slightly above this stent pole so this is where analyzing the ct also uh, gives a good insight into what you are going to do on the right side slightly it is coming towards the lower pole so anyway the plan was decided so what i decided is that started with the coronary angiogram on both the sides this is checking of the valve put in a wire on both the uh, on both the coronaries did a bav and saw that both the coronaries are well flowing the risk was low but still uh, i decided that okay i am going to deploy the valve and check in again my first deployment the high uh, the uh, it was just around two millimeter or one millimeter below the uh, perimount valve so what i did is uh, uh, that is not the ideal case in this case i wanted from the new uh, sinus below so i decided to put it slightly low and the second attempt i cap captured and just put it below after that i took an injection to see both the coronaries are flowing so after the coronaries were flowing i waited for some time to see if the if the stent expands if the valve expands completely what is going to happen and i saw that the coronaries were flowing well i just pulled back both the uh, both the stents and there was no coronary occlusion at all so the learning is always uh, look into the leaflet we have already discussed that length of the leaflet if it is more than the height of the coronary the chance of coronary occlusion is always higher annulus to coronary ostia distance that is another point that you need to look at length of the valve leaflet we have already discussed the width of the sinus of vessel bar uh, if it is very wide sinus of vessel bar the chance of coronary occlusion is always less the height of the stz if it is very high like more than 15 then the chance of coronary occlusion is always less but if it is less than 15 you should always think that okay it's better to protect and go ahead movement of the leaflet during balloon atrial valvotomy and that giza has very well shown that where is your leaflet reaching up to if the leaflet has a chunk of calcium on the tip of the leaflet that leaflet is going to fall back onto the coronaries because uh, of the venturi effect while the coronaries are being filled the potency of the uh, the expanded height of the intended valve that we have already discussed and in a valve in a valve whether it is a supraannular or a intraannular valve the vtc for tavar in saver that is if you are doing a, a valve in a valve always look for the vtc but at the same time analyze your ct yourself seeing what is what is going to happen where is the stent pole where you are going to end and these are the things that will help you in uh, actually preventing the coronary occlusion during the case thank you any questions Excellent case. Very nice, Amit. This is challenging. So, uh, Ganesh? Uh... Just one, uh, two comments. One, I think just to uh, reiterate what Dr. Mehta has already brought up. Um, when you're using balloon pre-dilatation to assume that the corneas are going to be patent, it will not be, uh, I don't think it's the correct way of doing it. Number one, most of us now undersize our pre-dilatation balloon. So, it'll give you an artificial reassurance to think that the corneas look great. But your, the valve will be at least 20% bigger than the balloon. And then you may end up with something that's not too great. Um, I certainly will not, at least in my practice, I don't do pre dilatation of a surgical valve because they usually will fracture the small pieces and significantly increase the risk of uh, stroke. And I think when you're doing a valve in valve, there is a very, very clear difference between a paramount, which is a, where the leaflets are mounted internally to the frame, versus a mitral flow or a trifactor where the surgical leaflet is mounted on the outside of the frame. I think if this valve was a mitral floor or trifecta, uh, you would have had a most likely a right cornea occlusion uh, because that's why it's the smallest. And because of this is a paramount, the frame actually protects the patient in that the surgical frame will stop your valve expanding any more than it needs. Uh, and which is why I think you were able to get away without having any cornea occlusion. But really good points to bring up. Thank you, Ganesh, for that uh, last point in which we had not discussed uh, whether the uh, leaflet is uh, 
inner side or outside until now and that is another a good point which uh, should be discussed if it is the outer post leaflet then the chance of coronary occlusion is always going to be higher than in an inner post the inner post maybe the leaflet will be always inside the pool itself and may not fall back so much so that is what exactly we discussed in the morning the type of the valve which is very important that what type of the surgical valve has been used previously so because if you know that you can always plan it better and then you can do that otherwise the disaster to happen thank you thank you so much excellent presentation thank you very much uh, any more comments uh, we'll move to the next session and uh, um, just, just one thing probably uh, to pradeep if you can answer uh, uh, if if in, in such a case where things are really borderline and you have put on wire and and a stent and your coronaries are flowing well what is your criteria of i mean how do you decide whether you are going to retrieve or whether you are going to deploy the stent because in most of the times you know these stents and wires they sort of uh, they tend to push your deep leaflets on the side and and you are not really sure how they are going to behave when you take them out so how do you do about it in general i would say that probably i would have low threshold for stenting running that's an excellent point and that's always the dilemma right like is this wire and stent just keeping the leaflet away and as soon as you pull it out it will close and then you won't be able to go back so a little bit is a tactile feedback like try to pull the stent back and forth and see what kind of resistance are you getting and uh, obviously be on the side of caution and on the side of caution that if you're feeling a lot of resistance it's it's tricky then maybe deploy it as our strategy okay Nesh, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. But it's a it's a very nuanced. Uh, it's one of the dark arts of Tavi. It's, uh, it's there's no science, there's no data, there's no evidence. Uh, there is my feel. You know, I think the my 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 advice is this: just once everything looks good, if there's something behind you telling you mm, this just does not look good enough. just deploy the stent it's it's far safer because uh, if that patient occludes a week later is that she the patient is dead they will not survive so maybe we, a lot late coronary occlusion patients we don't know yeah i think some of these patients who die at week 2 week 5 uh, found dead at home either they are arrhythmic uh, or coronary occlusion or they could be late uh, aortic dissection i've had one that came back 3 weeks later with a type a dissection Now, I'm not sure whether Stavi induced or was spontaneous, but that patient did not did not survive. She was not a surgical patient, and she died uh, within 48 hours of being admitted in the hospital. So, yeah, thankfully, we've spent a lot of time talking about this. Thankfully, they are rare. This coronary occlusion is a rare, 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 rare episode. So, rare, but a nightmare when it happens. It's a disaster. So, if you're oh, worried about thinking about it, maybe protect it, like Amit. You know. Well, if there was any doubt, just upfront protected some way. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, it was an excellent session. I should say uh, we had a great discussion about a lot of uh, things, and uh, thank you for all such a great presentation, and thank you for the interaction. Uh, I think we move on to the next session, sir. Yes. Uh, so uh, thank you very much to our. panelists and the experts on this session and i would uh, request dr praveer and dr amit to stay on and uh, also would like to invite uh, dr uh, vishal batra dr rajnish malhotra please and uh, dr vijay sinha to uh, please join us atul can i just take off i'd like to thank you and all of you for inviting me to be part of this meeting it's it's uh, mm-hmm. it's been an amazing meeting and uh, thank you for inviting me and making me part of it hopefully the next one i'll be having uh, some dosa and idli breakfast with you and similarly for lunch definitely thank you. we look forward to that ganesh <laughs> thank you very thank much you, ganesh bye bye thank you everybody yeah <laughs> great night. and uh, online i think we'll be joined by dr mirwat alasnang Uh, Dr. John Jones is there. Dr. Azim Latib will be joining us very soon, and Dr. Lars Sondergaard will be joining us in this presentation. The Dr. Lars is already there. He's joined us with us. So welcome, Dr. Lars. And thank uh, you. Most of the most of the people uh, in this part of the world are aware of your exploits uh, in the cath lab, and uh, 
We'll start with a presentation from uh, Dr. John Joes. So John Joes is a professor in CMC Valor, and we'd request you, John, to please uh, share your presentation. And uh, he's going to show us a case of a tricuspid and a pulmonary valve intervention. So over to you, John. Hello. Uh, is, uh, thank you, Dr. Mathur. Is my screen uh, visible? Am I audible? Yeah, you're visible and your screen is... Yeah. Thank you. So I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Okay. Mathur for this uh, opportunity and for an informative and excellently conducted workshop. So I'm a specialist in structural heart disease and uh, responsible for the percutaneous valve program at CMC Valor. We started uh, with TAVI in 2017, and now we do uh, replacement of all four heart valves percutaneously. Uh, so today I'd like to share a couple of uh, cases of uh, pulmonary and uh, tricuspid valve implantation done at our center. So I I'll begin with uh, pulmonary valve implantation. So essentially there are three situations in which uh, you would want to consider transcathetic pulmonary valve implantation. They are uh, dysfunctional right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit as uh, in most cases of uh, TOF. Uh, second is dysfunctional surgically placed bioprosthetic valve. And lastly, in patients with uh, patch repaired petrology fallow or even native valve. Uh, so as you can see, most patients who require pulmonary artery replaced, pulmonary valve replacement belong to the patch repaired one, about 85% of them. So, so these patients who have a patch uh, repaired RBO, they usually have a large anatomy, as you can see in this couple of patients. The analysts are uh, usually more than 29 mm, and uh, they often present late. So which means that uh, they require a large size valve, and most conventional valves like Melody and Sapien 3 are uh, not suitable for them. On the other hand, uh, country patients, they tend to have smaller anatomies because most of these patients have the procedure done in their uh, early childhood. So in this case, you can see the country size is about 12 millimeter, which is out of uh, the lower size range for the melody valve. So these are the challenges for uh, transcathetic pulmonary valve uh, implantation. So moving on to the cases. So my first patient is that of a middle-aged lady who had an intracardiac repair with the transcendental patch about 45 years ago. Now she presents with uh, uh, class three shortness of breath and fatigue. She's also hypertensive. She's a diabetic as well. And she also has hypothyroidism. Her body weight is on the lower side, 48 kilogram. Clinically, she has signs of uh, significant pulmonary regurgitation. ECG shows uh, long QRS interval. On CT scan, you find that RGOT is quite uh, huge, you know, uh, calcification directly beneath the sternum and also on the outer curvature of the uh, outer tract, which means that uh, uh, you know, can have uh, challenges during both surgery as well as during. Uh, interventional uh, pulmonary valve replacement. And the other thing you notice is that there's no clear waste, which means there's no clear landing zone for uh, uh, deploying a valve in this patient. So MRI criteria wise, our patient was quite uh, suitable for a transcathetic pulmonary valve implantation. Morphology wise also, it was an ideal candidate. Uh, these were her uh, dimensions of the right ventricular uh, function and patient fraction and the dimensions. So uh, we discussed the option for the patient. We had a heart team meet and it was decided that we would uh, attempt a transcathetic pulmonary valve implantation. So these are the key steps uh, to consider when you do a transcathetic procedure. Uh, we would want to do an EP study. If there are any RBOT arrhythmias, we wanted to update them prior to deploying a valve. Most patients uh, can be done to local anesthesia. Some patients would require general anesthesia. Procedure can be done to the transfemoral or the transtubular route. Uh, after measuring the pressures, the next step would be to do an angiogram into orthogonal projections. Usually, we do angiogram in the lateral and RAO cranial projection. If you have a, a over the wire angiographic catheter like a multi track or a uh, ward, uh, you can always maintain the wire position throughout the procedure. So, uh, we do pre dilatation mainly for balloon sizing in this case, and we also want to look for any coronary or aortic root compression. Uh, large anatomies like this, uh, we would, uh, without any waste, we would uh, ideally do a pre-standing. Uh, pre-standing is also uh, done in smaller size uh, conduits. And it's very important that you choose the correct valve size uh, in these patients. And post-procedure, if the gradient is more than 20 millimeter mercury, we would uh, definitely do a uh, post-dilatation. 
So here is the angiogram of the patient. You can clearly see that PR is quite uh, uh, significant in both the uh, lateral as well as the uh, uh, shallow areopharyngeal view. This is the balloon compression testing. Uh, you can note that the balloon is quite large. The anatomy is quite huge, uh, even larger than the aorta. And there is no aortic or uh, uh, coronary compression here on balloon dilatation and simultaneous injection. Uh, the waist of the balloon measured about uh, 30 to 31 millimeter. So this essentially means that uh, uh, you can't use melody or the sapien 3 for this patient. You're left with the uh, venous P or the myvalve, which is uh, available for large size anatomies. So uh, uh, we decided to pre stent for this patient. For pre stenting, we took an anterior accessible stent uh, using a 32 mm balloon. Initially, we attempted uh, pre stenting the uh, from the transfemoral road. Uh, problem with the transfemoral and dilated RV is that uh, there are a lot of tortuosities, tortuosities and uh, because of the calcium on the outer curvature, it's quite difficult to drag the stents or even the valve uh, from the transfemoral road. So we switched immediately to the uh, jugular road, the body in French shape, and then we were able to easily pass the anterior stent and uh, deploy it in the RVOT region. And after deploying it, we realized that this heart in waste, which means that uh, if you deploy the valve in the same procedure, there's a chance that the valve could embolize. So we gave an interval of six weeks, and after which we took a 32 ml my valve, we took about five to six uh, ml additional volume, uh, so that the uh, valve would uh, uh, be stable and would not embolize during deployment. And again, we found that uh, uh, the my valve, uh, even though it's got this uh, deflectable uh, knob and all that, uh, still it couldn't uh, uh, enter the pre stent easily. It was quite a bit of a struggle. Uh, so then we also uh, changed the wire position in the, both the pulmonary arteries. And eventually we took a uh, balloon and inflated it parallel to the valve. And we were able to uh, take the uh, valve inside the piston and the stent. So uh, when you are uh, deploying a pulmonary valve, we always make sure that the uh, uh, it is actually easier to pull the valve during deployment than to push it during deployment. So we make sure that the valve position is slightly higher in the pre stand and then uh, you deploy under rapid tracing. So uh, at the end of the procedure, the uh, patient had no parabellar leaks, ratings were less than 10 million mercury, and at uh, one year follow up, she's doing quite well. And this is uh, on X-ray how large this valve uh, actually looks. And this is a follow-up X-ray. So moving to the next case, this is actually a live in-box case, which we did the, in last week. This is a patient, 21-year-old uh, lady, who had a rastily procedure with the 18 mm valve sent you uh, continue for a DRP, VSD, permeable hypertension, diagnosed at the age of uh, uh, four years. Uh, in last year, she presented to us with complaints of progressive fatigue and dyspnea. As you can see, she's also a low body weight and uh, low BMI patient. Clinically, she had moderate pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary regurgitation. ECG again showed the uh, white QRS, more than 150 milliseconds. On echocardiography, again, moderate pulmonary stenosis and moderate pulmonary regurgitation. Quite a bit of uh, CVR, uh, uh, TR, and the ventricular functions were actually normal. On a CT scan, we can we found the country was quite uh, narrow at one point with a heavy lot of uh, uh, calcium on one side. The smallest dimension was about uh, 8.5 uh, millimeter. And uh, again, on the lateral view, you can see uh, quite a bit of uh, calcification in the country. You to uh, MRI wise, uh, dimension wise, she was a candidate for a transcatheter valve. Uh, uh, this is an angiography. Pulmonary angiography again shows uh, significant uh, pulmonary regurgitation in both the uh, views. So this is this procedure was actually done in 2020 last year. Uh, this was significant gradient. We directed with an 18 mm balloon. She was not uh, ready for the implant procedure at that time. And we also did a uh, uh, integration of the aortic root and the coronaries at that time. There was no operation of uh, the coron both the coronaries or the root at that time. And the final plan was to implant a 20 mm valve uh, subsequently. So for this case, we did, uh, we did a, uh, I'll skip past the introductions and go to the procedure. So all the valve procedures we do under uh, 
uh, functions under ultrasound guidance. The, the sheet triggers are uh, almost identical to the tabby. First, you need uh, 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 one side for the device and the other side for the pigtail. And in, in case you need a temporary pacing, a rapid pacing, you can use the another venous uh, sheet on the other side. The steps would include uh, uh, crossing the, the country. Usually, uh, we take a multi, multi, multi purpose catheter with a thermo hydrophilic glide wire. Crossing is quite easy in most cases. So we want to make sure that the wire is as distal as possible in a lower uh, pulmonary artery branch as possible. Some operator takes the left pulmonary artery, but uh, we find that the right uh, uh, lower pulmonary artery posterior branch gives a very good uh, support for these procedures. So once that is done, uh, uh, we again uh, do a pulmonary angiogram to make sure uh, to see if the PR has progressed. As you can see, the PR is quite significant here. You can also see the narrowing in the country in the AP view. So once that is done, uh, we get a stiff wire, lumbricus in this case, that is still lower uh, right pulmonary artery branch. And then we do a uh, balloon dilatation. Initially, we took an 18 mm balloon and we upgraded it to 20 mm balloon. That there's no coronary compression. So uh, once that is done, uh, 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 we do the measurements again on uh, cat. The the smallest measurement was about 14, which means that uh, uh, you cannot take a valve more than 20 millimeter. Remember, this is a small sized uh, uh, body weight patient, so the 20 mm valve would be all right for the hemodynamic needs of this uh, patient. So that's the sheet for the uh, MyVal, the Python sheet. Passing the valve uh, in a conduit like this is uh, quite uh, uh, easy. And uh, most cases, uh, in a smaller anatomy, you don't need rapid pacing. But if you're uh, implanting a valve in a large batch repaired uh, and, uh, anatomy, you need rapid pacing. Can see uh, see the calcium on the medial aspect here quite a heavy build up of calcium in the country so uh, we make sure the uh, position is very good in both the lateral as well as the epicranial views and uh, for cases like this uh, biplane lab is quite uh, useful so the valve did not uh, expand as expected because of the calcium. So we added additional volume and did a post dilatation. In case you are using a, uh, a very large size valve uh, than required, you should actually do a pre stenting with a covered stent. Oh, okay. And these are the uh, final angiography post deployment of the valve. Mitral annular calcification. No PR. Hello. Huh. And uh, no significant gradient across the valve. So for closing, uh, for uh, uh, for access uh, uh, vessel closure, we, uh, two strategies. One can be a prelate uh, proglide, or you can actually use a uh, figure of eight uh, sutures also. So this patient was discharged a couple of days ago. She's also doing well. So now I will uh, show you a couple of cases of uh, uh, tricuspid valve implantation at the time for uh, mix. This is a 37-year-old patient who had uh, Epstein's anomaly and she had a tenacious repair with the Duran ring. Duran is a semi-rigid ring uh, way back in 2012. 2015, she also had a pacemaker for second-degree symptomatic heavy block. And she came to us in uh, August 2020. At that time, the lead, pacemaker lead was infected. There was a huge vegetation. Uh, blood cultures uh, grew Bartholdry as apasia. And uh, she was started on long term antibiotics of uh, uh, probably about uh, uh, six weeks or more. And uh, after which, uh, the bleeds and vegetations were extracted. And she also had uh, pulmonary thrombobolism, probably from the infected uh, uh, vegetation from the valve. 
from from the ring and uh, uh, Kanye our trained doctor director me also was done. And at the end of the procedure, she also had a uh, surgical procedure. She had a femoral axis uh, lymphatic leak, and uh, that was also repaired. So this is the CT of the patient. Duran 31 has an internal dimensions of uh, close to uh, 30.5 or 32. Uh, but in our patient, we found that uh, it uh, was actually quite plicated, uh, which means the ring's uh, dimensions came quite down. And on CT, the lowest dimension was about 18 with an average diameter of uh, 20.7. So normally for a 31 mm Duran, you would uh, ideally put a 32 mm, uh, at least a 30.5 or a 32 mm valve. Uh, but in this case, we're not sure because of the plication whether the ring would expand uh, during valve uh, implantation. So uh, our strategy was to serially uh, dilate the valve uh, to increase the size uh, in order to uh, take at least a 30.5 uh, mm uh, my valve. And this was the appearance of the ring on fluoroscopy. You can see a lot of uh, plications as well. Crossing the uh, ring was again quite easy with the multipurpose and the uh, hydrophilic light wire. So once that is done, the next step is to do a pre-dilatation. And uh, during pre-dilatation, we found that actually there's not uh, just a constriction at the base at the ring, but there's also a uh, constriction at the plicated uh, uh, leaf effect is a little uh, uh, effectively. So we decided to do a balloon sizing using Amplast's sizing balloon, and the waist of the balloon was quite small, 14. So subsequently, we did a serial pre-dilatation with a 23, 25, and uh, eventually a 28 mm cement balloons. So once that was done, we again looked at the morphology. It not changed much, but uh, the dimensions maybe marginally it uh, went up uh, with all the serial uh, dilatations. So nevertheless, we thought uh, uh, this is a big ring and we want to take the biggest possible uh, valve for this patient. So this patient had an epicardial pacing lead and we connected it to a, a pulse generator for rapid pacing. Alternatively, uh, uh, for tricuspid valve uh, implantation, you could uh, uh, pace uh, from the coronary sinus or from the right atrium, or even you could uh, uh, place a lead directly in, inside the left ventricle for rapid pacing. So this is the final uh, result for this patient, no TR, and the valve is actually got a good uh, uh, circular shape. And follow-up CT, again, a very good uh, uh, circular shape on, on CT, uh, well-expanded valve, and uh, this patient is also uh, doing well, is symptomatic at uh, five months follow-up. So I'll end my presentation here, and uh, this is the team uh, who works with me at CMC Valor, and I'd like to thank my team also for all the support for all the transcriptive valve cases we performed here. Thank you all. Excellent case presentations, uh, John. Ravinder, uh, can I ex uh, request you to make a quick comment on this two cases which he has shown? Unmute yourself, please. Yeah. So, so I think I, I think those were excellent cases, sir, and. Uh, uh, John has rightly pointed out that uh, doing a transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation, the sizing, the coronary uh, origin of coronary arteries, ruling out an anomalous coronary artery, and uh, with especially uh, my valve and sapien, you have more choices uh, to implant in the RVOT and pulmonary artery position compared to the melody valve. Lars, okay. uh, do you do you do you also uh, have an experience with the tricuspid valve interventions? Okay. There we go. Yeah, only as a, a valve in valve or valve in ring procedure, uh, not in native tricuspid valves. Even though it's been now been described, as you know. So uh, let okay. me just yeah. put a question to everybody over here. Uh, in the first case, uh, John, you had uh, used five mm extra contrast in a thirty-two mm valve. Yeah. So the, my question is like, uh, uh, how does the leaflet actually react to that? Because you are expanding the valve frame, yeah. not natural to what the company says. Number two, what about the structural deterioration of the leaflet that will occur with 5 mm extra contrast? Number three, what about the long-term co-optation of this leaflet 
that's uh, that because you have used 5 mm extra contrast how is the coaptation going to react over a long time yeah so essentially for any valve and valve uh, implantations uh, with a balloon expandable valve inside the heart uh, you need to take this additional volume it doesn't mean that the whole volume will go in because you need that much volume to make sure at least the nominal volume goes in uh, because some of these prosthetic valves are quite uh, tough especially with stenos to inflate that's the whole that's the whole idea and what we realized with this my well uh, case we did uh, with a 32 mm valve we actually inflated it outside the body with this extra volume and uh, we found that uh, uh, there was no uh, uh, damage even at that extra volume uh, to the palpitation or uh, to the leaflet uh, as such and uh, this particular patient uh, uh, she's she's uh, been following us up with us for the last one and a half years and uh, so far we have not uh, seen any degree of stenosis or regurgitation in this valve no uh, we'll, uh, certainly we'll have to wait for the long term follow up lars uh, your comment on this I think it's a good comment, but I don't think that um, it's going to damage the leaflets to, to do this inflation with extra volume in, but, but in, you have probably to do some bench testing and see how much you can over inflate this stent uh, and still have co-optation of the leaflet. We know for the melody valve, you can go up to 24 millimeter. It's, not, it's recommended 22, but 24 is still going to, to have co-optation. If you exceed 24, you're going to have a sensor leak. So. I think that's, as you said, very important to keep in mind that uh, if you exceed uh, these numbers, you can potentially have a regurgitation as an outcome. Ravindra? So uh, I think that's, uh, those are very valid points, but we have learned from the balloon expandable valves that even if you are doing, uh, like said, say 29 millimeter CPNC, some large annulus, which are almost 800 and 850, uh, you can add additional five cc's and uh, uh, Dr. Yadav and Dr. Sondergaard are there. There is no central regurgitation which happens. So my valve offers an additional advantage of those extra large sizes, but I think we'll have to wait uh, for long-term results. And as rightly pointed out, do some bench testing that how much can it be stretched before leaflets lose the coaptation. It's just one question, John. I wanted to ask uh, regarding the first case of pulmonary valve implantation. I mean. Uh, regarding the amount of calcium which was there with the conduit, would you really consider pre-stenting with a covered stent? Because what would be a strategy, you know, if if there was a rupture uh, uh, post post deployment of MyWell twenty? Yeah. So uh, if the conduit, so uh, uh, normally if I'm going to upsize it uh, uh, by a very large amount, like uh, once we had a patient with a twelve mm conduit. And uh, this was actually a poor surgical candidate. And uh, I thought um, uh, we could uh, get it up to 10 dm on my valve by serial dilatation. Uh, so in such kind of uh, situation, if, I, if I'm going to exceed the size by at least four to six, uh, the largest you can go is like uh, six mm or one and a half times. Uh, so in such cases, I would always pre stand with a covered stem. But for an 18 mm and a 20 mm, the chances of rupture are actually quite uh, less. Uh, my concern was with using a covered stent within this 18 mm already classified narrow uh, country was that I would reduce the internal dimension much further. And this may not be good uh, for the patient hemodynamics wise. That, that's the reason why we not uh, uh, use a covered uh, free stent. Is your patient on an anticoagulation? Your thoughts, Lars? Yeah, I agree. There's two main main concerns I, in the pulmonary position. One is uh, occlusion of the coronary arteries, and the other one is um, rupture of the conduit. We know this complication is related with a very high mortality rate. So it's a valid point, uh, Manik. I think if you have any concern about the rupture, put a cover stand in. Of course, that's going to mean that you cannot do a balloon testing of uh, compression of the coronary arteries uh, first, because it can also rupture during that. So for these patients, if, if I have concern about um, conduit rupture and I also have concern about uh, coronary arteries, I pass these patients on to the surgeons. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And we'll move to the next presentation by Dr. Ravinder Rao from Jaipur, you know, who's, who's a known personality. And today, Ravinder is going to show his new passion, uh, mitral, mitral clip clays, step by step. We are were, we were going to have Ravinder over here physically. He missed his morning flight, so now he's forced to do it virtually. 
Uh, can you see my slides, sir? Yes, we can see your slides clearly and hear you. Good, good evening, and thank you very much, sir. You always have been a great encouragement uh, for all us. And you know, I, I apologize that I'm not there. I wish I was there. Uh, in India, we are starting with the Mitra clip. Uh, we don't have as much experience as in Europe and as well as in US. Uh, so I'm just going to share a few initial cases and initial experiences, and all the inputs from the experts will help us to educate. So a 72-year-old patient, post-CABG, post-AICD, NYHA class 3, CKD, maximal medical therapy, and class 4 heart failure. So the maximal medical therapy is very important because two trials, MITRIFR and the COAP trial, clearly showed that if the patient falls into the COAP criteria, that patient is going to do better compared to a patient who falls into MITRIFR trial. So this is a patient who is, on, who is on maximum medical therapy. And this is what we have seen in a clinical practice. You see the patient in OPD, severe MR. Uh, you call this patient after one month for a TE and you have put this patient on medical therapy. After one month, the MR goes down uh, to say, let us, let us say one plus or two plus. Most important thing is we need to understand the anatomy and the mitral regurgitation. So we need to understand the uh, TE anatomy. What is A2, P2, what is A1, P1? what is A3, P3, and we need to understand our views at zero degree, at uh, bicommercial view, LVOT view, and we need to understand the location of the septal puncture, which is going to happen on the septum. So in a four-chamber view, I'm not going to go into detail of that, but in a four-chamber view, if the aortic valve is closed, you see A2, P2, aortic valve is open, A1, P1, and you go inside, it is A3, P3. So here you can clearly see this patient has got mitral regurgitation. But one more important thing which I want to highlight is in the COAP trial, the inclusion uh, was MR based on transthoracic echo and not on transesophageal echo. Once the uh, anatomy is assessed, and this is the BICOM view, once you assess the full anatomy, uh, and the, the, the reason if you don't understand where is the uh, mitral regurgitation appearing from, then pushing the clip and directing the clip will be difficult. This is the pulmonary vein uh, assessment. Uh, very important that the mitral valve area should be more than uh, four centimeters square in Indian population, especially uh, because we don't want to end up these, uh, these patients having a uh, mitral stenosis. Transeptal puncture, mid posterior in the fossa and three to four centimeters above the mitral valve plane. So this is a SL1 sheet, but people can use whatever sheet is comfortable. But, you know, imaging is very important. So if the what I've noticed that if the septal puncture is not at the right spot, it's going to be very, very difficult to maneuver the whole device uh, across the mitral valve. Now, this is a 24 French guide, which is advanced. And you can see on the TE also uh, the septal puncture location, which is mid posterior and three to four millimeters, centimeters above the mitral and left plane. Now, this, this height is achieved you know, the height is achieved by going posterior and the uh, septum is crossed with the guiding catheter in the short axis view. Next is straddling. I'm not going to go into these details. Then is middle rotation, stay clear of the coumadin ridge, open the arm, clip arms. So as I said, the other important thing is because in India, we are just starting our mitral clip program. We need to speak the same language, three people. One is the echo person, the echo doctor is doing the TE, Second is the first operator and the second operator. If we speak different languages, there will be a lot of confusion in the case as what happened in our case itself. And then for the second case, we all sat together and we started talking about different views and what are we going to call them? So that's very important. And then we check the perpendicularity and the trajectory check. Here you can see in this patient how... So... Uh, Majority of cases which will be done in our be functional MR, and that is because, uh, in my opinion, there are a lot of young MIs and patients present to the hospital late, and these are the patients who will be having uh, 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 mitral regurgitation. And not everybody can undergo a heart transplant or LVAD. Mean gradient very important to assess post procedure. So remember, this mean gradient is three, but right now the patient is under general anesthesia. This might go higher uh, if the patient is, you know, ambulatory and with proper loading conditions. So this is how the mitral regurgitation looks like, two orifices. And I'm gonna skip that part. How about in degenerative MR? Degenerative MR, mitral 
operators are only for patients who are inoperable or who are who have an STS score of more than six for a mitral valve repair or replacement. Here's a patient who has a mitral annular calcification and an A to P to prolapse. Standard thing: septal puncture and uh, the mitral implantation. The only thing which I'm going to uh, highlight in this particular case is the MAC was creating a lot of trouble. Every time we would go ahead and enter into the mitral on the LV side, the clip would flip over. So we did some rotations below the mitral valve plane, uh, which are basically not advisable because if you rotate the clip below the mitral and the plane, they can entangle into the uh, papillary muscles and uh, can create a trouble. Check the orientation, perpendicularity, and then advancement. So uh, this is very important. This one important point is if the, if the clip is bisecting or it's right in the center of the jet, then we are in the right plane. And here you can see the clip arms are open and how the PML uh, and the AML uh, A to P2 are bouncing on the clip arms. And then you pull back and push down your grippers. The other thing is when you are tightening the clip, there's a lot of... Uh, tendency, uh, there's a lot of tension which is happening on the leaflets and the leaflets can get pulled towards the LA. So you release tension, give a slight forward uh, push on the catheter and then tighten the clip. An 82-year-old patient and this was the residual MR with the mean grade 2 and we accepted uh, that MR in this patient. Uh, again, we would come across similar type of patient, 65-year-old male had a bypass in 2020, residual where MR, NYHA class, P2 class 4, hospitalized every month. So what happens during cabbage, you know, the mitral valve regurgitation tends to get under assessed because patient is under GA and, you know, the heart is empty. So post bypass every month, you used to get admitted for heart failure. Then the standard thing, you do a septal puncture, straddle the clip, advance the clip to the, uh, uh, across the mitral valve. This is what I was talking about, perpendicularity. You know, if it has to be 12 to 6 o'clock position, we need to look at the surgeon's view. 3D is must. Now, if you don't have a 3D I, I, in my opinion, maybe others can also give input. It's not advisable to start a microclip. In the, you know, the operator has to go to make a transgastric view and make a surge, uh, view to assess the perpendicularity. Similar thing, the mitral uh, clip, arms, the leaflets are bouncing on it. And you can see, so you can see how torrential the mitral regurgitation is uh, in the spirit of the patient. Deployed one clip and one plus mitral regurgitation post procedure, mean gradient of three millimeters of mercury. And this patient was discharged and has not been admitted after the mitral clip deployment. And here you can see how nice it is between A to B. A B. So, you know, sometimes also come across these type of mitral regurgitation. This is the last case which I'm going to share. The important thing is, you know, the 3D anatomy. Uh, because we, as I said, in India, we all are starting our programs. The understanding of a 3D anatomy, investing time in 3D TE and discussing with the uh, cardiologist who's going to help us on the echo and speaking the same, same language helps us to assess the, uh, uh, help us to smoothen the procedure. And here you can see the mitral clip arms are open but they are uh, uh, three to nine o'clock position. So we rotate them and bring them 12 to six o'clock position. And here you can see how the clip arms, one, one clip was deployed, A2, P2, and no mitral. But even after deploying first clip, there is residual two plus MR, and the second clip was deployed in this particular patient. So the reason is, suppose this MR is looks like two plus on table, but once this patient leaves the hospital and is ambulatory, it might be even more because MR depends on afterload and is a dynamic process. So after two clips, uh, you can see the pulmonary vein flow normalizes, one plus mitral regurgitation, and the mean gradient was two millimeters of mercury. So I'm not going to go show this case, sir, because you know uh, for the interest of time. But this is just the last slide where a transcatheter double valve replacement with a valve in MAC and an aortic position uh, with intentional deep implantation of an evolute R to prevent the LV2 obstruction was done. Patient has completed one year of follow-up. Uh, so thank you very much for your kind attention. That's a very excellent uh, description of a mitral clip procedure. 
So uh, we'll take comments. Uh, Lars, maybe from you first. Yeah, I think um, it was a very nice description of this procedure. And again, um, um, the key features of a success is, of, as always, patient selection and a very close collaboration with the person who's doing the imaging. This is, if we can remember, this is a, a procedure which is at least 90% guided by echocardiography. Just uh, one comment to, to about the possibility for have 3D imaging. If that's not possible, you can use a transgastric uh, view. That was actually what was done in the beginning before 3D was evolved. So transgastric view will give you also a possibility to, to have um, the clip orientated perpendicular to the mitral leaflets. And Pradeep, uh, a comment from you on this. Excellent presentation, Ravinder. This is like a crash course in mitral clip in 10 minutes. <laughs> no, it was more of an overview, that's right. No, no, this is brilliant, honestly. Um, you pointed out very well GDMT and the power of this therapy. Remember in COAP trial, number needed to treat to save one mortality was six. Huge, like we don't see this kind of number needed to treat even for other things like beta blockers, CRTs. So mitriclopin FMR is a very, very powerful therapy that on the background of GDMT, of course. Um, fully agree with your 3D imaging standpoint that if you're at the beginning stage, if you're learning, then why not have all your tools? Spend some time in building a team, having a 3D imaging, making sure everybody speaks the same language. Uh, from a technical standpoint, spend your time in transeptal puncture. Get to that four and a half to five, maybe. Don't try to stay under four if possible, high toys. And take your time in um, orienting the clip right, preferably in a 3D view. And we would typically enter the ventricle below the leaflets and then go back to 3D just to double check that did we rotate or not. And if you did, then a little bit of five, 10 degrees here and there or reorientation just to make sure you're in the, uh, on the right leaflet. Thank you. So we have a comment from the floor, Dr. Rupa Salvan. Just a small comment in the quap. I don't think more than 10% of patients were on sacubitril valsartan. And do we see a change in numbers of patients who will come in for this therapy with better medical therapy now? So uh, uh, your, your point is very well taken, madam. But if you look at the co-op trial, uh, I might be wrong if someone can correct me. Uh, every patient was actually excluded just because patient benefited very well from the uh, goal-directed medical therapy. And I think Sacubet uh, Arni was given to, to almost 10 to 15% of patients in the later stage of the uh, trial. But now if we are seeing a patient with functional MR, a beta blocker, an aldosterone antagonist, RNA, and an SGLT2 inhibitor, all four of them along with lifestyle modification should be implemented. And that is what I was talking about. Once you start these patients and after three months you do a repeat echo, uh, you are disappointed that patient does not need a mitoclip anymore. So uh, Dr. Yadav and Dr. Sandagar. There's a, there's a publication in circulation I think last month which is saying almost 30% of patients in the, uh, you know, in the medical therapy arm of even coapt at one month had lesser MR. Now, I mean, yes. these are just things that make us think it's, while we, it's a structural heart meeting and we are all technical people, but I mean, looking ahead and things are there, we can't overlook this. I 100% agree with the comment. I agree, yeah. Yeah. You know, coapt trial took six years to enroll. And part of the issue was that anytime you put them on medical therapy, their MR actually got better and they got symptomatic improvement. So GDMT is, is a key. And for our centers, we typically involve heart failure transplant cardiologists. So we would refer a patient just so that they can maximize the beta blocker, take that carbidolol to whatever maximally tolerated dose. So fully out agree on GDMT. Outcomes of the uh, medical therapy will continue to keep improving and keep challenging the, uh, the interventions which we are doing. And so we have to always uh, reduce our complications and improve the outcomes with any structural interventions that we do. Actually, That's true. The last thing on this was, I mean, my patient of uh, Mitra Clip, which uh, was now seven years back, she was end of the line, you know, 25 years into her illness, but she's pulled through the MR is back, but she's, I mean, she's continuing on medical therapy. So definitely there's a role of this device, either in tiding over a crisis or very bad time where medical therapy fails. And uh, we do see it increasing in the time to come. Point well taken. Very good. Any more comments? So we'll move to the next yes, case. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gopalakrishnan, 
uh, is going to show us a very exotic case. He went to the aortic valve, but through a different route. Gopi, over to you. Yeah, hi, Dr. hi. Dr. Dr. Morgan. Yeah. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, very clearly. We've got your slides here. Yes, great. Thank you very much. Uh, gratitudes to uh, Dr. Mathu, sir. Thank you, sir, for having me here. Uh, Ravindra, enjoyed your crash course and the mighty clips. Great, great presentation, buddy. So uh, I will uh, get on with uh, the uh, case report that I'm going to show. Um, uh, my case is a transcable TABA. Uh, I will be very quick uh, in terms of history. I will not dwell into too much. So this is a standard uh, TAVA indication patient, 70-year-old man, shortness of breath, orthopnea, chest pain exertion, uh, burning sensation. So had a bit of angina too. Uh, his past medical history and surgical history included a, a cabbage in 2013 with patent grafts, clearly, uh, and the diabetes mellitus and hypertension. Uh, echocardiogram showed severe stenosis with uh, moderate uh, uh, aortic regurg and mitral regurg and normal RV and LV function. Let's go into the echo. Uh, I hope you can uh, see the echocardiogram, uh, fairly calcified uh, aortic valve and restricted mobility of the aortic uh, leaflets. Uh, you can appreciate mild to moderate aortic regurgitation, but significant flow acceleration. Uh, and this is a tri-leaflet valve, which you can appreciate on this short axis view. Uh, he did have mitral regurgitation, as I mentioned, uh, which we thought uh, was most likely going to go away once the aortic uh, stenosis was relieved. Uh, this is just to show you the gradients, uh, so mean gradient of 40 plus. This is a CT. So you can see here the uh, CT shows patent grafts. Uh, it also has another surprise, which is a saccular aneurysm in zone two, zone three of the arch, uh, making uh, this uh, an extra pathology that one has to consider treating too. You can also appreciate on this view, there is a narrowing of the SVG to uh, the vein graft, uh, i.e. SVG to the right coronary artery. I hope you can see my pointer here. So there are three pathologies. One is uh, the coronary graft narrowing, which would clearly explain his angina, the uh, aortic stenosis, and uh, of course the saccular aneurysm, which requires attention. Uh, to make things worse, his uh, peripheral vessels were rather small and on the left side was hardly 3.5. On the right, the maximum uh, near the uh, common iliac was 4.8. Um, of course, you might say we could squeeze a tower and a PCI through these vessels, but uh, if we squeeze a tower through this, we have to somehow squeeze uh, an endograft uh, for the arch repair which we don't want really stage for this patient. Given the three pathologies, uh, we thought we should uh, consider an alternative approach. Uh, this is just to give you a, a 3D reconstruction of his uh, coronary graft. So all are patent. Of course, surgery uh, was a no. This is a, a, a contrast view, just to show you the extent of the saccular aneurysm uh, and in zone two, zone three. So here are the uh, four problems that we have from the CT iatogram, which is uh, a critical narrowing of the SVG to PDA, a calcified uh, AS, which clearly needs attention, and the saccular aneurysm in zone two, zone three, therefore not a straightforward graft, will invariably need a hybrid or a fenestrated graft and severe peripheral vascular disease. So these were the access options. So our intention was to treat all, treat all three pathologies in the same sitting uh, because of the problems one has to face if we do have to do a, a, a staged procedure. Transfemoral uh, was felt not safe because of the uh, ileal vessel size. Uh, left subclavian was not an option because TVAR wouldn't be possible. So, uh, Transiotic, of course, grafts are patent. That was a no. Uh, therefore, we decided to uh, uh, proceed with the trans cable. So the plan was stage one and stage two. Stage one, we will do a supraiotic debranching of the arch vessels. And stage two, we will do an OCT guided PCI, a TAVA, a fenestrated TVAR, all through a 
cable aortic access. So this is stage one. Here, a, a small incision is made by uh, Dr. Prashant, uh, my respected surgical colleague, uh, who uh, did an RCC to LCC and an LCC to LSA graft. Therefore, the entire supra arch neck vessels are bypassed with a single patent communication to the arch, which is the enormous. After this, we do an on-table fenestration where we uh, take a, a, an endovascular graft and that endovascular graft, uh, a, a hole is made appropriate to the uh, size as we uh, have seen on the CT. This is done in the cat lab. A hole is made, uh, uh, a wire, uh, uh, an angioplasty wire is sewn around to create a nice uh, uh, reinforcing for the stent graft. And this is what it looks. I have also put uh, some uh, uh, diameter reducing ties you can see here to try and uh, keep it small before we completely release the graft. This is the CT sizing for the TAVA. Uh, you can see an average size of 21, so we decided to use a 23 Edwards Sapien S3. Before we do anything, we just need to make sure the surgical uh, supraortic uh, debranching is good. So you can see here uh, a pigtail catheter from the right brachial has been uh, uh, used to take a shot. You can see from the DSA, the nominate is patent, the bypass to the LCC is patent and the bypass from LCC to LSA is patent. So therefore we are safe because during this procedure, we want to deploy the arch uh, graft perfectly in position so that all neck vessels are perfused. Uh, and uh, therefore it's important to make sure the suprarotic vessels are well bypassed. So in terms of sequence, what was the sequence? What we thought was we should do the PCI first, which should be straightforward. And after that, we will do the uh, arch, uh, uh, fenestrated graft, uh, and third, we will do the TAVA. And the reason for that is if we do the TAVA second, then we will have the no scone of the endograft going in, and that would risk moving or perhaps embolizing the, uh, the um, TAVA valve, and therefore I thought it would be prudent to do the arch first and then do the TAVA valve. So this is just a, a quick video run. I, I will go through uh, with you. Uh, you can see here the entire uh, CT anatomy. This is just in uh, two views where you can see the uh, uh, stenosis and the sacular neurism. This is a recap of the CT scan. And here for uh, the transcable uh, puncture, we used uh, a vessel navigator software where the CT images are fused on to the cat lab fluoro, it gives an added safety layer of imaging just to give us confidence to know continuously where we are and helps minimize contrast. So here you can see here, I have positioned a snare in the iota and from the <coughs> IVC, I have taken uh, the puncture kit, which includes an astato wire followed by a piggyback on to a, a, a JR4 catheter. <laughs> The astato wire, the, uh, the other end of the astato wire has been scraped off and has been connected to uh, a diathermy to allow uh, caught rising through the IVC retroperitoneal space and into the iota. So we are checking in multiple views and uh, only on multiple views once we know that our astato wire is going to go through like a bullseye, we proceed with a puncture. I'm going to show you the puncture again. This is just uh, snaring it after it's punctured. So you can see here, it just goes through like uh, cutting through a uh, cheese. And once we have snared it, uh, we take the snare all the way up uh, somewhere in the DTA. And then because the wire is backed with a big piggyback, which is an O14 wire converter to an O35, through the piggyback catheter, you can take a Lundequist. And once you have a Lundequist, you can see here that's going through the piggyback. Then after all this, then uh, 
the procedure is like any straightforward endovascular procedure. So here, rather than take an E-sheath, we decided to take a 22 French uh, sheet to allow an endovascular graft. So this is a 22 French sheet going from the uh, right femoral vein into the IVC through the transcaval axis into the iota uh, and the puncture point was somewhere infrarenal. And the ones that was done, of course, uh, PCI, uh, fairly straightforward, uh, direct stent to the vein graft, uh, which was OCT guided. And subsequently we took the endograft that we had fenestrated a few hours earlier in the cat lab and we have resheathed. So remind, remember that has a, a fenestration that I have put on the superior aspect, which should go and line up with the nominate to make sure the entire neck vessels are profused. <coughs> so you can see here roughly my markers. I have now opened up the initial part of the endograft. I have not completely released the endograft. As soon as it's released, I have taken a shuttle sheath from the right brachial and I have secured that fenestration to make sure we don't lose that because my, uh, mind you, this is the only access we will have from the aorta into the arch vessels and we cannot afford to get it wrong. So that's what I've done. You can see the shuttle sheet that is going through and through my fenestration. The graft is yet to be deployed. So I know I'm safe. Now I'm gonna completely deploy the, uh, the arch graft. And once uh, that was done, uh, next we proceeded to the TAVA and uh, the TAVA was, uh, I'm not showing that because that was fairly straightforward. We put a, a S3 valve and here the last bit of the procedure was to secure, uh, was to plug off the left uh, subclavian with a vascular plug, which we are bringing from the left brachial artery. You can see up here, I'm showing with my cursor. This is just to make sure the left uh, uh, subclavian artery is plugged off to prevent a type two endo leak from the left subclavian. And as a final uh, intervention, hold on. Sorry. And after the left uh, Subclavian was uh, plugged off. This was the final angiogram you can see here. Where uh, I've just paused it here, where you can see uh, there is no type A endo leak. The graft is perfusing the nominate, the nominate uh, being bypassed to the LCC and the LCC to the LSA, achieving a pleasing angiographic result. Now it's uh, time to uh, close off the uh, hole that we made. And what we did here is uh, we decided to put a graft in the aorta. Uh, of course, uh, a vascular plug is also uh, uh, an option which uh, many centers have done, but we just wanted a very robust and absolute foolproof system. And I chose to use a fluency covered graft whereby the sheet was pulled and the graft was deployed at the same time. So there you go. And that's the final picture after the fluency and uh, absolutely no leaks. Uh, this is just to show you, uh, the, I always get questions, how do you know that you've got the fenestration right? Uh, this is by making sure we, uh, we secure the fenestration with uh, a, a slender sheet before we're releasing it. Of course, towards the end, I put a hand rest tent here just to make sure it's nicely reinforced. And this is another recap of the uh, aortic closure, uh, which is the simultaneous fluency stent deployment in the aorta uh, at the same time as the large 22 French sheet from the aorta was pulled back into the aorta in a very quick manner.
So uh, we are yet to see the one year follow up. So uh, this is a case which we published because this was uh, first in the world proof of concept where all three procedures were performed through a trans cable approach. And uh, thank you to my entire team and uh, gratitude to Dr. Martha for giving me this opportunity. That's a great case, Gopal. You must have used all the hardware available in your lab, isn't it? <laughs> but in fact, we had to import some because there's no piggy back in India. So. Yeah. Uh, we and definitely to... great teamwork on this, you know, because you had an endovascular specialist working on it. And of course, you know, this trans cable approach is really intriguing and the rare situations it will definitely be required. It's important for us to understand the nitty gritties of the puncture. And the second thing is you left the IVC uncovered because probably the peritoneal pressure will take care. It won't allow any leak from the IVC. Is that right? right? Correct, correct. So I think uh, uh, trans cable is uh, very useful, but I think in the current uh, era of towers, uh, there are only going to be a minority of patients because as you know, sir, the, the uh, sheets are so sleek now. Had this patient required just a tower, we should be able to squeeze it even through that uh, uh, 4.8 millimeter iliac vessels uh, used yeah. in a way. It's only because we needed the T-bar uh, that we had to go for trans cable. Uh, and coming back to the point of uh, the uh, IVC, uh, as you very rightly said, the, the uh, retroperitoneal pressures have been studied extensively by the team who introduced this to the world. And they have proven that the retroperitoneal pressures are much higher than the venous pressure. And therefore, one doesn't need to close off the uh, IVC hole. You can just leave it open. Uh, but the key is, as you pull out, you don't want to have the sheath straddling in the IVC hole, uh, which is a disaster. You really want to pull it back quick so that you don't uh, have uh, a, a continuous, uh, you, don't, you don't want to leave uh, the IVC closed, but the retroperitoneal space wide open for the iota to leak. So you'd rather take it out completely, whereby if at all there is an iotic leak, it will leak through the tract into the IVC and not go into the retroperitoneal space. Uh, or you put a stent quickly as we did. Uh, because uh, it was a first case, uh, I was scared to put a plug. Uh, didn't have the confidence. I thought uh, I'll do something which uh, I'm used to. I'll put a fluency stent. A quick comment from uh, Ravinder. And, uh, so uh, congratulations, Dr. Gopal Magan. That was an excellent case and uh, very well executed. And congratulations on the first in uh, world proof of concept. Uh, I can't think of any special comment as of now, but he rightly pointed out if this was only a diver case, we can uh, we would have done it from the femoral artery, but it was uh, proper managed uh, the EVAR. And, you know, the important thing which is highlighted in this case is, you know, you need to address all the critical situations in the same sitting. Sometimes you try to stage these sick patients, uh, you know, you, you have a complication in EVAR and then you don't fix severe aortic stenosis, these patients might not do better. So I think excellent planning and excellent execution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we Dr. have another uh, a comment from there. Yeah, Dr. Mathur, this is Pradeep. Yes, um, Pradeep, come. So Hi. as excellent case, this is brilliant. Very complex, too many things, masterfully executed. Um, in TVT registry, at least the most recent data shows that need for alternate access in Tavar is about 5%. It used to be 10 to 12% and now down to about 5 with the uh, welcoming of shockwave with smaller sheets and catheters. So still, it's not obsolete. For us, transcable is our preferred alternate access and then transcarotid and then maybe axillary. The one thing I would like to reassure is that the shunt that you leave once you pull the sheath back, there is no time crisis. You know, you could take your time. Once you pull the E sheath or a big sheath out of the aorta, all you've created is a fistula. So the blood will get out of the aorta, but promptly get into IVC as you pointed out. Do not block the IVC. That's the key thing. And if that's the case, then it will just go back in the IVC, back to the right atrium, right ventricle. It's, it's just a giant fistula. You could take your time to deploy the plug. And if that doesn't give you a satisfactory response, then obviously an endograph. But I understand that this was the first case. You already did like extensive number of steps and procedures. So why take the chance? Just be done with it. Can I ask a question? Yes. 
So, uh, you know, to you as well as Professor Sondergaard, if you look at the latest ESC guidelines, a non-TF approach TAVI is class 2B, 2B indication. So where would you put a trans cable? Would you still count as a TF procedure or a non-TF procedure? So I can talk about, uh, Lars, you want to go first? Yeah, man, again, uh, remember this patient who need an alternative access is often very sick. And, uh, and the chance that the surgeon is going to accept this patient are very small. But of course, you should consider whether surgery is an option for this patient. But most of the time, these will be referred for, for typing. I would just to make one comment. Um, and that is um, one thing you have to keep in mind when you plan this transcable procedure is that if you're going to have a major vascular complication in the abdominal aorta, you need to be able to do endovascular treatment. In this patient, we just saw, saw um, the diameter of um, the aorta was quite small. It could be treated with a, with a Florence stent, but sometimes you see much larger diameter, let's say up to 20 millimeter. And then you have to consider, can you actually get a, a, a EVA graft in to treat this patient? And if that's not the possible, you're going to lose your, your chance for a bailout. So just keep that in mind when you, when you plan these procedures. I agree. I mean, we, the, the, we start the, with a transcable procedure because we have poor access. And, and that's also going to, to count for if you want to do endovascular procedures afterwards. Right. Yeah, we would not do transcable if the bailout was not available. And you have mm -hmm. to always think about, can I cover, put a covered stent somehow? Mm -hmm. One thing about piggyback, you mentioned that piggyback is not available in India. You could use any micro catheter. So you could take a fine cross inside mm -hmm. a quick cross. So JR4 or IM guide, um, 035 quick cross, fine cross inside it, and then a stato. You could use a Corsair, you could use Turnpike, any micro oven forecast would work. And also in terms of bailout, we had uh, two options because as uh, Lars clearly pointed out, had we had a bigger iota, a fluency would do nothing. It's a very small stent. So, uh, uh, we uh, had the option of, uh, in case if there was uh, additional leak, we couldn't take a, a, an endograft through those uh, limbs. So that was out. So we had an 86 CP covered stent, which you can go up, you know, happily uh, to any diameter. Uh, and it's through a small caliber. It's only to a 12 French. So that was an option we had uh, available, which uh, just a point. Which, uh, Anyone? Okay, that was what I was about to ask mm -hmm. next. Yes. Uh, you take a 10 gig uh, CP stent, just position, uh, you do that uh, carotid bypass, take a 10 gig uh, covered stent, CP stent, close the secular aneurysm, do it uh, probably a metronic taver through the femoral or through are the, are the subclavian. Cost, cost of the procedure. Yeah, well. <laughs> And but, uh, we'll give him did a you day. put yeah, any like here uh, again, the covered stent is... across the administration? No, 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 no. I'm telling another thing. I'm telling like uh, instead of doing the whole uh, aortic stent yeah. graft, take a 10 jig uh, CP stent. Yeah, covered CP stent. Covered yeah. stent. Secular aneurysm. You can easily close that. Do a TAVI on this patient. You need not go through the transcable route. Yeah, but it will be cost effective. How, how do you put a trans... Uh, uh, how do you put a covered stent there? Uh, do you have any thoughts? Because it's zone two, zone three. We'll have to cover LCC, LSA. Yeah. So you have to debranch before you do that. That is what I told. Debranch and then put a covered stent. No, stand why down. you did the frustration? Uh, because you could have kept uh, uh, innominate artery just before the innominate artery, the covered yeah, that part. Is, that is so that is also reason. not needed. Even if you have done the Administration. Did you put a stent across uh, across that hole into the innominate artery? So, uh, so the reason why uh, we didn't use a, a covered stent there is, uh, it is a place where you normally don't put a covered stent, uh, i.e., a balloon expandable CP stent, because they're not designed for the aortic arch. Number one, number two, it is almost impossible to have a good seal in that location if you really want to try and park your stand just after the nominate, expecting absolutely no type 1A or type 1B leak, it's very, very difficult. The guidelines and the worldwide experiences, you need a minimum of about uh, one to two centimeters, one to two centimeters of normal covered area to prevent type 
1A endolique. So that is going to be very hard. And uh, I'm sure people, uh, uh, you know, would agree doing a lot of uh, end over end of graphs, you, you would want at least one and a half centimeter band minimum covered segment to make sure you don't have uh, a much 1A endolique. So that's why we thought we should do an endograph, which is time tested. Uh, we know it will work and we know we can get a good fenestration rather than put a covered stent, which I'm sure wouldn't have required a, a trans cable at all because you know the tower, everything will go through the fence. Oh, so did you put see. any stent through the fenestration into the right illuminate artery? Yeah, just after we finished, we put a bare stent and a stent, oh, just to reinforce yeah. it because that's the only access. I just want to be absolutely sure that doesn't move. Yeah, just, ideally, it should be covered stent. Not necessarily. Because even if a bare stent gives you good support, uh, it will keep your graft away. No, if it is a dissection, it's okay. You can ah. put bare stent. But if you want to prevent indolique, it is better to have a covered stent. And oh, what is the cost of the procedure? Well, plenty. You know, uh, plenty. we can't go okay. into that. Uh, very Thank you very much. Case, so, but can can we have the surgeon's opinion. Just add it up. The surgeon's opinion. What do yeah. you so, think? Uh, would a surgeon be able to give us a tunnel to get into the uh, upper iliac and perform a procedure in such case? Yeah. We we something like vascular this, conduit. I think that we can do. I mean, you we can create a vascular conduit and to be yeah, an access. definitely, and then we can do that. That's a good surgeon. Yeah. 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 Actually, I, that was an option also we had because we were prepared to, uh, Dr. Prashant was very happy to go all the way up to the aorta. Just from the distal aorta, give me a nice conduit. Uh, uh, Dr. Prashant can give me a conduit from anywhere, actually. So uh, he, he was very well prepared and that was an option also, but uh, yes. we, we chose the, the non-surgical option. Excellent. So we'll move to the next case, presentation by Dr. Pradeep Yadav. So we have heard a lot about basilica procedure. Pradeep is doing a lot of these, so he'll take us through one of these procedures which he's done, step by step. Would you can like you to share your presentation, Pradeep? Yeah. Yes, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, we can see it very well and we can hear you very well. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. It's a great pleasure um, to be here and learning from everybody seeing these phenomenal cases. So these are my disclosures. So it's before we talk about basilica, it's critical to understand the mechanism of coronary obstruction that was pointed out also in the earlier talks. And uh, one of the issue is if the coronary is low and the VTC is less than four, that's what a deficient sinus is. So you're very low, you're very close to the leaflet. Um, it's a high chance of occlusion. And then secondly, sinus sequestration, which means that the leaflets of the bioprosthetic valve are extending all the way to the sinuses. So when you deploy your transcatheter valve, those leaflets are basically going to touch the STJs and not allow any blood to come in the sinus. No matter how wide your VTC is, but the STJs are sealed. So you essentially created a tube graft. And then finally, skirt obstruction, which means that uh, your coronary is very, very low, extremely low, and very close to the valve, to the point that the skirt of the THV, either it's an evolute or the sapient, the bottom row, bottom 10 to 12 millimeters or 15, is covered cells, and that skirt will cause obstruction. The silica will help in the first two scenarios. When it's a deficient sinus or it's a sinus sequestration, then it could be useful. This is just a schematic of basilica showing uh, a catheter, which is most commonly an implants, placed outside the leaflet, and then something like a multipurpose placed in the LVOT with a snare in. A wire typically in a stado is energized and pierced through the base of the leaflet that is concerning, snared on the other side, and then pulling on the catheter after energizing the V of the wire will create a nice laceration in the leaflet. And what happens is when these leaflets will open, once the THV is placed, the leaflets splay open, allowing blood to flow through the open cells of the THV. And uh, basically that would not be possible if the leaflet was still intact. That's the general concept of basilica. There is a case example, 81 year old female who had had NYHA3 dyspnea on exertion, STS score for uh, surgery was 8% for redo surgery. 
She previously had, about seven years ago, a surgical aortic valve replacement with 21 millimeters Edwards Magna valve, uh, previous stroke, and the comorbidities typically seen in these old patients, including interstitial lung disease, rheumatoid arthritis, um, low GFR. So clearly a high-risk patient that you would not do, you would not want to operate. Severe aortic stenosis by all parameters, mean gradient is 52, velocity is around 4.6, um, very low dimensionless index, preserved ejection fraction, and uh, mildly elevated PA pressures. This is just from a valve and valve app, which we are all very familiar. A 21 millimeter Edwards Magna has a 19 millimeter true ID and a 14 millimeter height. And you could use either of the two valves, either a 23, Evolute or a 20 millimeter CPM3. So here is a CT analysis. On the left side, you see the left coronary height is around 3.9 and the right coronary height is around 4.4, very low. And uh, VTC, valve to coronary distance, is about three millimeters on both sides, which you could say, yes, it's a less than four millimeter zone, but still on the borderline. The more concerning thing is the right upper image where at the VT STJ, valve to STJ distance is barely one millimeter. And that's what may cause sinus sequestration and ultimately coronary obstruction. At least it's a very high risk for that. So at Piedmont, um, for these high risk CT anatomies that we think are you know, high risk for anything, either annular rupture or coronary occlusion, we take a step further and analyze using dedicated simulation softwares. This is one example of DASI simulation. It's a, it's a software that was created and owned by a professor at Georgia Tech. So very elegant way that shows you the leaflets are gonna go all the way to the left main. That's just a visual description. And in this simulation system, you calculate distance from coronary to the leaflet and then divide that by the diameter of the coronary ostium. And if that measurement is less than 0.7 millimeters, it's, or, or the ratio is less than 0.7, it's a very high risk for coronary obstruction. This is all done via computational terror model. Our patient, as you can see, for a sapien valve, um, as well as Evolute, the DLC by D ratio was 0.3, which is well below the 0.7 cutoff, so very high risk for coronary occlusion. You could simulate Basilica on this, uh, on this software, and this, this is the laceration that shows you that if you were to take care of the leaflet, you do see coronary in the background and blood would flow to the coronaries. So based on this procedural risk uh, on the planning, we decided to go for by Basilica. We did discuss with our surgeons that do you have any final thoughts on doing high risk surgery and she was turned down even for a high risk reoperation. So we said by Basilica with a sapient 20 millimeter um, valve inside a valve and uh, using sentinel cerebral protection. This is just an orientation still image. You see a catheter, a guiding catheter in the left sinus. This is an LAO cranial view with two posts uh, overlaying each other. AL1 is outside the leaflet in the left sinus. Through that AL1 is the same piggyback that we mentioned a few minutes ago. And through the piggyback is an Astato 20 gram uh, peripheral CTO wire. And then the second catheter you see is a regular multipurpose guiding catheter that is crossed across the aortic valve, is positioned in the LVOT. And you have a 20 millimeter gooseneck snare that's placed in the LVOT, which serves as a bullseye. So think of the same trans cable that we reviewed a few minutes ago a catheter with a stato to pierce, and then a bullseye snare as your target zone. <clears throat> the multipurpose is barely in the LVOT. So it may fall out into the aorta and to secure it in place is a V18 wire that's placed in the, in the left ventricle just to keep it in place. Briefly, we were getting these pachyderm guiding catheters that were specifically designed for Basilica. These were made by Medtronic. And essentially it was an Amplatz left catheter with a curved tip. These catheters are not available right now because Basilica is technically off-label. So FDA put a stop on this. They may or may not come back in future. 
So here's the first image you want to take. Um, this is an oversized AMPLATS guide. Key thing is it has to be oversized because if you take a properly sized, it would engage the left main. If you take a larger size AL, it would point downwards toward the base of the leaflet. Once you're outside, you take a picture just to make sure you're outside the leaflet. And uh, this is a side projection where you see two posts overlaying each other, LAO crane usually. And then you go in an orthogonal view, which is usually RAO caudal of some degree. And uh, you see that Amplatz catheter should be right in the center of the two posts, because that's where we want to cut the leaflet. We don't want to go close to the post. So the whole purpose of this RAO caudal view is just to make sure that Amplatz is in the center of the two posts. And that's how we'll get a laceration right in the middle. Once you're ready, this is an Astado energized. It's connected to a Bovi, typically 30 to 50 watts. And as you burn, you just wanna go right through the base of the leaflet. Um, you can turn the Bovi off and then further advance the wire all the way through the loop. Once the traversal is done, it's time to snare. You close your snare just to make sure that your wire is going through the snare. Once you have captured the wire, it's time to give up the V18. Because if the V18 is in place, you are unable to pull the snare in the guide. So give up V18, and if you keep pulling, the Astado will come in the multipurpose guide. Almost there. There you see it. Now you have a loop that's going through the base of the leaflet all the way in the LVOT and out of the aortic valve. This is uh, probably the most important step that we wanna learn for basilicas and lampoon. This is, you, you turn the piggyback, this is the black catheter is the piggyback, right at the tip of the catheter. This is somewhere in the middle of a stato. You scrape the inner coating of the green coating, that's the insulation, and then you kink the wire. It's commonly called making the flying V the inner side, the inner side of this wire is denuded, so no insulation. So when we burn, the current will come through that spot. I'll let it play one more time, just because that's the most important step for basilica and lampoons in the mitral side. So scrape it, turn the scalpel upside down, and then pinch it. That's flying V. After that, if you look at the inner curve catheter, you see that kink being advanced all the way to the leaflet. And a piggyback is the black dot that you see coming in. Once it's in position, in this case, since we wanted to do double basilica, we repeat the same maneuvers for the right coronary. For the right side, typical guides you would need is either a multipurpose or a standard JR4 guide. So we have the left already looped. We're getting ready to get the uh, right side also. And here you see a loop completed on the right coronary as well, right leaflet, I mean. Two loops ready for double laceration. So lacerate the right leaflet first. After that, um, place a pigtail in the left ventricle so you're ready to deploy the valve. And once the pigtail is in, you can go ahead and lacerate uh, left leaflet as well. For this step, for laceration of these leaflets, two important points. You may have to increase your um, OV settings to 50 to 70, and also inject 5% dextrose through the guides. Through both these guides, inject 5% dextrose. And what that does is it displaces blood. Blood loses electricity, so it all dissipates. It doesn't deliver to the point. But once we inject dextrose and the wire is denuded, you deliver all that energy on that one focal spot. Typically, you don't have to pull too hard. It's, a, it's just a gentle back traction and the guides come by themselves. You can choose whichever value you, you want. For this case, we chose the left side at 20 millimeter sapient three. On the right side is an evolute from another case that we did basilica as well. Um, deploy the valve at a height that uh, would not cause a skirt obstruction. And this is the final angiogram of this particular case. And you can see how the coronary is almost touching the valve and 
but still has a good flow. And this is a post ever CT, uh, CT scan done at 30 days. Um, on the extreme right, you see there was a simulation. The purple is the simulation what the simulation software had predicted and our sapien is almost overlaying. The image quality is not very good here because it was a PE protocol CT done about a month later. So the data that we have for Basilica, it was initially a 30 patient uh, prospective study, but the largest data is on the retrospective registry for, from multiple centers, 25 centers, and 94% uh, successful traversal and laceration, but it's not perfect. 5% of the times there was still partial or complete coronary obstruction. That being said, the mortality rate is still 2.8%, which is fairly low. Remember, these were the patients who are technically not a TAVR candidate because the risk of coronary occlusion was very high. So in summary, coronary obstruction can be fatal as we've discussed in the last session and earlier in this session. Recognize the risk of obstruction when you're worried, even if you're borderline, think about protecting it some way, at least either a wire or a stent or leaflet laceration, whichever you're comfortable. If you're thinking about it, try to be proactive and protective because it's a disaster to deal if it happens. And Basilica in select cases uh, is helpful in preventing. I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Excellent presentation, Pradeep. So Dr. very well. Martin? Yes. Can I can I start asking questions, please? Yeah, please. Yeah. 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 Dr. Yadav, excellent presentation. We really enjoyed that. So from a surgeon point of view, I'm a cardiac surgeon. So I would say, I mean, I can understand tearing the you know, bovine pericardium is, is really difficult because the I mean the prosthetic valve, which is a bovine pericardium, like in the case you showed the Perimont Edwards. I mean, if you try tearing it off with your hands or with, with some kind of an instrument, it's, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, precisely, I mean, you, I mean uh, cutting through and reaching the point where you want to, I think it's, it's, it's a really difficult challenge. So, I mean, I think which you have shown very, I mean, I would say elegantly that you can reach there, you can, I mean, deliver the cautery and uh, the, with the current, you can tear the vessel. So would you think that this should become a standard of care for all the patients in Tavi? The problem is technical challenge. You know, I've been involved with electrosurgery for several, several years, um, was trained by the guys who invented trans cables, a lot of experience um, with this particular technique. And that's the biggest limitation of uh, Basilica, that it's very hard to do, uh, very hard to plan. And even with best hands, even with a lot of experience, sometimes it takes forever to just get the MPLATS guide sit in that orientation. So in the current state, it's very hard to say that, yes, this should be the standard of care. It, it, it's just hard. I, I hope there is some dedicated, easier tool, because these are all off the shelf, you know, regular cats and guides. These are not dedicated Basilica guides. Like the Basilica guide that were available, Pachyderm, those were relatively easy to use, but they went off market. So hopefully in future, you know, it can come in. And coming back to your point of difficulty and laceration, you're absolutely right. If we don't use electricity, you'll see that you're pulling as hard as you can, it will not lacerate. There is no way. And that's when you want to start troubleshooting. Is the bovi connected? Is the patient grounded? Why are we not able to lacerate? Did we inject dextrose? Um, so at times I would, I can think there would be some chances of injuring the, I mean, ascending aorta. So you always be, I mean, scared about that because your cautery may be touching the aortic wall and you may injure the aortic wall itself. The wall is, the wire is throughout insulated. And that's right. why when you, when you take the coating off, it's essentially delivering current at one focal point. And it's also insulated by a micro catheter that we had put in over the wire, just for added reasons that you just mentioned. There is an embolic stroke risk. So that's why we generally recommend using sentinel cerebral protection uh, for this. There's a comment from the floor. And uh, you're in, it's just last uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, Rajesh first, yeah. complete. Uh, yeah, so the last thing, I mean, in your experience, do you find uh, cutting the porcine valve is easier than the bovine? I mean, porcine, not necessarily make no difference. It's almost the same? 
It's almost the same because it's all electrosurgery. So it's almost the same feeling. The advantage of porcine is those leaflets are lower. They don't go all the way to the frames in general. So coronary occlusion with porcine leaflet is a little bit lower. The risk of occlusion is less. So the experience in general is less, but no reason. Mitral flow are the worst valve for this, for coronary occlusion. Thanks. Yeah. Dr. Just a question, uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep, excellent presentation. Going with your experience, do you foresee this experience of yours can give an alternative choice in patients where pre-procedure, uh, we are looking at coronary occlusions. So can we create these slits before implanting the uh, valve? If you, if you can do it, which is hard to learn uh, once the uh, plan is there, then there are many cases. And I, as we know that coronary occlusion is one of the difficult things to treat. So when we are anticipating that coronary occlusion is going to be the problem, can we create a slit before implanting the travel? What's your yeah, that is, that that is what is the procedure is. Done, is. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what it the is procedure before. is. Vesilica is before implanting the valve, you are clicking a slit. Yeah, that is yeah, what that's, is done. It's, it's done as part of the TAVI procedure. You create the slit so that the leaflets are separated out where the coronary ostium is. So that when you implant your TAVI valve, you're not covering, blocking the coronary ostium. I think that's the question is, can you use it in native aortic stenosis? Did, was that your question? You can do it without a TAVI plan? Independent of TAVI? No. In natives, when you are not planning a TAVI? No, no. If you have a native aortic stenosis where you have a risk of coronary occlusion, will it work? Yes. Yes. So it will work. It's a little bit harder to do because you don't have the nice surgical post to orient yourself. So you're a little more dependent on TEE, but it's, it's definitely been done many, many times. Great. Excellent. So we move to the next presentation by Lars Sondergaard. And uh, he is going to showcase one of the valves which has an Indian link, that's the Hydra valve, and how best to optimize the usage of uh, the Hydra valve. So that's very exciting and we are all very excited to hear you, Lars. And would you like to share your presentation and run it at your end? Yeah, I hope you can see my, my screen now. Yeah, it's, it's visible yeah. very clearly and we can hear you well. Yeah. So I, I want to showcase and also to present this uh, relative new uh, hydro transcatheter aortic valve. So um, this is a case. It's a relative young female, 70 years of age. Uh, she's relative small size, 160 centimeter, 64 kilograms. Have a history of hypertension, but otherwise no medical story. And she was referred to us due to uh, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. And um, we did the echocardiography, confirming that was uh, indeed a severe aortic stenosis, tricuspid valve, opening area 0.7 square centimeter and high gradients. Normal LV function, only a mild mitral regurgitation. Renal function was normal, coronary arteries without any lesions. She had a sinus rhythm with a right bundle band's block. So she had, uh, as, of course, as a part of the workup, uh, a CT scan showing she had a quite small aortic annulus. So perimeter divide, it was 20.4 millimeter. So again, um, a small aortic annulus, as you sometimes see, and I think particularly if you go to India, you will find quite a few patients with small uh, aortic annuli. Otherwise, there was no really issues. Uh, the coronary had a high takeoff. Uh, the access vessel was suitable for a transfemoral approach. So as always, uh, after this uh, CT scan, she was discussed at the heart team. Um, she was at low surgical risk and also was foreseen to have a quite long remaining life expectancy. So the heart team uh, suggested that this patient should go for surgical aortic valve replacement, but the patient actually refused that and want to have a TAVI procedure. The concern for, for the team was that um, due to this small aortic annulus, there was a risk of patient prostate mismatch. 
And we know if the patient received a biprosthetic aortic valve, which is too small, uh, this is both going to increase the risk of early valve failure, the durability is going to be impaired. And also, this also gives put the patient at risk for cardiac related mortality. It's actually a six-fold increase in cardiac related mortality if you receive a, a valve which is too small for you. And furthermore, she had pre-existing conductance abnormality. So of course, there was also concern about whether she would need a permanent pacemaker afterwards. And again, in a younger patient with a longer life expectancy, permanent pacemaker is going to increase the risk of both heart failure, rehospitalization, and cardiac mortality. So these were the two main concerns when a type of procedure was actually planned for this patient with longer life expectancy. So um, during the discussion, it was also um, discussed which valve to choose, a valve with a low rate of patient prestige mismatch, which, as I said before, is going to impair both the durability and also increase uh, the cardiac mortality, and also a valve which had a low rate of permanent pacemaker. So what actually what uh, was decided here was to use this Hydra valve. It's a self-expanding technology with a super annular leaflet position, which means it's going to give you the best hemodynamic outcome, the highest opening area, and the lowest gradient. It's also a very flexible system. It will take very short just anatomy. And you can see due to this large uh, stem cells, it is easier to access the coronary arteries afterwards. And also the inflow part of the stem frame is not tapered as some of these self-expanding valves, but it's cylindric. So there will be less compression of the conduction system and thereby also a smaller risk of new conductance abnormality. Furthermore, it's a low profile system. It's 18 French and it's repositional. So you can up to almost final deployment, you can recapture the valve and change the position, which of course give you a higher chance to have the ideal position. And again, of course, you want to implant it as high as possible to avoid conductance abnormality. And again, as I said, um, it's going to offer you um, the best hemodynamic outcome and also the lowest rate of patient prestige mismatch. So if you try to compare, these are data from from uh, ran, uh, com uh, data comparing balloon expandable and self-expanding valve with super leaflet position, the rate of patient prestige mismatch. You see in patient with small aortic annulus, which means that the uh, aortic annulus is 23 millimeter or smaller. And remember this patient, it was 20 millimeter. So if you use a balloon expandable valve, one out of three patients, almost or at least 25% at least of the patient will have severe patient prestige mismatch. Mm -hmm. And only about 30% of the patient will have insignificant patient prestige mismatch compared to self-expanding technology, where it's only 3% of the patient who's going to face severe PPM and 75% of the patient will have insignificant. So certainly it's going to make a different which kind of valve prosthesis you're going to choose in patients with small aortic annulus, where you're going to have PPM. Furthermore, we also know from the Genesis trial, which was conducted in India, that it's, uh, as we expected, have favorable hemodynamics. You see here, opening area is 2.3 square, uh, square centimeter, mean graded is 6.7 millimeter mercury, one digit, and pacemaker rate is 7.5%, which is very low for self-expanding technology. So this was what, how the patients was treated. Um, with a, a, a self-expanding uh, hydra valve here. Uh, so you see uh, it's slowly released. It's, it's a long stent frame. You see the nose cone is in the LV. You see the inflow part of the stent. And you see this gold marker here indicating where is, um, where is um, the capsule, into the capsule. So it's a, a slowly deployment. And as you see in this case, without any pacing, and working in a right left coronary cusp overlap view, which is both going to give you the tree or to cusp aligned with the imaging plane and also have often very little parallax in the delivery system. And finally, it's also going to elongate the left ventricular alpha tract and thereby give you a better understanding how deep are you in the left ventricular alpha tract. So quite a few sites have moved away from a classical tree cusp 
co-planner view, which is often with your C-arm position in an LAO cranial projection, to this cusp overlap view, where the C-arm is positioned in an ARIO caudal projection. And again here, it's a slow deployment. You can take your time uh, to assess uh, the position. And as I said before, if you're not happy, it's very easy to recapture the valve and then uh, start all over again and thereby uh, optimize uh, the chance to have a good valve position and thereby a lower rate of um, uh, conductance abnormality. So here, just before releasing it, it's recommended to roll back in an LAO cranial projection to confirm that the stent frame is below uh, the left coronary cusp, and then the valve uh, is finally released here. You see the ten, ten, three tentacles is coming off the delivery system, and the valve is released. So the 30 days outcome here was that the patient uh, was in function class one, and echocardiography demonstrated for this relatively small lady, an effective orifice area of 1.6 square centimeter, which is also 0.95 square centimeter per square meter. And remember that you have moderate uh, PPM if that is 0.85 or less. So the patients certainly have no patient prestige fits match. Low mean gradient, eight millimeter mercury, no PVL and ECG showed sinus rhythm with unchanged LBB. So I think this patient was actually treated uh, in a very good way with no PPM, despite that was the risk of, uh, of treating her. So I think I'm going to stop here and we'll be happy to, to discuss this case and also this new valve on the Indian market. Thank you, Lars, uh, very nice presentation. So it, it, this valve uh, is recapturable at, at a particular point or? Yeah. You can recapture it actually up to the final release. When the valve is released, you cannot do it. But up to that point, uh, you can just go opposite on, on the wheel and the valve is going to resheat. And, and, and you do you recommend a slightly lower placement of the valve? Uh, we noticed that it's uh, slightly low. Uh, if the pigtail is in the I mean, uh, we, it's recommended to implant about three to five millimeter below the aortic annulus. Uh, again, um, I'm, as for all valves, when physicians get experience with, most physicians will try to push it up to go to a higher position. But for the time being, that's what we have been done in, doing in the trial. And you saw, despite that, uh, mm -hmm. the pacemaker rate was 7.5% um, uh, for, for patient at risk. Question for you, sir. Yes, uh, how do you see it comparing to the self-expanding Medtronic Evolute valve, what are the differences or nuances and how do you think it will play out? Yeah, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's, a, it's still a self-expanding valve with a super leaflet position as for the Medtronic valve. But it's um, everyone who's using the Medtronic valve, uh, the Evolute platform know that the capsule is very stiff. Uh, it can make a small bend, but it will never kink this valve is like the first generation core valve with a very flexible uh, system. So it can actually make a kink. So if you have very tortuous anatomy or acute angulation in your aortic arts, if you've got horizontal aorta, it's, it's very favorable to use this valve because you, it will take these turns. And also, again, as I said, in horizontal aorta, you can push in the wire, push in the system, and it's going to put the valve on the side and thereby have coaxial alignment. And also, you saw also there's different configuration of the stent frame. It's more cylindric than mevitronic valves, and thereby probably also have less compression on the, on the conduction system, and thereby a lower rate of, uh, of new onset conduction abnormality. And finally, you also saw that the stents are larger here, the stent cells, which potentially will facilitate an easier access to the coronary arteries afterwards. All factors which is very important if you want to move to patient with longer life expectancy. Anik, uh, any comments on you? Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, Lars and I have been using this valve for some time and um, I'm pretty happy with it. And all these factors definitely are going to be important in low risk patients. Are you using this in the cusp overlap view like you use for Evolutes or are you? Yeah, yeah, we are we are using in cusp overlap view only like RAO cordal or cusp overlap, whatever you say. And also the commissures, the com the posts also have a very short sort of uh, circular marker. It is difficult to see, but uh, in coming days, maybe commissural alignment would also be very much feasible. That's great. 
Excellent. If, uh, any more comments from our panel over here? So this has been a very, uh, very interesting session overall. A big hand to all the presenters during this session. And uh, such exotic work is being done all over the world. And it's our pleasure that we have been uh, it's, uh, able to learn a few tips from you. So with this, we close the session. And I thank all the participants and all the people who have taken out time to make this whole event a success. And uh, very grateful and a big, big uh, round of applause for everyone who's over here who's uh, helped out with this process. Thank you and goodbye to all of you. Bye, Lars. Thank you very much, Pradeep, Manik. Thank you, Ramji. Bye, man. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Um, thanks, Dr. Mathur. Thanks for the invitation. It was a great conference. Thank you, Manik. Hope to see you soon in person. <laughs> Me too. <laughs>